You can hear me. Perhaps it is okay. Thank you. <laughs> so, but uh, you cannot hear me in the room. Is that the problem? I can, I can barely hear you. You're very. No, um, I can barely hear you. Um, and now you hear me? Now it's better. Yes. Now, yeah. yes. Yeah. Now it's good. Um, you should perhaps add more volume to your voice somehow.
ladies and gentlemen, or it's just one lady, but welcome on our uh, second day, which is devoted to uh, the, the second aspect of Professor Sousedik's uh, lifelong project, namely analytical metaphysics. And um, uh, just before we start, I would like uh, to remind you that uh, there is uh, there are some issues of our journal Studia Neoristotelica, which you can look at and perhaps keep one if, if you like it. And uh, more importantly, there is that uh, Liber Gratulatorius, where you can write down your wishes for Professor Sousedik. So uh, I invite you to do so. Okay, and <clears throat> we will start uh, today with uh, our second keynote speaker, uh, Jula Klima from Fordham University, uh, who will uh, deliver a talk uh, on the topic of historical analytical metaphysics, or what should a scholastic do in the 21st century? So, uh, I hope uh, this is thank online. Thank you very much. So, pl uh, please. Thank you in the first place. Yes? Uh, you, ca you can share your screen. Yes, you okay. Um, okay. So, I'll floor start is with yours. That. Okay. <laughs> but okay. in the first place, I just wanted to thank you for inviting me to this terrific meeting. It is really enjoyable. I wish um, uh, I could be there in person. In fact, we were planning with my wife to go, but um, mm, uh, she fell ill with um, an acute laryngitis, not COVID, thank God. And uh, so it's uh, safer here with me. Um, that's why I'm present at the meeting only um, virtually. But I hope it will work. So, um, I see my screen is shared there, but not, yeah, but uh, someone else uh, is uh, showing it on the screen. It is not my scrolling. Uh, I'm sorry, someone, uh, someone put Okay, now uh, let me just put it up here. Okay, I hope uh, you can see my screen now. Okay. Okay, so I'm pulling it over onto this screen. Okay, so I can face you while I'm reading it. The reason why I'm uh, uh, scrolling the text as I'm reading it is that uh, perhaps it is easier to follow it this way. And also there are some diagrams I inserted into the text that I would like you to see as I'm talking about them. Okay, so let's get down to business. Way back in the 90s of the 20th century, I wrote a little programmatic pamphlet called What Can a Scholastic Do in the 21st Century? These are, by the way, live links um, in the text, which I'm sharing with you, um, so uh, you can get the file, actually. And you can click on these texts, uh, you can uh, click on these links to see uh, the documents referred to here. My answer, my answer to this question was pretty much what I've been doing in the last three decades and before that too, namely what I now refer to as historical analytical metaphysics, which is the phrase I've also used in the title of the book series I'm editing for Springer. Well, so much for the motivation for the somewhat complicated disjunctive title of this lecture. But what about the motivation for the project itself indicated by the title? To be sure, with this audience celebrating the work of Professor Sussedik, I know I'm preaching to the choir in one way or another. We are all doing what can justifiably be called historical analytical metaphysics, even if we may disagree on the details. But as we know, the devil is in the details and in what follows, I'm going to lay out some of the details of what I take to be the essential features of this project and why they matter. After all, now my title is not only about what can be done, but rather what should be done. But why would anyone want to comply with the implied imperative? Well, if I clearly explain the reasons why I find it imperative for me to do this, 
perhaps it will make good, good enough sense for others to follow. So let me start with another disquieting suggestion a la McIntyre. Looking at the contemporary scene in philosophy, it would seem obvious that metaphysics, pronounced dead multiple times in modern philosophy, is making a spectacular comeback in this century. After all, analytical metaphysics, a phrase that would have sounded to many philosophers like an oxymoron, even as late as the 70s or 80s of the last century, is now the legitimate description of an area of specialization in job postings of many respectable departments of philosophy. So apparently these days, metaphysics is undergoing a miraculous resurrection. But is this really a resurrection of a dead body? Or is the situation rather like the case of a dead body appearing to be moving and hence alive, merely because of the maggots feasting on it? Or, to use a less offensive metaphor, aren't we contemporary practitioners of the discipline, like scavengers among the ruins of a fallen cathedral, picking up some pieces here and there, trying to fit them into our modern houses, say putting a gargoyle over the mantelpiece and a stained glass window into the bathroom, never quite realizing their proper function and how they would fit together. To have that realization, what we will need is not just the pieces, but rather the blueprint, the form of the whole that is now gone. Indeed, by the lights of this metaphor, one is tempted to say that we live in a historical period that is after that form is gone. And so it is also one in which we should be after that form, namely in its pursuit. Alistair McIntyre in his book, After Virtue, used similar imagery to describe what he perceived was the scenario in contemporary moral philosophy. Indeed, I'm following in his footsteps while paradoxically walking ahead of him, which is after all possible if we're both walking backwards as we are in history. So just to bore you with one more metaphor, in this strange scenario, I can do two things he could not. I can deepen his footprints while also fixing my eyes on our present horizon. I intend to deepen McIntyre's footprints by digging deeper down to the roots of our contemporary predicaments, identifying the historical metaphysical roots of the dismal, dismal scenario he identified in modern moral discourse. And I am fixing my sight on our current horizon, both by taking into account recent welcome developments in the recovery of some aspects of, of the scholastic tradition, and by identifying what I think we can gain by a full recovery of this tradition, something that points us beyond this horizon, even to such trendy subjects as artificial intelligence. Contemporary analytical philosophy, a way of doing philosophy that can be characterized by a constant rigorous reflection on the philosophical uses of language, is a direct descendant of logical positivism. Logical positivism, however, was arguably the 20th century culmination of the strongest anti-metaphysical trends of post-enlightenment philosophy. Nevertheless, since the elimination of metaphysics through the logical analysis of language proved to be a vain attempt, engaging metaphysical issues with an analytical approach more recently turned out to be not only possible, but even desirable. The development of powerful analytical tools in logical semantics, such as Kripke's possible word semantics, enabled analytic philosophers to revive the notion of essence, one of the fundamental notions of the Aristotelian metaphysical tradition. However, given the meandering historical path leading to these recent developments, it should come as no surprise that the commonly assumed modern analytic notion of essence as a collection of essential properties defined in modern terms is a far cry from the, from the traditional Aristotelian notion, namely the notion of that which establishes a thing in its individual being in its specific kind. Thus, although many analytic philosophers routinely talk about essences, they equally routinely talk past the Aristotelian scholastic tradition. By and large, this is still the case 
notwithstanding some welcome recent developments coming mostly from our historically better informed colleagues. However, I'd say the revival of some ideas of Aristotelian hylomorphism in the works of these philosophers is still only partial, showing great promise, but failing to deliver what I referred to earlier as the form of the whole of the falling cathedral of scholastic thought. Why is that? Scholastic thought is compared to the architecture of Gothic cathedrals with good reason. The wonderful structural unity of interlocking arches running down on all sides in a you know, Gothic vault are magnificent representations of the structural unity of interlocking concepts pervading all fields of scholastic inquiry. But remove the keystones and the vault collapses. Remove some central notions and the cathedral of thought falls into ruin. Such a conceptual keystone, which held in place and was held in place by the interlocking notions of meaning, nature, and concept in scholastic Aristotelianism, was the notion of form. Considered semantically, a form is what the word signifies constituting its meaning. Metaphysically, a form is a determination of a thing's being, establishing the thing in its singular existence, in its specific nature or kind. Finally, epistemically, it is the form of the thing received in the mind that constitutes the mind's concept, whereby the mind conceives of the nature of the thing signified by the word subordinated to this concept. So I think the first step in the recovery of our missing blueprint is the full recovery of this keystone notion of form in all of these interconnected functions in its proper conceptual space, which is supposed to be illustrated by this diagram that I lifted from my uh, Stanford Encyclopedia entry on the medieval problem of universals. Probably many of you are familiar with it already. So how can the notion of form serve all these diverse functions? How can it serve as this keystone in this classic cathedral of thought? The simple answer is that this notion is analogical. As such, it is in fact a cluster of closely interrelated, in fact partial overlapping concepts, each deriving from an original primitive concept. Hence, its proper understanding must start with grasping this primary concept, which is the etymologically primary meaning of the word expressing it. So what is the etymologically primary meaning of the word for? As is the case with many of our terms expressing abstract concepts, as, in, as is indeed the case with the very expression abstract concept, which comes from the ideas of pulling away and grasping, the etymologically primary idea is that of something sensible. Thus, primarily, the word form, just like the Latin word forma, uh, from which the English word derives, as well as the corresponding Greek word morphe, refers to the outer shape of a body, the tangible and visible limit of its volume, determining, that is, terminating its dimensions. But of course, this is not what a hylomorphist metaphysician would primarily mean by the word. The etymologically primary meaning of a term need not be semantically prior in accordance with the intent of a certain group of users of the term. See the medieval distinction between a quo and ad quo nomen imponitor, that is that from which and that on which a name is imposed or given to. So after all, a human being and the well and the well-made mannequin or android may have the exact same looking and feeling shape, yet they certainly differ in their form that determines what they are. So what the metaphysician primarily means by the term form is rather what the scholastics would call the substantial form of a thing. Well, what is that? Now, whenever we are in trouble with answering such a what question, we need to remember that it can be answered in two ways. First, metaphysically, determining what the thing in question is, providing the quid ray, the quiditative definition of the thing, presupposing the meaning of the term referring to the thing in question, or semantically, by saying what we mean. 
specifying the semantic relations between the thing we are talking about, whatever that thing is in its own nature, and the word in terms of which we are talking about it, providing the quidnominus, the nominal definition of the meaning of the word naming what we intend to talk about. And we should also remember that when we um, answer the question about the quiddity of a thing, only after, uh, I'm sorry, we should also remember that we can answer, uh, we should also remember that we can answer the question about the quiddity of a thing only after we manage to properly identify it based on the meaning of its name. And here I'm uh, referring to a um, famous little um, question, a uh, famous little uh, passage from Aquinas. Um, the question of whether something is precedes the question of what it is, but one cannot show of something whether it is unless it is first understood what is signified by its name. So even before the first of the Aristotelian questions about the existence of the thing, we need to be clear on the semantic question, that is what is meant by its name. Now, so simply clarifying what we mean by the word, we can just bluntly say that when we are talking about the form of a thing, we mean whatever it is that makes the thing of the kind of thing it is, signified by the term telling us what kind of thing it is. Of course, the making in question is not the way in which, say, a potter makes a pot or a locksmith makes a key. Rather, by their activity of making a pot or a key, these artisans bring about in the matter they are working on, say, clay or iron, a form that makes the clay into a pot and the iron into a key, namely, what makes the terms pot and key true of these things. So in view of these considerations, Forms on this semantic approach are truth makers, making the terms signifying them true of the things of which they are true. Therefore, and this is meant just to, to be just a semantic triviality, whatever it is that makes the terms pot and key true of pots and keys is a form of these things signified by these terms. And it is the actuality of these forms in these things that makes these terms true of them. The important thing about this semantic triviality is that we can safely hold on to it, regardless of whether we metaphysically know what the form signified by the term in question is. Thus, the advantage of holding on to this semantic triviality is that we don't need to put the card before the horse. We don't have to determine profound metaphysical issues at the beginning about the quiddity or nature of these forms, etc. Um, rather, I'm sorry, just quickly correct this. <laughs> so we, we don't need to determine um, profound metaphysical issues at the beginning about the quiddity or nature of these forms, etc. Rather, we are simply clarifying the rules of the language in which those issues can be meaningfully be raised and hopefully be answered. Nevertheless, Despite my insistence on the triviality of this semantic conception and the deceptive simplicity of its application to the cases of pots and keys, one may immediately have several misgivings about it. First, how does the alleged semantic triviality that the words pot and key signify the forms of pots and keys explains the profound claim I just casually dropped in the introduction that a form is that which establishes a thing in its individual being, in its specific kind, or in other words, that a form is a determination of the being or existence of such a thing. Indeed, what the heck is the existence of a thing? This is the question of the semantics of form and being, that is, of the words. Second, how can this triviality produce a semantic theory, at least on a par with the exactitude of the paradigmatic logical semantic theory of our time, namely the semantics of predicate logic? The problem of constructing a via antiqua semantics, which I will explain a little later. But first, in response to the first problem, let us clarify the semantics of the terms form and being or existence based on the suggested semantic triviality, namely that a universal term that is true of a thing signifies a form of a thing 
and it is the actuality or actual existence of this form signified in the thing that makes the term true of the thing. This semantic principle, the principle of the inherence theory of predication, can be spelled out schematically as follows. A universal term f is true of thing x, just in case the form signified by f in x is actual. Obviously, the form signified in x by f is actually in x, just in case that form actually inheres in x, as the scholastic would say, hence the name of the principle. So the term form refers to what a universal term signifies in a thing. For example, the term key signifies a form of, say, a piece of metal, and it is the actuality of this form, whatever it is, that verifies the term key of it. Um, we should note here at once now, that the shape of the key in itself would not make it a key without a matching lock it can open. So the term key is relative, which would have to be taken into account in its semantics. How this can be done will be indicated later, but at this point, the particular issue of the semantics of key is irrelevant. Just to illustrate uh, how ontologically indifferent what uh, a form signified can be, a point I will expand a little bit later. But then, clearly, the actual being of this form is precisely its actuality, which is signified by the verb of existence, namely is or exists in English. Before the piece of metal in question acquired this form in the hands of the locksmith, it could become a key, but it is not a key. This is a simple fact that Aristotelians express by saying that initially the form of the key was in potentiality in this piece of metal, and the work of the locksmith brought it into actuality making this piece of metal into an actual key, which is not there, which was not there before, but now it exists, because now its form brought into existence by the locksmith exists. So the being or existence of the key, what these classics refer to as its essa, is nothing but what the predicate is or exists signifies in it, just as the, just as the term signifies uh, just, as, just as the term key signifies in it the form of the key as such. So um, um, specifying our uh, inherent theory for this distinguished predicate of exists, we can say that the term exists is true of a thing X, just in case the S signified by exists in X is actual. Well, this suggestion may immediately face another barrage of objections from contemporary philosophers. Even if it is granted that the word exists can consistently be used as a predicate of individuals, which after Kant through Frege to Russell to Quine to Wiggins and many others used to be a big bone of contention, but by now it is a non-issue. Then what is its subject? Is it the key or is it its form? Or is the key the same? Uh, is the key the same thing as its form? And if the existence of the key is what the alleged existence predicate signifies in it, and the existence of its form is again what the same alleged predicate signifies in this form, then is the existence of the key the same as the existence of the form? Finally, the form of the key is said to be a form, so the predicate form is true of it. Thus, the form of the key has a form signified in it by the term form. And since the actual form of the key exists, and it is also actually a form, um, um, the form of the form of the key also exists. Hence, we are again faced with the question of whether the existence of this form, namely the form of the form of the key, is the same as the existence of the form of the key, etc., etc. Such and similar issues can be raised ad nauseum until we completely lose track of what we are talking about and give up on, give up on the whole game. Therefore, to prevent that outcome, we need to make our language more precise by addressing the challenge posed by the second main question, main question of this section, namely the question of how we can turn these vague semantic suggestions into precise logical semantics matching the exactitude of the paradigmatic logical semantics of our time, 
namely the semantics of predicate, uh, predicate logic or quantification theory. So how can we make the semantic triviality of the inherent theory of predication noted above more precise, make, matching the standards of contemporary semantic theory? Take a simple proposition, such as Socrates is wise. The truth conditions of this proposition can be stated in several different, in several different yet equivalent ways. For instance, we can say that this proposition is true just in case Socrates is indeed wise, or that the state of affairs that Socrates is wise obtains. However, this formulation of the condition of its truth does not tell us anything about how the components of this simple proposition contribute to determining what needs to be the case to make it true. So how do the subject and predicate the copula of this proposition determine just what needs to be the case? Raising this further question is nothing but moving from the level of analysis of propositional logic to that of predicate logic. So let us see what predicate logic tells us about the issue. Following Tarski's and Boole's and others' lead, standard logic textbooks would tell us that such a simple proposition is true just in case the individual denoted by the singular name Socrates is an element of the set denoted by the common predicate wise. By implication, this analysis attributes the semantic function of denoting an individual to the singular name and denoting a set to the common predicate. So the semantic distinctions are made in terms of ontological distinctions. It's an interesting point that I will return to a little bit later. So another type of analysis, namely Frege's, would assign a different function to the predicate. According to Frege's analysis, the predicate would denote a function from individuals to truth values, the true and the false, and the proposition would be true just in case for the individual denoted by the subject. The function in question, the bedeutung, as Frege would call it, and the bedeutung of the predicate would yield the value true. In his seminal essay, Form and Existence, Peter Geech made the ingenious suggestion that we can fruitfully interpret several passages in Aquinas about the predicative function of common terms by assigning a different type of semantic function to the predicate, namely a function from individual substances, such as Socrates or Plato, to their individualized forms, such as Socrates' wisdom or Plato's wisdom, whether they actually exist or not. Well, Socrates would deny it, definitely, in any case. Um, given this semantic function of the predicate, what makes the proposition true it's just the actuality of the individualized form signified by the predicate in which the, um, I'm sorry, um, the, uh, the actuality of the individualized form signified by the predicate in the individual denoted by the subject. So without going into any um, model of theoretical technicalities, we can say that the same proposition, say Socrates is wise, on the Tarskian analysis is true just in case the denotation of its subject and individual element of the universal discourse is an element of the denotation of its predicate, a subset of the universal discourse, which holds on the Freudian analysis just in case the function denoted by the predicate, a function from individuals to truth values, yields true for the, den uh, yields the true for the denotation of the subject, which in turn holds on Geech's analysis, just in case the function denoted by the predicate yields for the thing denoted by the subject an individualized form that is actual, that is one that actually exists. So far, this is sheer semantics, simply coming up with a different type of semantic function for predicates. Of course, assigning this type of semantic function to the predicate involves at least two unusual ontological assumptions. First, marking out a subset of the domain as the set of individualized forms, a peculiar type of entities, apparently. And second, marking out a subset of the domain as the set of actual entities, leaving the rest in the shadowy ontological realm of non-actual individuals. 
Nevertheless, from the point of view of formal semantics, these are just the sort of complications one should expect when dealing with the logical modeling of some philosophically intriguing concepts. For modalities, we may need possible words. For tenses and temporal adverbs, we may need time in the sets of individuals. For intentional logic in general, we may need time in the possible words, etc., etc. However, from the ontological point of view, it becomes at once questionable just what sort of weird entities our semantics might commit us to. But upon a bit of reflection, one may quite, one may quite easily dispel this sort of worry concerning each of the above mentioned unusual ontological assumptions. As for individualized forms, they are in fact the most ordinary entities we find in our everyday experience. The shape of this ice cube, its coldness, its white color, its watery taste, are all that Aristotle, Aquinas, and innumerable other pre-modern philosophers would identify as this ice cube's individualized forms. In fact, all its sensible qualities are just individualized forms of this ice cube, the very, the very items in external reality by which we can have some sensory awareness of the presence of the thing in the first place. So whoever thinks these forms are some metaphysical phantoms coming from some antiquated Aristotelian dreams about reality that have no place in our ontology informed by modern physics should wake up to the reality of the world they live in, of which they would have no idea without the actual presence of such forms in the first place. However, just what these forms are and how they can be identified and characterized in terms of modern science is a further issue, which should, however, presuppose and not prejudge the semantics in terms of which we can intelligibly, intelligibly raise just these questions. So again, in these considerations, we must not put the metaphysical card carrying all our ontological valuables before the semantical horse, which is supposed to deliver those valuables only after the honest toil of unpacking, unpacking them in our metaphysical disputations. Or to use again another, in fact, mixed metaphor, we must not forget this, that semantics only has the role of staking out the playing field in which metaphysical tournaments are played out lest we yell out checkmate in what we think is a chess tournament upon showing a royal flush. So if we build a recursive compositional semantics with a model theory based on Geech's suggestion, as I in fact did 33 years ago in my RSR team, then we get an extremely fine-grained semantics that not only matches but even surpasses in expressive power the standard systems of intentional logic in currency today. But now to stay within the confines of our allotted time without going into any further general speculations about the relationships of semantics and metaphysics, let us see a little bit more by way of more concrete example about the significance of Geech's suggestion of treating Aquinas' notion of form as a semantic function of predicates, just like Frege's, except that it assigns different semantic values to the same arguments. So how about the metaphysics of form, metaphysics of form and existence now? In the first place, as should be clear from the foregoing, Gage's suggestion allows us, a, uh, allows us a precise way of keeping track of what medieval authors are talking about when they are using their notoriously barbaric coinages involving an abstract term corresponding to any concrete term conceivable, regardless of whether those abstract terms existed in classical Latin or not. In fact, Geech's suggestion, along with the further considerations of how that suggestion works in determining the truth conditions of simple predications, provides a perfectly reasonable explanation of why medieval authors, prompted by the theoretical needs of their semantic considerations, had to introduce this terminology. Whenever they needed to talk about these significance, they needed the appropriate terms to refer to them which is the role they assign to the corresponding abstract terms. So for example, whiteness is a universal term. 
not a singular name of an abstract property as uh, contemporary metaphysicians would have it, but a common term in various contexts, variously referring to or suppositing for, to use the anglicized form of scholastic terminology, the singular whitenesses of singular white things, which are nothing but the significata of the term white in these things, namely the values of the signification function, assigning these individualized forms in respect of uh, things to the, um, uh, uh, in respect of these things to the predicate white. It should be noted, however, that the significance of predicates, despite um, Beach's wholesale identification of them with the individualized forms of hylomorphist metaphysics, it need not always be regarded as forms of their subjects in a strict metaphysical sense, namely as determinations of an act of real being, a real essa. It is such a determination that Aquinas refers to as determinatio ascendi um, in the passage uh, referred to here. At any rate, I take this phrase to be a fair characterization of a Thomistic, Thomistic understanding of what a real individualized form is, as opposed to just any significant of any common predicate. Briefly, we can say that some things are one way while others are another way, having their diverse ways of or modes of existence. Cats are one way living their cat lives, while mice are another way living their mouse lives, etc. And the determination determining the actual way they really are is their real form. So the analogy with the etymologically primary concept would be the following. Just as the shape of a body determines its dimensions, giving it one definite shape out of all possible ones, so does the substantial form of a thing determine its mode of being out of all possible ways a thing can be. However, in the semantic approach I am endorsing here, a signified form, a form of significata, does not have to carry this metaphysical weight. After all, in a form of semantics, the ontological categories of semantic values need not be entirely predetermined. We assign our linguistic items their semantic values in a traceable manner, basically just heeding compositionality, and otherwise let the ontological chips fall where they may. It will be the task of metaphysicians heeding these semantic rules to sort out through metaphysical debates which semantic values should belong to what ontological categories. This is in perfect agreement with Aquinas's and his famous commentators, Kajitan's intention, who make a point of leaving the semantic characterization of a signified or denominating form, that is whatever it is on account of which a term denominates an individual, ontologically neutral in this sense. <coughs> I quote, that on account of which something is denominated does not always have to be a form according to the nature of the thing, but it is enough if it is signified as a form, grammatically speaking, for a man is denominated on account of his action as acting or clothing as clan, and other things of this sort that are not forms in reality. This is Aquinas and his De Potentia. And there is another quote here from Kajetan making the same point. Accordingly, Gitche's suggestion provides us with a precise conceptual tool to keep track of these signified forms in medieval discussions of their ontological status and their identities and distinctions which was precisely the point of many of those debates, well until some subtler minds started also tweaking the very ideas of identity and distinction. But that's a later story we heard about actually earlier yesterday. Now, for instance, uh, the debate about the unity or plurality of substantial forms, is it the same form on account of which an animal, an animal is a body, a living thing, and a cognitive subject, or are these distinct forms, can be regarded as revolving around the issue of the identity or distinctness of the significance of substantial predicates in the same individual, where a substantial predicate of an individual substance may be defined as one whose significance in this individual has the same asset as the individual itself, 
so the individual cannot lose it without going out of existence itself. Furthermore, from this perspective, the question of the real distinction of essence and existence in creatures will become the question of the distinctness of the significata of substantial predicates and those of an existence predicate in created substances, not to mention the debates about the identity or distinctness of items in various categories, such as action and passion, or relations and their foundations, etc., etc. But regardless of these and similar particular metaphysical issues, the point is that using Gieche's suggestion, Gieche's suggestion, we can have a precise logical tool for checking the implications of such and similar metaphysical claims without having to rely on our own vague intuitions informed by a historically radically different conceptual context from the one in which they were originally formulated. I must note that, that Gieche's suggestion has to be refined and supplemented in several ways to be genuinely usable for such purposes. For instance, since actuality among generable and corruptible things is obviously relative to time, and so forms are individualized not only by their subjects but also by time, Another argument reserved for a temporal variable is clearly needed in a refined version of Gieche's function. This move, of course, calls for further structure for distinguishing various sorts of non-actual elements on the domain of our model, since now we can distinguish items that were, are, or will be actual, and those that could have been, could be, or will be able to be actual, as well as those that could not, cannot, and or will not be able to be actual, yielding precisely the kind of rich distinctive model that is just the ordinary frame of reference of most of scholastic metaphysical discussions, as well as most of our practical reasonings. Ordinarily, we talk about things that were actual in the past, but are no longer. The Twin Towers on the uh, southern tip of Manhattan used to be there. They no longer are there, et cetera, et cetera. So um, this is all there is. That is why it is bolded. And I should add that the 10 categories of real entities do not um, all have to be um, distinct uh, and non-empty sets. It may be that uh, different uh, linguistic categories are mapped onto um, just one or two or three of these uh, ontological categories. Um, let's say there are no distinct uh, quantity items, but they are. But quantity terms are meant uh, are uh, mapped onto substance items in the ontology. Alaaka. That's perfectly possible. The semantics leaves these questions open all the time. And also, um, the, uh, the apparent vast ontological commitment um, in this um, um, uh, quasi-ontology is not real commitment. Um, this is why it is not an ontology, strictly speaking, but quasi-ontology, because all these um, beings of reason or um, uh, uh, items that are just objects of our cognitive uh, powers with or without some um, um, foundation in reality may not be anything at all. Okay, um, we can um, uh, talk about these later if um, there is a need to do so. But um, I guess um, in this audience, nobody is going to be outraged by the presence of uh, Antio Rationis in a quasi ontology. Okay. Now, uh, so let me just move on. Indeed, as we can see, this rich and this rich frame of reference can accommodate not only individual substances and their individualized forms, as the significance of their true predicates, whether those uh, are their real forms or mere beings of reason, but also universal forms, again, in the domain of beings of reason, in perfect agreement with Aristotle's and his commentators' doctrine of uh, the categories. Um, 
or um, having some other diminished form of being uh, even before the operations of reason just to uh, accommodate scooters. Uh, but that's a, a, another issue not to be um, made a big point of here. However, following Geech's inspiring suggestion consists not simply in appending a new subdomain to our universe of discourse, but rather in providing, again, a precise conceptual tool for keeping track of, crucial, of the crucial items in medieval discussions of universals by strictly distinguishing individualized forms as the values of the signification function of a common term from the corresponding universal form, abstracted from their individualizing conditions, um, um, their subject and time, namely the signification function of the common term in question itself, obtainable by the mathematically precise, precisely defined operation of functional abstraction, namely Alonzo Church's lambda abstraction. The items thus obtained then in our formal semantics can serve as precisely identifiable items in our universal discourse, modeling universals as the immediate significates of our uh, common terms, as opposed to their ulti as opposed to their ultimate significates, namely the individualized forms. These items then can be treated as mere objects of reason, that is objects um, we can think of, even if they do not exist in the abstract way in which we can think of them. As such, they are regarded. Um, as, not subject, uh, as not subject to variation with the variation of individuals or time, since they are obtained precisely by abstracting from these, and so they have to reside in a domain of items to be sharply distinguished from the domain of real beings, which are the only type of items that can be said to have actual or real existence. <coughs> but the whole point of all these technicalities is that they offer mathematically precisely defined, clearly traceable items to stand in for our otherwise hard to catch items in our metaphysical discussions. Indeed, so much so that these set theoretical ersatz items, functions and their values can easily be fed into the quasi ontologies of AI machines, which then with an appropriately defined validity checker can at once produce all, no matter how weird, implications of, our, of any of our claims. Well, am I endorsing now to, uh, am I endorsing now delegating uh, metaphysical discussions to AI machines? Of course not. What I'm suggesting instead is that using this technical machinery can help not only us, human thinkers, keep track of what we are doing, much like using a system of numerals, along with the algorithms for their manipulation, helps us keep track of our calculations, but it can also be helpful by feeding uh, it into AI systems doing natural language processing, much like feeding our numeral system and its algorithms into our calculators, so we don't have to slog through the boring process of a long division. In fact, the natural logic of the scholastics captured in this system in a machine processable form can teach these AI systems much of the workings of human language and thought. Indeed, in this teaching process, we can also learn a great deal about what is and what is not teachable to a machine. Doom the tables, this stimulus, right? In any case, um, um, we can be quite certain that in this process, it will always be the creative human intelligence that takes the lead. And I have a paper to prove that, <laughs> uh, referred to in the uh, uh, footnote. An artificial intelligence will always be dependent on the, uh, on the natural human intelligence for the latter's creativity, informing the concepts that then can be used for fast, precise processing by an AI system. In any case, the possibility of using the scholastic's natural logic for producing more intelligent AI systems is just another illustration of what awaits us on the horizon if we manage to achieve, using Gadamer's catchy phrase, the fusion of our horizons with our scholastic tradition. So to return in closing to my somewhat weird opening metaphor, 
walking backwards while facing forward. We can reach a point from which we can catch a glimpse of the outlines of the entirety of a Gothic cathedral of thought. Uh, we still need to build and chisel, yet one that is not in ruins, one that does not exist only in romantic fantasies based on scattered museum pieces, but one that is fully functioning, its gateway pointing the way toward the future in which our children working in their present toward their future will never be so alienated from our past as we have been throughout much of our modern history. Thank you very much for your attention. Oh, I cannot hear you. <laughs> uh, thank you thank for your uh, very no. thought. Thank you very much. I, I heard a little applause <laughs> when you turned the uh, one on. All right, thank you. Uh, uh, sorry, I didn't understand. Uh, okay. Okay, thank you for, for your talk and uh, now uh, questions or comments. Okay. Thanks, Jula. That was that was really really interesting. So, I have a question about. Um, so you you talked about the semantics of the Via Antiqua, and you mm -hmm. you know you proposed a kind of identity between that and what you called the inherence theory of predication. Um, and you spelled that out really nicely. Um, my question is, so the Via Antiqua was, a, was is maybe uh, a, a long-lived tradition, right? So at, at what point in the history of the development of semantics in the Via Antiqua do you take yourself to be sort of articulating? So um, maybe concretely, in the Renaissance, Practitioners of the Via Antiqua, both Scotist and Thomist, would say that we can engage in identical predication, quidditative predication, or denominative predication. And it looks to me like the inherence theory of predication that you've spelled out is not going to work in all of those instances of predication. So, um, is are there moments in the history of the Via Antiqua where we're semantic pluralists? And if so, why should we pick the time period of the life of the Via Antiqua that you've picked as opposed to maybe one of the later ones? Thanks. Thank you. This is a terrific, um, a really good question. Uh, obviously, here I only have time to present a very rough outline of um, a rather complicated um, semantic setup. I focused on uh, what is the uh, most distance from, most distant from what is available uh, in uh, today's uh, contemporary offerings in the a field of logical semantics. Um, apart from Gietje's suggestion, I don't know uh, any others, um, apart from my own work, that uh, would work on um, uh, the uh, technical reconstruction of um, an inherent theory of predication. Um, there are uh, other logical semantics based on uh, the identity uh, theory, and uh, there, um, um, most notably, um, um, George Engelbretson is working on um, uh, uh, the um, uh, logical semantics of uh, the uh, Polish logician. Okay, so there, there are all sorts of um, uh, different approaches to this uh, 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 analysis of uh, uh, simple um, predications. Um, and in fact, um, even those in the um, uh, 13th century um, who um, prioritized, as it were, um, uh, an inherent theory of predication, uh, at the same time allowed the presence of an identity analysis. Aquinas is a uh, pr prime example for that. Um, so uh, they did allow a multiplicity of the semantic function of the copula. Um, it expresses both inherence of the um, uh, uh, form signified in the subject and the identity of the suppositor of subject and predicate. Um, they treated uh, those as um, compatible, um, non-exclusive analyses. Um, in fact, uh, I uh, also reconstructed 
um, in a formal semantics, those alternatives. It was, um, um, in fact, the nominalists, um, starting with Occam, who uh, prioritized the identity theory uh, at the expense of the inheritance theory, um, um, using their uh, logical anal an analysis um, for the sake of uh, their ontological reductionist program. So uh, they were the first to put the card before the horse, that is, um, doing uh, logical semantics with an eye to um, reduced ontology, in which much of these um, uh, 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 considerations concerning identities, non-identities, quasi-identities, or less than numerical identities, or formal identities, modal identities, intentional identities, et cetera, et cetera. All these questions um, um, become pointless because, hey, we have a, a much easier way, a much simpler and more teachable more easily teachable way of doing semantics. That was one of the uh, big arguments of uh, uh, nominalists in, the, uh, in their uh, manifesto. That was the big pragmatic argument, uh, saying that, hey, um, even if um, the um, realist logicians are right about what they are saying, uh, nominalist, lo uh, nominalist logic is so uh, much easier to teach uh, a student are getting it much more easily. So there are uh, there are all sorts of um, uh, pragmatic considerations in these uh, debates as well. But uh, the point is that uh, this um, uh, the uh, formal theory, as I outlined it here, does not involve um, uh, such heavy ontological commitment as. Uh, Occam and his uh, disputations with uh, his, uh, his with Scotus and uh, and uh, Scotistic opponents such as Burley um, uh, presupposed and and charged them with um, the same type of ontological reduction is achievable within the framework of uh, the inherentist uh, theory of semantics or via antigua semantics, as I um, described it. Um, but uh, Occam did this easier way uh, to get around um, the uh, defenses as a, of um, a scholastic ontology, and uh, he just um, produced a different type of semantics. So. Um, the, um, that is why I'm, I'm arguing in many of my papers that the first paradigmatic shift um, in um, uh, medieval philosophy occurred with the emergence of alchemist nominalism, because uh, it is no longer the issue of who wins the um, game uh, um, in uh, metaphysical disputations, basically playing the same type of game. but introducing a new, new game, and then the question became, whose game should we play? Which is a radically different type of question. Okay, so, so much for uh, this issue very briefly. But uh, um, I would be really happy to be able to discuss these in further detail. And in fact, let me just, um, by way of a shameless plug, as it were. Let, uh, let me just call your attention to one of the footnotes in this paper that um, points to a website of a newly founded um, Learn Society, the Society for um, the um, History of Ideas, um, for the European History of Ideas, uh, which will have its next meeting in Lisbon um, next August. Um, which is going to be uh, devoted precisely to this type of issues. That is, um, uh, what is the uh, uh, interaction uh, between semantic, metaphysical, and theological principles? What drives the conceptual um, um, changes in the history of ideas? What type of intuitions and why precisely through what sort of mechanisms in different particular historical periods. So um, 
perhaps we can go on with this discussion at that meeting. Okay, there seems to be some question f uh, f online. David Svoboda? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, thank you, David. Yeah, uh, yeah uh, thank you very much for your inspiring paper. Um, I would like to mention that Professor Sousedik wrote a book uh, on identity theory of predication. So it's, um, it's, it's, I would like to ask you why you prefer the inherence theory of predication and uh, if you have any objections or uh, reservations about the identity theory of predication, can you briefly mention them? Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for the question. And I have no problem whatsoever with the identity theory. And um, in the meantime, I, I recall the name of Leshnevsky, right? Um, the uh, Polish logician who, um, uh, whose uh, ontology and mariology were um, really um, uh, influential in our field. And uh, um, he had uh, such followers as um, uh, George Engel Britton or Desmond Paul Henry. Um, and um, that is all good. I have uh, no problem with them, but um, they are uh, not as useful uh, for identifying the items that we are talking about in um, uh, um, scholastic metaphysical, metaphysical discussions. So I find uh, the inherence theory um, uh, preferable in terms of the goals of what I'm trying to achieve with this tool, okay? So it's not that uh, one is better than the other, they are equivalent. But um, so, uh, there is nothing in inherently wrong with the one or the other, or with the uh, uh, Tarskian or with the Fragian. These are um, equivalent uh, conditions of truth for the same proposition. But what do you want to do uh, with this tool of logical semantics? If you want to you know, talk about formalities, uh, exist, uh, acts, acts, uh, uh, acts of existence, um, um, et cetera, et cetera, all those um, um, abstracta that uh, uh, scholastics uh, are talking about, then you better start with this um, sort of semantic construction, which gives you precisely the sort of uh, tools that you need to have um, on hand for properly tracing the items that occur in such discussions. So it's a pragmatic choice, really, um, a, a goal-determined uh, choice, not uh, um, uh, based on some uh, intrinsic value uh, 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 of the one over the other. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, Michael? <laughs> okay, a very, very quick question. Okay. So I have a question, thank you for that, and I have a, um, it seems to me that what you're the, what, what you've proposed for us does is it makes it easier for us to understand and make sense out of metaphysical claims and metaphysical arguments. Um, and the power of it is that it's neutral among many different competing metaphysical claims. But at the same time, that means we still don't know how to decide among competing metaphysical claims. So I was wondering if you have thoughts about how to move to, I mean, I realize it's beyond the scope of your paper, but how do we go beyond this sort of analysis to actually deciding which metaphysical claims are the true ones? Oh, thank you, Michael. And by the way, it's uh, great to see you there. <laughs> I was really hoping to meet you there personally, but anyway, um, and this is how it worked out. Uh, so they, um, uh, once you have this uh, machinery in place, you can very easily reconstruct uh, metaphysical arguments. Uh, just to uh, give a, uh, a quick illustration. Uh, okay, we have this uh, issue of the um, plurality versus singularity of um, substantial forms in one and the same material substance, right? Humanity, animality, corporality, let's say. Okay, now uh, we have, uh, these are the significant uh, signif significata 
of the corresponding predicates, um, man or human, animal, uh, body, etc. And we say that these are uh, substantial predicates, which means the essa of each is identical with the essa of what these predicates are true of, right? And so um, then um, assume you have two distinct um, uh, substantial forms in one and the same thing, say um, the thing uh, that is um, animal and, and, and human, right? Now, so the self, uh, um, um, but um, suppose the um, uh, animality is distinct from humanity, right? There are two distinct forms, and each has its own essa when it is actual in the thing. But if both are um, substantial forms, then the essa of each is the same as the essa of softies, let's say, if I'm talking about softies. So the two distinct forms with the two distinct acts of uh, um, actus ascendi would have to be identical with one and the same act of ascendi, right? Um, which is, um, um, uh, which would mean that the um, uh, two distinct acts of being would have to be uh, the same as one and the same act of being, which is uh, contradictory, right? So uh, this would, however, now I'm, um, uh, yes? I was just going to say, I'm uh, completely sympathetic to the argument, but insofar as it's grows directly out of the semantics, I'm sure that our Franciscan friends would say that you've just created the semantics in a way that begs the question. Um, no. Even though I'm because... on your side on this issue. <laughs> no, thank you, Michael. But uh, this is, uh, here, here's the thing. This is not the end of the story. This is just uh, the way Aquinas would say that uh, uh, if you uh, assume that the thing already has a substantial form, then any other form that the thing can take on uh, can only be accidental. Because uh, precisely that the essa of the other form can not be the same as the essa that is already present in the um, uh, substantial form of the thing. Now, uh, but uh, uh, um, Franciscans uh, might say that, oh, um, these two, uh, these uh, different substantial forms can have one and the same uh, act of being, essa, right? Uh, what prevents us from saying, and nothing in the semantics prevents us from saying, that the essa of animality and the essa of humanity are the same as the essa of softies. Each uh, of these three items are actual on account of one and the same act of um, existence. Fine. But then um, there are two problems for the uh, Franciscans. Um, they can uh, uh, sustain the distinctness of humanity and animality only if they give up their other claim that the essa of humanity is the same as the essa of animality, right? So they would have to buy into the uh, much hated Thomistic claim of the distinct, a real distinction between essence and existence. Right? So uh, that is why I uh, insisted on this um, business um, uh, yesterday about uh, the essay of the forms and the essay of the thing of which uh, these are the forms. Uh, are these uh, uh, identities or non-identities? And uh, one of these claims uh, must go for the Franciscans, or they um, would say, oh, each has a, its own essay. Um, Southeast has its own essa, his humanity has its own essa, and um, uh, uh, his uh, animality has its own essa, and uh, each of these acts of being are distinct. Fine, but then uh, what happens to the unity of Southeast, given the convertibility of being and essence? So uh, Southeast turns out to be not an ens, but entia. 
you, thank you very much. Uh, we could follow discussing this matter on and on, but we have to move on, actually. And uh, now I would like to invite uh, Prokop Sousedík. Uh, and, um, thank you very much. Uh, th th thank you. Who <coughs> uh, uh, will uh, deliver a, a, a talk? Uh, which is titled with a question, is there a change with respect to relations? Uh, David Svoboda uh, should have, uh, is also a co-author of uh, this, this lecture, but uh, he cannot be present, so perhaps he, he will participate somehow uh, online, but uh, okay, uh, Prokop, the floor is yours. So thank you, uh, David Svoboda is not here because he is positive, I am here because I am negative. It was confirmed by the test and I hope it won't be confirmed by my presentation. So, first remark, second remark, uh, it is not a historical presentation, it is a systematic presentation, although we work with historical text, they serve us as uh, inspiration, so correct, in, uh, correct interpretation maybe is in some cases not quite uh, precise. Um, so let me start uh, with first uh, division into thoughts or uh, into parts. Uh, first, we will um, um, formulate our problem. Second, uh, we shall show a solution on the background of Dunscotus ontology. Third, we show uh, uh, the same on the background of Henry's ontology, Henry's of Ghent ontology. Then we will compare the both a solution and we will show our uh, our. Uh, Solution. Oh, yeah. No, division, uh, the problem of change with regard to relation. As is well known, Aristotle distinguished between substantive and accidental, accidental changes. In his discussion of accidental changes, we encounter a certain difficulty concerning relation. For Aristotle maintains that there cannot be motion in respect of relation. Here is the famous citation from physics. Uh, the provocativeness of this statement becomes apparent if we recall that the following six categories depend in one way or another on relations. Should we not then recognize only accidental changes concerning absolute accidents, quantity and quality? It is provocative because it, is, uh, it, um, it follows uh, um, something like semi-parmenidaism. Uh, Aristotle says that there is a motion, but in respect of relation there is no motion, so uh, it is a little bit problem. Co? Jo, no tak si to přečtěte. Prezentace na té flashce, aby to viděli i ty online. Tak, ale já jsem... Je tady? Ne. Já jsem to... Sorry, it means... Uh... Teď, hele, Lukáš, je tady. Tady je ta flashka. Sorry, about... Confusion. So here is the famous citation, uh, I can read it. 
nor is there motion in respect of relation, says Aristotle, for it may happen that when one's correlative changes, the other, although this not, uh, does not itself change, may be true or not true, so that is in these cases the motion, uh, so that in these cases the motion is accidental. It is a difficult uh, statement. I will try to interpret it in the following. Arguments now, now arguments against change with regard to relations for and against. The existence of change with respect to relation is supposed by, first, our, our ordinary experience. Second, the logic of categorical scheme according to which relations are accidents that inhere and in substance support the motion too, because uh, uh, relation inheres in the subject, inheres in substance. However, Aristotle's argument mentioned in the previous page, which we interpret as, uh, which we interpret as of follows, may speak against it. A new relation may come to one member of relation, and yet it need not change. E.g., if Alexander outgrows Philip, Philip acquires a new relation, but he doesn't change. However, Philip may also become smaller than Alexander due to some injury. Thus, in our judgment, the relativum does not necessarily change with respect to relation but changes only accidentally or contingently. Uh, we are thus faced with a dilemma. Ordinary experience and the categorical scheme speak for the existence of change. Aristotle's remark speaks against it. A deeper analysis of an, uh, Aristotle's remarks is the key how to clarify the dilemma. We will make this analysis with the help of the conceptions of Scotus and Henry of Ghent. Uh, the advocate of change uh, with respect to relation is famously Scotus. Scotus is a consistent proponent of the traditional form of categorical scheme. Thus, there is a self-existent substance and nine inhering accidents. We will call this scheme uh, the one-level scheme substance, quantity, and so on, and we find there, of course, also relation. Uh, relation are therefore accidental forms that are distinct from their fundamentals, and therefore, with respect to a relation, changes exist, for it is inconceivable that a new form should accede to something and that something should not change because of that form. The existence of change with respect to relation is further confirmed by a number of arguments that Scotus draw from our ordinary experience as well as from theology. The most prominent is the argument from ordering. Uh, now the argument from ordering. This argument is based on our common experience that uh, there is a real difference between a whole of things that is ordered and the whole of things that is not ordered. E.g. things in a room are tied up and then someone throws them away. This confirms, this argument confirms first the existence of real change with respect to relation new relations occur between things. Second, the traditional categorical scheme according to which a relation is an accident that inheres in the subject. Third, there is a real distinction between fundament of relation and the relation itself. This, however, brings Scotus into conflict with Aristotle's remark with respect to relation. Uh, relations. Relativum does not change contingently, but necessarily. Uh, Scott is copying with the remark, uh, I leave and skip to uh, Henry of Ghent. In contrast to Scotus, Henry is, uh, in, in contrast to Scotus, Henry, in our judgment, presents a two-level categorical scheme. First level, 
creative things, res, are divided into first three categories. Substance is the thing that subsists, quantity and quality are merged into one group because things that fall under these categories have in common that they inhere in substance. Second level, uh, distinguish about, uh, distinguish absolute, sorry, and uh, 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 relational modes of being. The subsisting substance does exist absolutely and or uh, re uh, relationally. And the same is true of the, uh, of the, in of the inhering absolute accident. So you can see it's only attempt to make it more visible. Substance and uh, uh, two modes of existence. I can exist uh, uh, exists ab in absolute way or in relational way. I am a man and I am a father, for example. A relation is thus separated from the inhering being. Uh, it, has, it has no reality of its own and represents only a special way of being. This ontological uh, scheme leads to the conclusion that the, the uh, relational being, esse ab alio, can be attached to esse in se and esse in alio. And in my view, this is something like a revolution. Henry's analysis of Aristotle's remark. Uh, the Henryan approach is in line with Aristotle's remark and can be better understood against its background. To do this, we need to compare the change with respect, first, absolute, and second, relational accidents. Uh, first, absolute accidents. If a substance acquires a new absolute uh, accident, it necessarily has a new absolute mode of being, and it undergoes necessarily a real change. Second, if a substance acquires a new relation, it necessarily has a new relation mode of being. However, its real change does not necessarily occur. If somebody in India becomes similar to me, uh, uh, that, uh, the mode of existence changes, but I am the same man. Hence, relations are not inhering accidents. Uh, this confirms not only Aristotle's remark, but also Henry's categorical scheme, as we have seen. Now we can go to comparing Scott with Henry of Ghent, uh, pros and cons, and to then formulate uh, our own statement. Uh, uh, a. Henry's solution is in accord with Aristotle's remark, but Scotus is not or is problematic. B. Scotus' solution is in accord with our common experience. Henry is not. For according to Henry, relational changes are merely changes of mode of being. Uh, see, Scotus' solution is in accord with the idea that God is imitated not only by individual things, but also by their amazing ar arrangements. Attempting our, our uh, solution. Uh, if we want to navigate between Scylla and Charybdis of both approaches, we must go back to Scotus' argument, uh, argument that is about ordering and ask what ontological status ordering, ordo, at it, uh, its member, uh, member is. To solve uh, this problem, we use Aquinas and Aristotle's text. Aquinas distinguish two kinds of perfection. One is given by what inheres in things absolutely, the other by the ordering of one thing to another, just as the good of an army consists in the ordering of its parts. The distinction of two perfection leads us to see that God is imitated first by substances in which inhere absolute accidents, second by the ordering of a whole relatives. 
Now we can look at the ontological status of ordering uh, and its relatives in terms of Aquinas distinction between two kinds of perfections. The ambiguity of Aquinas approach. There are two interpretations. First, or A, Aquinas says that perfection has first a whole consisting of substance and absolute accidents. Second, a whole of relatives. If the ontological status of one is esse in se, then second should have uh, the same status. What remains are unclear is the ontological status of relative. Uh, second interpretation B, immediately following text, however, is not in agreement with uh, the interpretation A. For Aquinas identifies the ordering with relations, it asked with inherent accidents. Consequently, perfection should be determined differently from A. It as it is given by inherence of relational accidents. So we could correct Aquinas and say that the perfection is given by inherent, absolute, or a relative accidents. So we correct the text before here, yes? This text is not precise according to this interpretation. Uh, the ontological status of whole of relative is thus reduced to substance in which relational accidents inhere. From this, the ontological status of relative is clear. It is a substance in a secondary mode of being and therefore has being in itself, as in said. The ontological status of a whole of relatives, on the other hand, seems unclear. It should be stressed that this ambiguity, A and B, these two interpretative attempts, uh, is not su superficial since we already encounter something sim similar in Aristotle's categories. In what follows, we prefer the interpretation A against B speaks both. Aristotle's remark about change with respect to relation and uh, also some arguments we find in Aristotle categories chapter seven. This argument focus on the ontological status of relatives. Uh, the categories our interpretation again. Whereas Aquinas' considerations are ambiguous with respect to ontological status of a whole of relatives, Aristotle's considerations are ambiguous with respect to the ontological status of a relative alone. There are first defined as such things that are in some way in a relation to something else. If this is so, uh, interpretation B and Scotus categorical scheme is correct. A relative, um, a relative is a substance which is perfected not only by absolute but also by re uh, relational accidents. However, Aristotle later uh, reconsiders this approach when he argues that a relative is not substance. He makes two arguments we, uh, which we reconstruct as follows. Uh, first premise, to know the composite, it as the substance in which some absolute accidents inheres, only um, composite is uh, sufficient. However, to know the relative properly, one must also know what it refers to it as the, the correlative. So if, for example, we know for sure that it is double, we also know for sure what is doubled off. There is therefore an important epistemological distinction between substance in which some absolute existent inheres and the relative. Second argument, the substance in which an absolute accident inheres is not said to be toward something. The relative, on the contrary, is said to be toward something. Thus, 
A substance in which an absolute accident inheres and relative are spoken of in fundamentally different ways. These arguments seem to affirm that the relative is not a substance and does not have its mode of being, as a in say. The question is now ontological status of relative. Uh, Aristotle, uh, according to uh, Aristotle's first definition, relative is a composite of a substance and accident that has being in itself. This is in accord with Aquinas' idea that ordering is a relation inhering in substance. This means the interpretation B. However, Aristotle's arguments above suggest that substance is not relative. This leads uh, to his second definition. Uh, this definition uh, is those things are relatives for which being is the same as, as being somehow related to something. This definition brings us closer to Henry's conception, which ascribes to a relative the special ontological status of esse ad aliud. But if a relative has a being to another, as at aliud, it cannot have being in itself, as in se, with, uh, within the whole of relatives. This is not in accord both with interpretation of Aquinas B and with Scotus' approach. We thus confirm Henry's ideas and distinguish, uh, distinguish three basic modes of being to the, uh, to the traditional. Esse in se and esse in alio, we add esse at aliud. So it is uh, confirmation of Henry. Ontological parameters of esse at aliud. In the, uh, in the notion of esse at aliud, as in the no concept of esse in aliud, there is a certain ontological dependence. The being of an accidental dependence on the, uh, 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 on the being of substance, the being of a relative, uh, relative dependence on some X. So it is the question what the dependence of esse at, at aliud is. If we do not want to fall into infinite regress, this X cannot have the same dependent being as a relative. It, has, it cannot be its correlative. Recall now that uh, according to Aquinas, relatives and correlatives constitute the whole which, according to the interpretation A, has a self-existence being, as a in se. The being of relative thus depends on, on a whole of the relatives. Conclusion, in Aquinas' uh, distinction of the perfection, we are inclined towards interpretation A. Whole of relative has esse in se. We add that uh, relative has esse at aliud, which ontologically depend, uh, is depend, de depends on the whole of relatives. Uh, our proposal how to now address the uh, issue of the uh, accidental change. Our analysis consists in deepening Henry's conception. Let us repeat Henry's analysis of change. First, if a substance accepts absolute accident, it necessarily has both uh, a different mode of being and really changes. Second, if a substance accepts a relational accident, it necessarily had a different mode of being, but it really changes only contingently or accidentally. The problem with this interpretation is that a change according to a mode of being, modus essendi, does not necessarily imply a real change. The unacceptability of this claim is demonstrated by Scotus' argument. Arguments, sorry. Our analysis. First, see above Henry analysis, 
second again uh, Henry's analysis, but thanks to Dunskotus, we can complete his solution. For essay in se has not only substance, but also a whole of relatives. However, a whole of relatives changes necessarily if there is change of relational accident. For it is uh, ordered in a different way and uh, therefore acquires new perfection. So we found a new subject of change. Uh, Aristotle found uh, substance we, we add um, whole of relatives. Uh, changes not only substance, uh, changes also whole of relatives. Uh, Henry's analysis does go in the right direc uh, direction. Its shortcoming, however, however, is that it examines uh, the problem of motion exclusively from the perspective of substance. Conclusion, Aristotle uh, remark applies to an ontological scheme in which only substance has a certain say. However, this remark, in light of Scotus' arguments, shows that uh, the categorical scheme is too narrow. It leads to the denial of all uh, relational movements. We therefore propose to hold that essay in se has not only a whole of matter and form, it a substance, but also a whole of relatives. A necessary con uh, condition of this solution, however, is that we add to the traditional mode of being essay in se, essay in alio, another way of being essay at alio. And that's all, thank you for attention. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, other questions? Uh, why not think that relatives have both essay in alio and essay ad aliud? Just like maybe uh, quantity has essay in alio and essay extensum or something like that. Why? Why? No, no, according to you. Absolute essay or essay in se and essay at aliud. No, no, so I'm asking why not think of um, relations as having both essay in alio being accidents that inhere in a, a subject and essay ad aliud relating that subject to another. Why, why, why make those exclusive? In my view, uh, relation has no accidental being uh, mm, that inheres in a substance. If I add to me a relation, for example, I became similar to somebody in India, so there is no accidental change in me. Okay, so, so that, that seems plausible for certain kinds of relations. Certain kinds of relations seem plausible to, to reduce, but, but certain kinds of at least seemingly relational things seem less plausible to reduce, like um, your being the cause of something else that's traditionally analyzed as a relative. My being? Your being the cause of something. No, yes, if, if it, it, it is, in, in my view, it is plausible for all relations. And uh, somet sometimes happens that I change, but I change in absolute accidents. I change, as uh, Aristotle says, accidentally. Huh? I, um, you, became, uh, you became my daughter. It, it, it happened to me. And she, she became bigger than me. Eh? I didn't change at all. But. But I could, uh, I could change. I could go by car and to, to, to have some uh, no, no. no yep. accident. Sorry, <laughs> accident. And uh, therefore, I am now smaller than, than my uh, daughter. It is accident uh, that uh, that concerns the absolute acci uh, absolute acci uh, accidents. This change. Okay, so so the view is that 
uh, relations do not have any essay in, they don't have any essay in alio, they're not accidental forms at all, and they ontologically depend on the they, whole of the relatives. They don't in here. Yet. Okay. Thank you. May, may I ask someone But else? maybe, can you hear me? maybe, sorry. David? Can, can you hear me? Yes. Go yeah. on. Andreas, if, I think there is a simple answer to your question. If, if a relation is an inhering accident, then uh, there can there can't be a relation. Uh, there can't be relation with change, and uh, you are in uh, you are not in accord with Aristotle's remark. So I think both aspects are uh, not compatible. If you take seriously this Aristotle remark. Uh, I have got a question. Uh, what is a relation according to your uh, view? I, I just don't get it. Uh, so, so what, what is a relation according to your theory? Uh, we didn't. We didn't spoken about uh, this problem. Yes. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> well, what is a relation? It, it is a further difficult, difficult problem. But uh, I can only hint uh, uh, what is what is the uh, what is the way to relation. I say that uh, changes in respect to, uh, to relation uh, are connected with the whole of relatives. Yes. And it is. It is the. Uh, it is what the, do you it mean is by the, the whole of relatives? Uh, it is the conclusion of this. Uh, one of the conclusion of this uh, of this paper. Yes. Change. Uh, I, I have spoken about changes with respect to relation, and to the conclusion is that uh, in this respect doesn't change substance, but whole of relatives. And, and what, what, what does that mean? Of, sorry. Whole yeah. of relatives are uh, connected with, uh, with the relation. And if you want to have the answer to your question, so you have to be concerned with this whole, not with substance. You have to abstract this... Uh, this... Uh, yeah. and uh, I just don't understand. What do you mean by the whole of relations? You mean the two, whole of two, relatives? To, the two correlatives to, taken together. Yes, aggregate, uh, aggregate, uh, ordered, yeah. uh, ordered aggregate. So, in your view, a relation is something connected with a pair of relatives. Yes. And it's not an accident. It is yeah? not an accident. Okay. Uh, it is not an accident. If you want to hear some discussion from today, so, uh, so you have to uh, go to the structure, uh, structuralism in mathematics to Stuart Shapiro, and he speaks about problem of universals connected with, uh, with uh, he speaks that structures exist uh, in regus or uh, anterem and so forth. So the discussion, what is or, or where is the relation? Uh, goes in this direction, but it was not the topic of this uh, of this paper. Okay, thank you. Uh, any more questions? Or, or David? Or David wanted to say something? Or, or no. Uh, yeah, yes. Uh, just needed to unmute my mic. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So. Um, I may have missed it um, during the lecture, but um, I didn't hear any mention of um, two common distinctions in medieval philosophy concerning relations, namely the uh, distinction between relativa secundum dt and relativa secundum esse, and uh, the um, uh, uh, real relations and relations of reason, which are uh, non uh, coincidental uh, distinctions, but um, that they are actually um, cutting across, uh, marking out four different domains, four different types of relations. Um, uh, it it appeared to me that the paper uh, treated all relations, uh, all scale, right, and, and um, under uh, one cover, as it were, but. Um, it was regarded 
as relevant to the issue of um, a change um, with regard to relatives, um, whether um, we are talking about one type of relative or another type of relative. And um, uh, there's a, a very important and interesting discussion for this and um, in Mark Hanninger's book about the um, uh, medieval conception of relations. Um, maybe that is still the uh, um, best, uh, more recent treatment of uh, medieval conception of relations. Um, I should say that um, at least uh, those uh, distinctions and, and Mark Hanninger's um, discussion of those uh, should be taken into account, even in a modern systematic discussion of the problem of um, change um, with regard to relatives. So, um, uh, do you have any um, um, any uh, ways of um, showing the connection between your treatment, your contemporary treatment of uh, the problem, and and these historical distinctions, or uh, do you, uh, do you think they are not? Um, quite relevant to your project. I'm just wondering uh, how, to what extent uh, you would bring in um, these um, historical distinctions. After all, the um, uh, the uh, very question of the paper is dependent on um, historical treatment. That is uh, Aristotle's. Ms. Gotes and um, Henry's and Aquinas's. So I was just surprised not to have heard um, anything about these distinctions in the paper. Okay. Uh, David no. or, or so, Prokop? Uh, 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 I'm sorry, sorry my, my, my understanding system. was not uh, precise. Maybe uh, David, uh, David's understanding. Well, well, briefly spoken, uh, the relations secundum esse and uh, secundum dici, uh, they were uh, interpreted in a scholastic tradition differently. And uh, Aquinas says that uh, relations secundum dici are just relatives. It means concrete, uh, it, means con it means concrete substance plus relation, father, for example. And relation secundum esse, it's just relation of form, thanks to which the relative is in is in um, uh, relation to something else. So, in our view, um, we were not speaking about the ontological status of relation. We just say that we just so far we just know that relation is not an inhering accident. So, um, this distinction. Uh, in the distinction of, rela of uh, relation secundum dici and secundum esse, we just have a closer look at uh, relation secundum dici. And uh, secundum esse we leave aside because we think that relation is not an inhering accident for the reason I have mentioned. And uh, in this project, we would, we would like to go further, of course, and uh, try to think through the ontological status of relation. But uh, so far, we can only say what the relation is not. So we take into account this uh, distinction, and uh, uh, it, it, but, uh, and uh, we have to elaborate it. So this is so far what I can say. Thank you, Gia. Gia. Okay, um, I look forward to seeing. Uh, but the change is real. Of, uh, bringing so in those you, distinctions. So yeah. Yeah. Okay. In, in this sense. If you take seriously the Scotus' arguments, so, so the change in respect to relation is real, so we are realists uh, in this sense. But uh, exact, relation, exact, uh, exact solution we have not prepared yet. Okay. Uh I'm afraid uh, we have to make a break now, but I think the discussion can continue uh, while we eat and uh, drink coffee. Okay, so uh, thanks to Prokop and to David who collaborated in preparation of this paper. And uh, let's have, uh, let, let's have uh, 10 minutes uh, to 11 fives. So, so at, at five minutes past 11, we'll meet again here. 
Okay.
Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to ask you to take your seats and we'll proceed to the next talk, which will be given by Father uh, John Peck. And the title of his talk is Stange Halmorphism and the Iliatic Principle. And I would ju just li like to know that the, for online participators, handouts are available at the, in, at the download section of the website. Okay, so, uh, okay yeah, and, and, and uh, uh, I will ask Prokop to just read this. Okay, so floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, right, so the handout, there are three sheets, and I've right, piled them so that right, they can be easily distributed. Thank you very much. Uh, first, let me uh, apologize for my tardiness. I was uh, teaching uh, on Tuesday. I had to teach on Tuesday morning in St. Louis, and so I wasn't able to leave there until, uh, what day is it? Today is Thursday, I guess, until t Tuesday evening and just arrived last night, but I, uh, it sounds as though I missed a truly uh, excellent day yesterday. Um, so my talk, Staunch Hylomorphism and the Eliatic Principle, I think, uh, well, much of what uh, Jula Klima, Professor Jula Klima, was was speaking of in the in his talk, um, sort of, I guess, resonated with some of the things that that I'm going to say too, because I feel as though um, the story that I'm going to tell about what's some of what's happening in contemporary hylomorphism uh, is akin to uh, say someone who's found a really important piece of the rubble of that once glorious Gothic cathedral and really fastened upon that piece of the rubble. But then another, let's say, complementary piece of the puzzle um, sort of remains far from view. And if one just had that other piece, well then you could really start building again. Um, I hope you see what I mean in the course of, of this talk. So um, yeah, really a kind of just big picture before I, I get into what I'm going to say. Um, the, in, the, in the talk, I'm basically going to discuss how uh, a sort of group of contemporary hylomorphists adopt a restricted version of the so-called Eliatic principle, sometimes called Alexander's dictum, um, that to be is to have causal powers. So there's a group of contemporary hylomorphists who've adopted a restricted version of that principle and I think that, that the way that they've adopted the principle has caused them, anyway, one of, one of the things that falls out of their versions of hylomorphism is, sadly, all we've got actually are per occidens unities, that we don't have, um, we don't have intrinsically unified substances, um, which is precisely contrary to the intention of some of these hylomorphists that I'm going to speak about. Um, the way that they adopt the Eliatic principle, um, in a sense, ends up upending their whole, their whole project. Um, and what I'm going to say is that, um, in fact, we could still adopt uh, a different restricted version of this Eliatic principle, or anyway, the, the hylomorphous, the robust staunch hylomorphous could do that. And um, as a result, um, uh, but, 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 but provided, provided that we find this missing piece, this missing bit of the rubble of that once glorious Gothic cathedral. So um, the question that uh, I'm going to ask as a way of, of um, kind of digging into the paper is that for a per se unified composite, that is for a substance, what is the relation between the powers of that whole substance and the powers of the substance's proper parts? Now, to see why this conclusion is relevant to hylomorphism and um, uh, this Eliatic principle, I want to introduce a distinction that Rob Coons makes between staunch and faint-hearted hylomorphisms. 
So staunch hylomorphism is just to say that um, there are intrinsically unified composite beings. That is, there are composite beings whose parts are themselves not substances, that the whole is, in a sense, uh, something over and above its parts, that the parts of the substance derive their identity, they are dependent for their identity on their being parts of that substance. So staunch hylomorphism just says there are those kinds of things, whereas faint-hearted hylomorphism says, no, there are some composites, but in fact, uh, the parts of those composites all depend, uh, are independent uh, of, that, uh, of the, that composite for their identity. So all you have are accidentally unified composites. So Kuhns asks, if we think there are, if we want to be staunch, if we think there are per se unified substances, um, it's going to be a really important question uh, to answer. That is, again, what is the relation between the powers of the substance and the powers of these lower levels, the powers of the proper parts of that substance? Um, so, again, I want to say in, in a moment why that question uh, is so important for Kuhn's and for some of the other hylomorphists that I'm going to, for the other hylomorphists that I'm going to be speaking about. So, Kuhn's says that one proposal in terms of, yeah, what's, what's the relationship between the lower level powers and the powers of the whole substance is just to say the powers of the whole substance are wholly grounded in the powers of their parts. But he says that is not an answer to the question that a staunch hylomorphist can adopt. And he says that this suggestion it's clearly intention, intent, intention with the staunch hylomorphous commitment to the fundamentality of composite substances. There's something basic at the level of the whole, such that it is, if you will, the source of the identity of all of its proper parts. Um, if we say that the powers of the whole are just, yeah, kind of entirely built out of the causal powers of the parts, then that doesn't seem, doesn't seem compatible with the idea that there's something basic at the level of the whole. So, well, why think that? Why think that the fundamentality of powers of substance, um, why infer the fundamentality of the powers of the, of the substance from the fundamentality of substances? Why think that because you have intrinsically unified, um, that the be be belief in the intrinsically unified composites uh, necessitates that there are um, powers that are also fundamental at the level of the whole substance? And I think kind of what's in the background here for Kuhn's and for the other hylomorphists that I'm going to discuss is Trenton Merrick's uh, overdetermination argument. And um, this argument, some of you no doubt are familiar with it. It basically says, um, and I've, I've kind of rehearsed it here, if we take an object like a baseball, if that baseball exists, sorry, that's yeah, you know, an American American sport. If we take if we take a football, um, and uh, if that football exists, well, then it's going to be causally irrelevant the existence of the football to whether the parts of the football P1 dot 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 acting in concert cause an effect like the football's. Um, you know, this is why a baseball is a good example because a baseball right, can break a window very easily. Maybe the football won't. But, you know, so a football is kicked by, uh, yeah, by Beckham or somebody and it goes through, it breaks a window. That's its effect. Um, so if the football exists, it is causally irrelevant to whether its parts break the window. Um, Merricks takes it for obvious that, well, yeah, the little atoms that compose that football, they, working together, break the window. He supposes that the breaking of the window is not overdetermined. Therefore, if O exists, if the football exists, the football does not cause the breaking of the window. And Merricks continues, he says, look, you know, if we, uh, Clearly, if there are composite beings, right, if there is, if there are things like footballs, certainly they would have some effect on the world. 
But if we go around, we can, you know, inspect all of these footballs breaking windows, we say, actually, none of them cause anything. These alleged composites aren't doing anything. And so this becomes, therefore, they don't exist. So Merrick's argument is eliminativist about um, things like footballs. And so the idea, again, why, um, why suppose that um, the fundamentality of substances requires the fundamentality of causal powers, for someone like Coons, well, we believe in the fundamentality of causal powers, so of causal, of, 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 we believe in the fundamentality of substances, and so if we find um, the, those, those substances that we believe in, uh, they've got to have, right, what makes them substances or what is the mark of their being substances is that they are doing things which atoms, say the atoms of a football or the atoms of any alleged composite working collaboratively don't do. There's got to be some activity, right, if, there, if we've got a substance, our belief that it is a substance, if that belief is, is correct, then those, then that substance has got to be able to do something over and above what its parts do acting collaboratively. Because if it can, if it can only do what its atoms are doing, well then we could apply Merrick's overdetermination argument to it. So if we've, we're only entitled to believe in a substance if that composite, uh, if, if an alleged composite can do things over and above what its parts are doing. Peter Van Inwagen, who's of the same eliminativist disposition as, as Merrick's, um, you know, he does something in terms of thinking. You know, how do we know um, if an arrange, uh, uh, that, that some particles arranged Y-wise are something more than just those particles arranged in that way? Well, it's because that arrangement can do something uh, over and above what the particles are doing. So Van Inwagen, right, very famously says, look, particles, they don't think. Particles, uh, you know, thinking has to be something, he says, more than just uh, a consistent habit of collaboration among simple particles. So the fact that we've got be beings that think means, well, there must be, there must be a thinker there. There must be something uh, over and above the parts. And so, apropos of Van Inwagen, um, Bill Jaworski, one of the, one of the uh, hylomorphists that I'm going to consider, he says, look, Van Inwagen, similarly to Merrick's, eliminates tables, chairs, right? He, deliver, he, he eliminates from his ontology most macroscopic objects. They don't exist. Well, why does he stop with organisms, right? Why does he stop? And there's an argument that Van Inwagen uh, offers. Okay, yeah, he starts with thinkers and he, he says, okay, well, actually, I, I'm going to include organisms in my ontology. Well, why deny that? Why not deny that all composites exist, right? Why not deny that, say, thinkers exist or organisms? And Van, Wag Van Inwagen's most compelling answer is that organisms have non-redundant causal powers that other alleged composites lack. The activities attributed to artifacts and natural bodies can be understood as disguised cooperative activities performed by simples. The chair, the mountain, and the planet don't do anything that cannot be exhaustively described and explained by appeal to the activities of muriological simples. But according to Van Inwagen, not all activities are like this. Organisms are capable of doing things that cannot be done by simples alone, but only by composite individuals. We are thus forced to grant that they exist as distinctive individuals since they engage in activities like thinking, which, as Van Inwagen argues, cannot be performed by simples alone. So this is all by way of saying these staunch hylomorphists that I'm going to discuss, they all think that um, substances, the mark of these composite substances is that they can do things. They've got non-redundant causal powers over and above the causal powers of their proper parts as those parts are arranged. And so the Eleatic principle, to be is to bear causal powers, restricted to um, the domain of alleged macroscopic, uh, macrophysical uh, composite substances becomes this principle F, 
A composite y is unified per se at a time t only if y bears fundamental causal powers, that is, powers not wholly grounded in the intrinsic properties of y's parts, the x's, and the spatial relations obtaining among the x's at t. So, so basically what they're doing is they're taking kind of the machinery that we have from Merrick's and this, um, you know, what he takes to be the criterion of having a macroscopic composite, and they're saying, well, this is what we need, um, this, this is what marks really just substances. Some of these guys, like um, Toner, for instance, Patrick Toner, that I'm about to discuss, um, they don't actually accept Merrick's overdetermination argument for eliminativism. Um, they think, look, it's just silly not, to, like Toner says, look, it's just silly not to believe in, in baseballs. Um, and he's, he's, got, he's got reasons for that. But he says, okay, um, I am going to take this same sort of uh, criterion for that, say, Van Inwagen and Merrick's use um, in order to, to kind of, uh, in, in order to maintain, say, thinkers, and I'm going to apply it to, to substances, intrinsic unities, not just not just any, perhaps, per Akidens um, uh, composites. So um, the first hylomorphist, staunch hylomorphist that I want to talk about, and I may not get to all three of them um, because of the limits of time, is Patrick Toner. So Patrick Toner, um, in a number of papers, uh, one in particular, but then he kind of uh, formulates the theory further. This, he, he formulates a view of emergent substances. And um, the motivation for this theory is basically, well, like Merrick's, like Van Inwagen, Toner is looking for um, a motivation for a moderate view about composition. So you've got universals, uh, universal uh, composition, right? Everything, right, this computer, my shoe, and uh, right, uh, the door at the back. They compose an object, that's universalism. Nihilism denies that they are composites. Well, really, we want to hit the sweet spot of a moderate answer to Peter Van Inwagen's special composition question. Under what conditions do some things compose some larger thing? And one of the things, one of the important arguments in this discussion is an argument, of, of, a vagueness argument for universal composition offered by David Lewis. And that argument, just real fast, um, Lewis says, look, any conditions that you're going to propose for um, composition, that those con conditions are going to be fulfilled along a continuum. So for instance, let's say the particle, there are some particles that compose me. A particle deep inside my brain is somehow more a part of me than, say, a particle you know, on the surface of my skin. Right? There's a kind of continuum there. And you can do that any, any, any uh, again, any conditions for composition, you can, you can kind of set that out, set them out along a continuum. And Lewis says, look, if you've got this continuum, either um, you're going to need, either it's, there's going to have to be a sharp uh, break-off point, cut-off point, on the one side of which you have the x's compose the y, on the other side of that sharp uh, cutoff point, the x's don't compose anything, or alternatively, um, composition is going to be vague, right? If you don't have that sharp cutoff point, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be vague when the x's compose a y. Composition is never vague, and uh, um, right, it's just it's just implausible that there should be some kind of arbitrary cutoff point. So neither of those work. Then, if you believe in composites, well, you've got to go the universalist route. So Lewis, but Patrick Toner, he says, no. On the other hand, I can uh, I can propose a, 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 a very obvious, non-arbitrary yet sharp cutoff on the composition continuum. Toner says, in my opinion, there is a sharp cutoff at the point at which an entity emerges over and above the parts, as some might say, which has non-redundant or irreducible causal powers. So one can, without any vagueness, restrict composition. 
This response to the argument gives us an ontology that includes the little things that make up the putative composition continuum, things which I shall call atoms, and macrophysical objects with non-redundant causal powers. Um, so one thing I want to say about, okay, wh what is Toner talking about when he, when he says, like, what makes a, a causal power non-redundant? And I just want to point out that this, uh, the, Toner's standard for non-redundancy of a causal power is extremely demanding. Um, and one, one gleans this from the sort of example that Toner gives of what qualifies as a non-redundant power. He says that libertarian free will is a non, an example of a non-redundant causal power. Um, because he thinks that actually beings which perform acts of free will according to a, a libertarian view of free will, that when they do that, they are doing something that atoms collaborating could never do, right? And again, um, uh, or again a, a clue as to just how demanding uh, Toner's understanding of a non-redundant power is, he says, actually, the only substances that I'm absolutely committed to are human beings. Um, because human beings, he takes it, say, unlike plants that perform nutritive activities or animals which perform sensitive activities, those activities presumably can all be explained as really tiny stuff working together. Um, libertarian free will, he thinks, is of a different, a different sort. That, that power the, and the activities um, of that power are of a different sort. They are not merely collaborations of simple particles. So um, Toner thinks also that these non-redundant powers, that they are conferred by a substance's substantial form. Um, so one of the things that I want, want to show, and that's consistent with you know, lots of, of, of different hylomorphic theories, right? it's going to be the form, the structure of the thing that's conferring powers um, on, on the whole. Now, what I want to show is that from this theory of emergent substances of toner, that it's going to follow that any composite substance Y having a substantial form F and material parts, the X's, that for any such, uh, such composite, in fact, F is not the substantial form of any of the X's. I think it falls out of Toner's view that, quite the contrary to what he intends, that although F is the substantial form of the whole, it's not going to be the substantial form of the parts of that whole. And as a result, what you end up with, what you end up with is a mere accidental unity, the parts of which are independent of the whole for their identity. So to kind of c consider this argument, so suppose that, um, that I have on the, on the sheet there, so suppose that Mary's substantial form, F, is the formal cause of each of her parts, the X's. Again, you, you need that in order for a pair, say, unity, for a substance. Now from one, for any one of Mary's parts, for any X, F confers on X all X's causal powers. I mean, if X has causal powers that, from, that are from somewhere else, then it looks like, well, F, X must have some other form besides F. If F is not, but if three, if F is not required to explain X's causal powers, then two is otios, right? I mean, we have no purpose, and if, you know, if, if we take, say, for instance, um, you take some, you know, my heart, the power of my heart to pump blood, right? If we don't think that that power is, that the source of that power is my substantial form conferring on, on my heart that power to pump blood, well then, right, um, we don't need substantial form to, to explain that particular, that particular operation of, of mine, of my heart. Right, seems, right, it's just not required. Now, according to Toner, as we've seen, that F is not required to explain X's causal powers, right? For any of my physical parts, 
for any of uh, for the, the 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 any proper parts of, of any alleged substance, um, actually f is is not what's required, right? I mean, if my heart and its operation were explained by appeal to a substantial form, then Toner wouldn't have to appeal to these non-redundant causal powers like libertarian free will to give me reason to think that, right, that, that, okay, that I'm a substance, that I exist. So therefore, two is OTOs. And therefore, parsimony demands that we reject one. Right? We actually, according to Toner, the operations of my physical parts um, they're totally explicable apart from a substantial form, from, say, Mary's substantial form, F. Um, so, as a result, we've got to end up saying that, well, the various um, physical parts of a substance, like me, they seem then to have some other form from which, that, that confers powers on them. Well, if that's the case, then uh, I am, in fact, just an ordering of substances. So, for instance, uh, on page uh, three of the handout, I have that text from uh, Aquinas in which he says that a substantial form is the perfection not only of the whole, but of every part. For since a whole is composed of parts, the form of the whole which gives being to the single parts of the body is a form which is a composition and an order, like a house's form, and such is a mere accidental form. But a soul is a substantial form, hence it is necessary that it is the form and act, not of the whole alone, but of every part. So because Toner has erected this extremely demanding um, necessary condition of substantial unity, namely these uh, non-redundant causal parts, non-redundant causal powers, um, well, it looks like um, the things that exist at, low, at the lower level, my parts and their powers, don't need to be explained by the form that confers those non-redundant causal powers, and so we end up with a composite which is a mere ordering of substance, a mere ordering of parts, and its whole is a mere the whole is a mere accidental unity. Um, I want how sorry how am I doing on time? T Ten minutes. Okay. So um, I think what I want to do um, so. The two additional uh, hylomorphous that I wanted to discuss, um, William Jaworski and Rob Coons, let me just say that I'm going to do, I would have done basically the same thing with their theories as I did with, with toners. Um, basically saying that once you establish um, this very demanding uh, mark of substantial uh, substantial unity, then, and, and saying that this non-redundant, once you say that the non-redundant causal power, that you, you really only need the substantial form to explain that, right? The substantial form, you only really need that to explain the non-redundant causal power, like in the case of human beings, libertarian free will. Um, because again, the whole thing is, is it assumes that the collaboration of the lower level stuff, the particles, that that, right, that's not enough to get you substantial being. That um, all of that stuff, we can say, well, yeah, that's, again, just the way particles behave when they're arranged thus and so. Um, it doesn't give us reason to think that beyond those particles arranged in that way, there's actually a substance. So once you make that move, then you're admitting we don't need a substantial form to explain these lower level operations. Well, if that's the case, those lower level operations are due to other lower level substantial forms, and what you've got is, is then a mere accidental unity that basically, so what I've done with toner, I was gonna show the very same schema also applies to Jaworski's hylomorphism, and also, again, in different ways, to, um, to Kuhn's hylomorphism. So, Here's where I want to, um, yeah, just maybe conclude and then leave some time open for questions by making a couple proposals. And, you know, I said at the beginning that I think that um, 
What we've got here is a case of some people rummaging around that rubble of the old cathedral, and they've fastened on this one really important bit of the rubble. With each of these uh, hylomorphous, again, I, I, um, because of time, I didn't have a chance to really bring this out, but Toner and Jaworski and Coons, they are all, um, I say, they do a lot of talking about form. Um, Toner and Jaworski fall into this category of a structural hylomorphous. They take substantial form to be a kind of structuring principle. Coons thinks that substantial form is a process, um, is what he says. They do a lot of talking about form. They don't say a whole lot about matter. And in particular, what I think they need is prime matter, right? If they could fasten those two complementary bits of the once beautiful Gothic cathedral together, then they would really have something. Because what I've, what, what it, the, the conception of matter in these three hylomorphous, these three staunch hylomorphous, right? They're on the side of the angels in as much as they all believe in per se, right? Intrinsic unified composites. But they all conceive of matter, right? Insofar as they talk about it at all, they talk about it as simple particles. If we conceive of matter as pure potentiality, and we ask the same question that I asked at the beginning of my talk, what's the relationship between the powers of the whole substance and the powers of the parts? Well, we find that none of the part, none of the powers, the lower level powers, again, this is if we're, if we're committed to prime matter, None of the lower level powers are explicable apart from the substantial form, the, the form of the whole. Because all of those parts, even down to the tiniest parts, are themselves effects of substantial form actualizing prime matter. So in one sense, the causal powers of a substance they are prior to the powers of the parts in as much as take right the soul of Fido. Fido's substantial form causes by informing prime matter, not little bits of electrons and muons and gluons, but by informing prime matter, Fido's substantial form um, causes Fido, for instance, to be able to nourish himself. So, indeed, the causal powers of the whole are prior in that sense. But Fido's nutritive power, as it exists in Fido, in the composite whole, which is Fido, it actually is the collaboration of some of Fido's parts to digest food, to nourish himself. So, we can say that, in a sense, Fido's power, right, to nourish himself, as it exists in his substantial form, is prior, but as it exists in Fido, it's posterior to the powers of Fido's smaller bits. But that doesn't mean that last part, that Fido's power, say, to nourish himself, is posterior, that it is um, upwardly determined by his lower level powers, that doesn't mean that Fido's bits, that his smaller parts, are substances. Because again, those bits, even the tiniest ones, don't have any actuality at all apart from Fido's substantial form. That's, at least, if we include in our hylomorphism prime matter, rather than saying that the matter of the substance is just like a lot of really, really tiny stuff, which is, seems to be, in fact it is, not seems, but is what these staunch hylomorphous Toner, Coons, Jaworski, are all assuming. Um, so what I think we can do, um, actually, what I think we can do is actually kind of introduce a restricted version of this already restricted Eleatic principle. We can say that a composite Y is a per se unity of some, of, of some X's at T only if the X's 
at some myriological level, we can maybe get into that in the question time, have powers at T different from those they had just before T. Yeah, sorry, as a, because of a limit of time, I, I can't explain um, why I've restricted that um, uh, Eleatic principle yet again, but um, maybe that'll come out in the question time. Thanks very much for your attention. Thank you for your very Aristotelian talk, I would say. And <coughs> any questions? Uh, Dan Heider. So thank you very much, John, for your uh, clear uh, presentation. I have two questions. Uh, first, regarding the powers, you were uh, repeating, uh, you repeated the, uh, the recurrent, the, the, the notions of powers. So I'm curious about um, these authors' views of the powers, because in tradition, powers are not identified with the, with the form, with the hylomorphic principles. For Aquinas, Suarez, and many others, they are really distinct, distinct as qualities, necessary accidents, even caused by the soul, you know, in case of Suarez, or emanating from the soul in case of Aquinas. So this is this is the first uh, question. And the second one is related to this, you know, more nuanced um, scholastic background. So uh, all these authors, I'm not familiar with them. Do they follow, you know, uh, these Thomistic traditions, or some of them are also inclined to the Scotistic traditions, which is very much determined by the notions of form, of corporate, you know, this corporeal form, which is quite important in the context you, you just outlined. Thank you, Daniel. Um, so I think that the hylomorphists that I've discussed, um, I don't think that they f see themselves very much in the scotistic tradition. I think that um, Toner very clearly identifies as a, as a Thomist. Um, in fact, I think that Toner, I mean, I've criticized them for not um, including prime matter. I suspect Toner believes in prime matter. I think he probably just, at least in the papers that I know of his, hasn't thought through what that commitment can do for him. Um, so Jaworski, again, who I didn't get into, Jaworski doesn't really claim, I mean, he, he you know, what he does say is he says, I think my theory is Aristotle's as Aristotle has been exegeted by Montgomery Firth. Um, so, so Jaworski's not exactly trying to be Aristotelian, although his view definitely has that flavor, and he's, I don't think, trying to be a Thomist. Jaworski is a, is a trope theorist, right? He thinks, and you asked about powers, right? So he thinks that, um, and he, he doesn't, and part of what I critique him on, or I would have critiqued him on, he doesn't actually have substantial form. He has this thing, um, this abstract particular that does some of the work that is traditionally attributed to a substantial form. He thinks that uh, um, a structure is a power in virtue of which a substance, an individual substance, um, configures itself. Um, so he uses this example of like a fountain, say in a park, that's constantly like spewing out water, right? Well, it's got a motor that does that, right? So that it's always kind of renewing, bringing in new stuff, throwing out the old stuff, sustaining itself. He thinks structure is, is something like that, a power whereby the thing um, configures its material parts. And you can probably already see, I'm going to say, well, clearly then those material parts that are being configured, they don't depend on, on that structure uh, for, their, for their identity. Um, so although, Jaworski, you claim to ascribe to a substance attribute ontology, in fact, you don't have a real substance. You've got an ordering of things. So that's kind of what he has to say about powers. Um, yeah, I probably haven't answered. Uh, it was, yeah, sorry, there were two questions, and I think I'm sort of jumbling them now in my head. Yeah, thank you. OK, thank you. Uh, Professor Blum? <clears throat> Um, we, um, uh, I, I, I totally agree with your, at least with the direction of where you're, where you're going, um, because I think it is, uh, there seems to be a, an illegitimate confusion of modern physics with uh, uh, traditional, say, Aristotelian uh, terminology and uh, modes mod of thought, and they have simply different areas of validity and applicability. Um, but I have... Um, 
In addition to that, I have another question, and that is, we are talking about substances, we are talking about accidents, we are talking about comp composites, and, and so on, but how about actions? Shouldn't we focus much more, that is, on, on the, for instance, on, on the effect of getting your heart beating, yeah, or, or the, uh, the, the dog eating his food? Uh, isn't, sh shouldn't we mo focus more on the actions and the directionality of actions and the or origin of actions and the, um, say the, the continu continuum of the performance uh, rather than of the components that are doing these things? Thank you. Um, so I think that, yeah, I mean, perhaps, perhaps you're correct. Uh, I mean, I think that the two approaches, the first thing that, that dawns on me to, to say in response is that I think that the approaches are entirely compatible. And I'm thinking of, um, you know, for instance, uh, what Aquinas says, I know he says it in um, Summa Contra Gentiles uh, 2.7, um, but probably all over the place too, that um, a thing acts as it is in act. Um, so well, as a thing is in act, well, I'm in act. Um, you know, I have being, everything that exists exists as, as a particular kind of thing. And a thing in virtue of the kind of thing it is has certain powers. And from those powers issue these actions. A thing acts as it is in act. So, um, yeah, I suppose what, you know, kind of the emphasis that you're um, urging with respect to kind of the right, the, the exercise of these powers and the emphasis that I've placed in the talk and these other hylomorphists are placing on, on sort of powers, it seems to me that they're, yeah, that they're very compatible. Um, this would be the first thing I would say. Yeah, thank you. Dominic has had his hand up, I think. Um, or, but maybe we don't have time, sorry, I'm not, sorry. Don't interfere in the office of another. Sorry, I, yeah, sorry, I shouldn't have interfered. Um, yeah, I wanted to, or, um, yeah, so when Toner says, you know, um, things that I shall call atoms and macrophysical objects, those are the things that he thinks exist. So at least one way to read that is he thinks that atoms are substances and macrophysical objects are substances. He thinks so, atoms, yeah, I mean, if you've got like, a simple particle, whatever, flying around, that would be a substance, I think. Um, and he thinks that, yeah, there are some macrophysical objects, the ones that have these, that arrangements that have non-redundant causal powers. Right, and, and then if he's a pluriformist, you would just deny two in your argument against him, uh, that two won't follow yeah. from one. Yeah, um, right, so, I see that. Yes, yeah, so that would be, an interesting, so I mean, he may not want to go that way if you say he's more Thomist inspired, but. He uh, definitely, in fact, at the very beginning of this one paper, he references the uh, uh, controversy about the unicity of, of substantial form. In the, the paper called Emergent Substance, he references this controversy and yeah, he, he says, um, well, he, he sides very decidedly on the Thomist, Thomist side, yeah. Okay. Cool, thanks. Do you like Lima? Sorry? Uh, Jula, Klima. Ah, uh, yes. Ah, Jula, yeah. sorry, yeah. I, I, I forget <laughs> you right there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, if, if you are not entirely out of time yet, um, this is just, actually just a brief comment, not really a question. Uh, I just want to say that um, your conclusion um, really hits the spot. I mean, that is the heart of the matter, that um, a substantial form um, um, in the proper Thomistic sense is something that is the form of all of the parts. And, at, uh, and as a consequence, the um, powers and actions of the whole are not in any way uh, uh, the uh, derivative of the actions of the parts. On the contrary, um, um, the parts' uh, actions are to be regarded as instrumental in um, realizing the actions of the whole. 
And I have um, um, something to, um, um, uh, well, a recent paper that um, uh, in, uh, goes to precisely the same conclusion um, based on this particular passage, especially that um, I want to call everybody's attention to uh, from Aquinas. It's, uh, um, may I put it up maybe um, on the screen? I hope you can see it. So this um, um, tota forma substantialis ligni est in qualibet parte eius, quia totalitas formi substantialis non recipit quantitatis totalitatem, sicur est de totalitare formarum accidentalium quae fundantur in quantitate et presupponunt ipsum. So all these um, um, spatial uh, temporal structures that uh, contemporary thinkers um, are taking to be um, explanatory of the uh, actions of the whole. Um, uh, take um, uh, the uh, order of explanation um, just uh, upside down. This is my point there. Um, and uh, well, this is just in total agreement with what you uh, have been saying. I really don't want to waste uh, too much time on this. That's a great point. Thank point you, Jula. I'm, I'm happy. No, happy that we're alike in this, that we're of one mind in this respect. Great. <laughs> Absolutely. So um, um, uh, let's exchange papers, OK? That would be brilliant. Thank you. Uh, that would be brilliant. Let's continue the discussion uh, afterwards. But I don't want to waste time on uh, this here now. OK, thank you very much. All right, thank you. It was great day. And, uh, uh, we are running half an hour late, but uh, I think it's worth it. Uh, I, I hope you enjoy the discussion. So, uh, our next speaker is uh, Jeff Brower, and he will talk online. Uh, great. So, uh, the floor is yours. Hi there. Okay. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yes. Excellent. Greetings from West Lafayette, Indiana. I'm very sorry not to be there with you in person. I'm also sorry that the difference in time has prevented me from um, attending all the sessions, including the two sessions before John's, which are of great interest to me, but uh, I'll be contacting some of you individually to get what I missed. I'm gonna try to share my screen with you. Whoops, let's see here. Uh, see if I can get this to work. Okay, looks like you can see it. All right. For some reason, I can't see that. Whoops, looks like I dropped it. Um, I can't see you saying whether you can see it, <laughs> but I hope you can. You cannot see it? How about now? Okay, I'm gonna try again here. How's that? Can you see this now? Excellent. Okay, as, as the title suggests, I wanna to talk to you about Aquinas on locomotion. And to get us started, let's consider a bird flying through the air or an apple falling from a tree or a ball rolling across the room. These are all paradigm examples of what Aquinas calls locomotion, which basically is a type of change that occurs just in case something exists in different locations at different times. This is a very important type of change for Aquinas. Arguably, it's the most important type of change for his physics. Uh, Aquinas describes it as the most general type of change. It's the only type of change that applies to absolutely all bodies, and it's also a type of change that, in the case of certain bodies, it's the only type they can undergo. As we'll see later, Aquinas also describes it as the most perfect type of bodily change. 
given its importance for Aquinas' thought, and physics in particular, it's surprising that almost nothing has been said in the secondary literature, at least that I've found, about this type of change. That also turns out to be unfortunate, I think, because this type of change seems to raise a problem. In particular, it's hard to square what Aquinas says about locomotion with what he says about change in general. Indeed, in the context of discussing both change and locomotion, Aquinas appears to commit himself to two incompatible theses. The first thesis here, what I'm calling T1, represents what we might think of as the standard understanding of his account of change in general. This is basically a hylomorphic analysis of change. All change can be analyzed in terms of the reception of form by matter. And this is certainly a general analysis suggested by Aquinas' work, and in particular his talk of matter and form as principles of change. But in the context of his discussions of locomotion, I think it becomes clear that he also commits himself to T2, which is effectually the denial of T1 for a certain type of change. Namely, locomotion is a type of change that can't be analyzed in terms of the reception of form by matter. So what I want to talk about is what to do in the face of this problem, and I want to suggest that the proper solution is to reject that first thesis, uh, at least as it's put there, and so revise our understanding, the standard understanding of this account of change in general. Despite the fact that Aquinas often speaks as if matter and form were principles of change as such, I think they must in fact be understood as principles only of certain types of change. So what I want to do is address the problem, what I'm calling the problem of locomotion in three stages. I'll first summarize what I take to be elements of Aquinas' views about change in general that seem to support this hylomorphic thesis about change in general. Then I want to briefly examine the extent to which Aquinas' views about locomotion can be said to conform to the elements of what appear to be his theory of change in general. And then finally, I'll draw out the consequences for what I take to be the correct understanding of his views about both. Okay, so beginning with change in general. Um, I mentioned above that locomotion is a type of change that occurs roughly when something exists in different locations at different times. We can think of change, I think, usefully to begin as something that occurs when we've got something existing in different states, not necessarily different locative states or locations, but some sort of existing in different ways at different times. Uh, and here, too, it would be useful to focus on a couple paradigmatic examples. Aquinas, like Aristotle, when he's presenting his views about change in general, typically focuses on examples involving alteration or qualitative change. Uh, in De Principiis, he focuses on a change of shape, uh, in particular some bronze going from being lub-shaped to statue-shaped as a result of the activity of some artisan. In his physics, he often focuses on change of temperature, in particular some water going from being cold to hot as a result of being placed over a fire. Uh, and then he draws out the implications for his theory of change from these sorts of examples. And as I've stated them here, um, they're closely, his views about change are closely connected to his views about efficient causation. What I want to do is briefly set out what I take to be the main elements of Aquinas's views about change. And I'll divide these elements into two groups of theses. Um, the first group is designed to tell us, um, it consists of three theses, and it tells us something about how he's thinking about um, the nature of his change and its connection to efficient causation. So what I want to do is just briefly look at what I've got here as these three theses. The first thesis connects, is designed to bring out the connection Aquinas sees between change and coming to be. When Aquinas talks about change, um, he almost always describes it in terms of a type of coming to be, in particular subjects coming to be in a different state than it previously existed in. And my use of state here isn't meant to be anything technical. Uh, just a, it, It's my translation of Aquinas' talk of something holding itself differently than it did before, say habir, say habera, aliter. Um, Aquinas thinks that every change must involve a subject that comes to be, and in particular comes to be in a new state. 
Uh, I talk about a pre-existing subject to distinguish it from creation because creation involves a type of coming to be, but it doesn't involve a pre-existing subject coming to be in some new state. Okay, so just as Aquinas thinks that um, change consists in a type of coming to be, so too he thinks that coming to be uh, consists in the actualization of potentiality. For something to come to be in a new state, it must be in potentiality to be in that state. In fact, Aquinas thinks anything that can be changed must be in potentiality in some respect, and the change itself consists in the actualization of that potentiality. The final thesis or element that I want to mention in this first group has to do with the connection um, of change to efficient causation. The idea here is that a pre-existing subject can't actualize a potentiality for being in some state without some efficient cause acting on it. And in that text E there, you can see him illustrating that with respect to the bronze. Bronze doesn't make itself statue-shaped or into a statue. You need an agent to do that. Okay, so this is the first group of elements, which as I say, is designed to bring out the connection between change coming to be in the actualization of potentiality. Notice, however, that there's nothing in this group of elements that says anything about Aquinas's hylomorphism. That's what the second group uh, of elements, the last two theses, is intended to bring out. So this first element um, connects what Aquinas says about actualization of potentiality to the reception of form. Um, Aquinas thinks there's a very close connection between a subject in potentiality and matter. In fact, as he says in that text F, anything that's a being in potentiality can call, be called matter. So too, um, that through which the potentiality of matter is actualized just is a form. So this element tells us a pre for a pre-existing subject to actualize a potentiality for being in a new state just is for it to receive a new form. Uh, and I've given you a couple texts there that suggest that. Uh, but if actualization of potentiality consists in the reception of forms, then we would just expect um, the, the agent's actualization of this potentiality to involve its production of, a, of the form received. And that's what this fifth element tells us. And I've just given you one text here where Aquinas suggests that this is the case. So it's really these second the second group of elements that with, when they're combined with the first, whoops, gives us that first Thomistic thesis. Or suggests that first Thomistic thesis that all change admits of hylomorphic analysis. Okay, so much for change in general. Now let's turn to Aquinas' views about locomotion in particular. I started off describing locomotion as a specific type of change, but I want to say a bit more about how to locate it within Aquinas' classification of changes in general. Uh, as I'm sure you're aware, Aquinas thinks there can be changes in each of the 10 Aristotelian categories, and hence that there are 10 general types, one substantial and nine accidental. Locomotion is obviously a type of accidental change. Aquinas thinks that um, the categorical changes can also be further subdivided. In fact, he thinks they can ultimately be explained in terms of just four fundamental or what he calls per se types of change. There's generation and corruption, alteration, augmentation, and locomotion. So changes uh, with respect to the category of substance and then three per se types of accidental change, qualitative, quantitative, and locative. And so as this makes clear, uh, locomotion is not merely a, a type of accidental change, but one of three per se types of accidental change and one of four per se types of change overall. Okay, with just this information in mind, I think it's fairly easy to see how Aquinas' views about locomotion can be said to conform to the first group of elements of his theory of change. In fact, I think it's natural to just think of his views about locomotion specifying those first three elements. So just as change in general requires something to exist in different states at different times, locomotion would seem to require something to exist in different locations at different times. 
uh, different locative states, states of being somewhere. Um, but it also seems clear that if something's going to exist in a new location, it must have a potentiality for existing in that location. And here, too, here again, we're going to need an efficient cause, say, someone to kick the ball that rolls across the room. So as I say, it's not hard to see how Aquinas' views about locomotion conform to his general theory of change, at least when it comes to the first group of elements. We can just think of it as a specification of them. Things are much more difficult, however, when it comes to the second set of elements. Um, here, it's much harder to see how to think of locomotion um, in terms of reception of form. It's not impossible, but it's a bit more difficult. Um, what I want to suggest is that, in fact, when it comes to these elements, Aquinas rejects both of them. I want to say he commits himself to what I'm calling four star and five star. And I've put those little L's there to indicate its relationship um, to locomotion. So for a pre-existing subject to actualize a potentiality for being in a location in a new location is not for it to receive a new form. And for the same reason, a pre-existing subject can actualize a potentiality for being in a new state without any efficient cost producing a form in it. If I'm right about Aquinas' commitment to these two theses, then we really do get that second Thomistic thesis that locomotion does not admit of hylomorphic analysis. The question, of course, is should we think Aquinas holds those theses, and in particular, the second Thomistic thesis, or rather, why should we think that? Uh, I want to suggest um, it's clear that he does. This has to do with his views about angelic causation, and I'll summarize his views here in the form of an argument. Angels can produce changes in bodies, Aquinas thinks, but angels can't directly produce any changes in bodies that involve the reception of forms. And then I want to suggest Aquinas infers um, from these two premises that the only type of changes that angels can directly produce in bodies are locomotions. And what I'll do briefly now is look at the premises, the two premises of this argument. Um, but I want to call attention to the fact that in order for that inference from one and two to three to be valid, we need to presuppose something like T2. That is the thesis that locomotion does not admit of hylomorphic analysis. And in fact, we'll see that when Aquinas defends these two premises, uh, he at one point explicitly affirms this thesis. Okay, so let's briefly look at, uh, oh, there's that second Thomistic thesis in case we forgot. Let's briefly look at the premises of this argument. So angels can produce changes in bodies. Um, Aquinas says as much in various places. Here's a snippet of a text from Summa Theologia. Angels and demon act on visible things. I've just given you a part of the quotation here because I'll return to this text. Uh, again, telling us why angels have to be capable of acting on visible things because their nature is higher than that of corporeal things. Um, and Aquinas also insists that he's on good grounds holding one or in good company holding one. In fact, he says that angels rule over bodies is accepted not only by the holy doctors, but all, by all those philosophers who have posited in corporeal substance. Okay, so Aquinas, I think, clearly commits himself the first premise, how about the second? Angels can't produce any changes in bodies that involve the reception of forms. Uh, let me first return to that text I mentioned a moment ago from Summa Theologiae. Angels and demons act on visible things and supply what was missing there, not by producing forms in them, but by making use of corporeal seeds. This reference to corporeal seeds is initially a bit puzzling, but a bit later, Aquinas fills it out, uh, telling us this, this way of talking goes back to Augustine's De Trinitate, where he says that angels make use of corporeal seeds to produce effects in bodies. But Aquinas says that it wouldn't be possible apart from moving them with respect to place. Therefore, bodies are subject to the angels with respect to locomotion. Uh, this talk of corporeal seeds might suggest that angels don't directly act on bodies uh, when they produce locomotions in them, but do so indirectly. In fact, I think that's misleading. Uh, I think Aquinas is using this talk of corporeal seeds just to connect his views uh, to Augustine's, but we'll see shortly business about direct versus indirect um, 
efficient causation. But let me look at one more text that supports this second premise that angels can't produce any changes in bodies that involve the reception of forms. Uh, and here I return to that, another text we looked at. Since spiritual nature is higher than corporeal nature, corporeal nature must be subject to it. But here he says again, but not with regard to the reception of forms. In fact, here we're told, on the contrary, with regard to locomotion, which does not posit any form in the thing moved, a body is subject to a spiritual power. So here we see him explicitly asserting something like T2. Locomotion does not posit any form in the thing moved. Uh, and then here's a kind of summary which actually brings out the directness summarizing um, his discussion of angelic causation in uh, question 110 of Prima Pars, he says, so then every instance of matters receiving a form comes directly either from God or from some corporeal agent, and it does not come directly from an angel. Now, Aquinas does allow that angels can indirectly produce changes in bodies that involve the reception of forms by first causing the locomotion. Uh, he says, um, by applying corporeal agents to the production of their own effects, just as a blacksmith uses fire to soften iron. I take it the idea is if an angel wanted to heat up a cup of water, it would just move it close to the fire, um, sort of in the way a blacksmith uses fire to soften iron. Okay, so I think it's clear that Aquinas accepts those two premises, that he draws the inference in question, and in fact asserts T2 along the way. All right. What this does is really bring us back to these two Thomistic theses that we started with. And it, in a way, raises again the question, how are we to understand um, Aquinas' apparent commitment to these two theses? Uh, or how are, we, how are we to reconcile his apparent commitment? Well, there's one further text that I want to, to mention to you. It's a text uh, in which Aquinas is again explaining why angels are capable of acting on bodies directly. But here he introduces something that we haven't seen up to now. So in this text, he says, now corporeal nature is lower than spiritual nature, and as proved in Physics 8, locomotion is the most perfect of all corporeal change. The reason for this, that what makes um, locomotion so perfect, he says, is that something can change its, is that something that can change its place is not as such in potentiality with respect to anything intrinsic, but is in potentiality only with respect to something extrinsic, namely a place. And it's for this reason, he says, that corporeal nature is capable of being moved directly by a spiritual nature with respect to place. So angels are able to produce locomotions and only locomotions precisely because they don't involve uh, any sort of intrinsic change. What's interesting about this text, I think, is it introduces a complication in our earlier classification of change. In fact, in this text, Aquinas is suggesting that locomotion can be distinguished from all other types of change in virtue of the fact that it's the only per se type of change that's extrinsic. So if we go back to our four per se types, we see that they can be divided not only into substantial and accidental, but also into intrinsic and extrinsic. And it's this last division that seems to suggest uh, what distinguishes locomotion. If that's right, I want to suggest, then if we come back to the two Thomistic theses, uh, I think it makes sense to, to understand Aquinas's apparent general claims about change in hylomorphism as tacitly restricted to intrinsic changes. If that's right, T1 is really saying that all intrinsic change admits hylomorphic analysis, whereas locomotion does not because it's a type of extrinsic change. If that's right, then I think what follows is those um, two groups of elements of Aquinas' theory of change aren't really both about change in general. The first set of elements is it connects change with coming to be an actualization of potentiality. Those are things that are required for the understanding of change in general and hence for any particular type of change, including locomotion. By contrast, though, the second set of elements isn't really about change in general, but different types of change. And so the second um, two theses, four and five, really apply to intrinsic change as opposed to 
extrinsic extrinsic change. If that's right, then I think we do in the end have a way of making sense is about change and locomotion, but it does require us to revise uh, what I call the standard understanding of his views about change in general. Okay, thank you very much. Cool. Uh, thank you, uh, Jeff, uh, for quite a mind-boggling talk, uh, at least to me, and uh, uh, there are questions. Okay, so Daniel Haider. So Jeff, hi, thank you very much. I have one question about one premise in Aquinas, regarding why cannot angels and demons uh, create, produce in a finite intellect, say for instance, these, these forms, you know? So why, why couldn't they, for instance, you know, insert, you know, intelligible species in my, in my intellect? Or why they cannot, you know, in dreams, you know, uh, just insert a kind of phantasma? And, and I'm not talking about producing vital acts, you know, these operations, you know, but at least these non-vital items, such as species. So what's, what would uh, Aquinas say about this? How, how would he argue for this, uh, this impossibility? Yeah, thank you, Daniel. Very nice to see you. Um, so one thing to notice is that the thesis is restricted to changes that angels can bring about in bodies. Um, so perhaps there's a difference when it comes to changes they can bring about in in souls, say, which I think is the kind of change you were talking about. Um, but I do think it is puzzling. If what I've said about the problem of locomotion is correct, uh, we do seem to get a bit of a problem for angelic causation, or at least a standard understanding of it. It seems like angels do all kinds of things, like produce sickness and health and things. And um, But maybe Aquinas is going to have to say they all do this indirectly. But you were asking, what, what is it, I take it that behind your question is, what is it that's motivating Aquinas to deny that angels can produce changes involving the reception of forms? I didn't have time to discuss the text in which Aquinas develops his argument, but it's basically a certain kind of likeness principle. Aquinas suggests that if angels were to produce changes involving the reception of forms, they would in effect be producing compounds. Um, but effects must be like their causes. Angels are simple, uh, and so they can't produce complex effects. And so what's interesting is in Aquinas' discussion, his main, his main worry is, well, isn't this going to rule out the possibility of God producing directly changes involving reception of forms? And he spends a long time <laughs> arguing that, no, that's okay, since he he created them in the first place. They're under his power. But there's definitely more to be said here about that. Uh, whoever? Okay. Hi, Jeff. Thanks for <clears throat> a really great and surprising talk. Um, I'm interested in the efficient cause question. So I... I I think on your slides, as you listed it, you said that uh, locomotion does not require an efficient cause to, to, to bring about a form in the subject or something like that, but it still does require an efficient cause to bring you to the new place, right? So is the, the only difference there is, is what the efficient cause is doing, is that right? Or, or yes. yeah, what's going on with the efficient causality thesis? Yeah, I think... One of the things that emerges from this discussion is that there's two types of potentiality, potentiality for being in an intrinsic state, potentiality for being in an extrinsic state. There's two types of actualization corresponding to the actualization of these two types of potentiality, and hence there's two types of efficient causation. That, I mean, so I think what efficient causes do is, in Aquinas' language, reduce the potentiality to act. It's just that that reduction in some cases involves the production of form. In other cases, it just involves the production of the subjects being in a new state. So um, when, an, you know, when uh, an agent produces a new shape in something, it produces a new form in it, a new qualitative form. But when it produces a new location, in it, it's not producing any form in it, it's just producing its being in a state 
of being in a new location. <laughs> Hey, Jeff, thanks a bunch for a really great talk. Um, I want to ask a sufficiency question. So given, given the four kinds of change that Aquinas, I mean, following Aristotle, recognizes, and let's suppose you're right that the, we should make this extrinsic, intrinsic divide where extrinsic, extrinsic changes don't require a reception of form. Um, why doesn't that open the, up the possibility for there to be a whole bunch of other kinds of ch extrinsic changes, namely extrinsic changes in each of the other categories? So I think it does imply that, at least with respect to the last six categories, those are all extrinsic changes. It's just that he thinks that, um, with the exception of locomotion, all those other types of extrinsic change are para occidens, and so they're going to follow on some other type of change. So uh, I wish I had been there for David Zobida's talk, um, but Aquinas makes clear in the case of relations, um, I think I actually have a text, I think I can't um, share it nicely, but here's a brief little quotation from um, his commentary in Physics Book 5, Lecture 3, Note 666. <laughs> there's, no, there's no per se change in the category of relation, but only changes per occidens. For a new relation always follows on a change of some other type. For example, a change of quality in the case of equality or inequality, and a change of, uh, sorry, a change of quantity in the case of equality or inequality, and a change of quality in the case of similarity or dissimilarity. Um, Actually, relations is not one of those last six categories. And because that kind of relation follows on a change of an intrinsic one, Aquinas thinks its classification as intrinsic or extrinsic is kind of complicated. Mm -hmm. But I didn't mean to say that um, locomotion is the only type of extrinsic change. It's the only type of per se extrinsic change. That's a good answer. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> So I have a question. It is clear to me what changes in the intrinsic change, substance. What exactly changes if the change is extrinsic? What is the subject of the change? Maybe I didn't catch uh, your answer. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your question. Um, so the subject of an extrinsic change like locomotion would say be the body that moves. So in the ball, that rolls across the room, the subject of change would be the ball. And the change would consist in its being at different locations at different times. But the ball hasn't a new accident, so the ball didn't well, change. It does, have a new, it does have a new location. Uh, it is somewhere it wasn't previously, and that is a kind of accidental mode of being, Aquinas would say. Um, but it's not an accident if you mean a new form. But there is, it does stand in a different relation, if you like, to place. It's now in a, it's now in a new place, a place it wasn't before. Okay, Professor Bloom. Yeah. Hello, Jeff. Uh, good to see you again. Um, it's always good to have a, a real Aquinas specialist uh, present. Um, so um, I, I have uh, two questions that have to do with contact and uh, context, and maybe um, you can just hint and where, uh, to where it would be going. Uh, the one thing in the Trinitate, uh, there is this uh, quote where. Um, it is said angels have uh, access to corporeal seeds. I would like to know what that means. And the other thing is in, I don't know the uh, Summa by heart, so I don't remember 110 uh, what it is about, but the context of why he speaks about angels uh, would be interesting for me. So why angels in, in this context? So, yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the kind remarks, and uh, nice to see at least parts of you. I see your, your arm. <laughs> um, hi there. Um, yeah, so corporeal seeds, um, 
I think Aquinas is just thinking this as a way of talking about locomotion as the way in which um, angels are able to bring about other changes. So I don't have the sense that at least in the context of discussing locomotion uh, or angelic causation proceeding by corporeal seats that Aquinas has anything very substantive in mind by it. Um, in the case of 110, um, Aquinas is just talking about the way in which angels rule over bodies or the kind of, it's, it's part of a discussion of providence and the way angels are involved in the governance of the world. And it's in this context that he's wondering how do they govern the world? They must do so by exercising some efficient causality, by exercising you know, some sort of power over bodies. But how can they do this since they can't produce any compounds or changes involving reception of forms? And the solution turns out to be, ah, they do it all via locomotion. If I remember right, there's also some discussion of this in De Malo, but I didn't have a chance to go back and look at that. Michael? Hey, Jeff. Hey. Um, I'm wondering if um, th this po po point um, of Aquinas' of treating change in this special way isn't a first step towards the uh, getting rid of place as a distinct category and just sort of reducing it to relation or something like that. Not a step that Aquinas himself takes. Um, I would say that it is a first step towards something, uh, something radical, but maybe not something quite that radical. I do think Aquinas is committed to the existence of place, but I think the category um, of ubi is really the category of where, which is a kind of relation to a place. So something exists somewhere just in case it's in contact with a place. Uh, and so I guess what I do think it, it is a first step towards is not eliminating place, but eliminating um, a form for a certain type of relation to a place. There's also this puzzle. I, I mean, it's hard not to use the talk of relations, um, but relations is a category. The last six categories are also relative categories, but they're not strictly relations. Uh, and that's, I think, because relations, as Aquinas is thinking of them, always follow on intrinsic attributes. So you get the intrinsic attributes in place and things will be related um, in the strict sense of related. So, you know, you get two things possessing um, qualities of the same species and they'll be similar. Um, but in the last six categories, you need something more than just the subjects and their intrinsic features to get the relationship to hold. So I like, I mean, this is jumping ahead, but SCOTUS has this nice division between the intrinsically advening relations, which is the category of relations, and the extrinsic, extrinsically advening relations, which have to do with the last six. Something like that, I think, is also what Aquinas has in mind. David okay. Svoboda uh, mm -hmm. has a question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, hi, Jeff. Hi, David. Uh, thank you very much for a very instructive paper. If I remember correctly, Aquinas says that motion, motio, is not being, and it is a path to being. And I'm wondering if you see there is a connection between this statement and his conception of uh, uh, movement as a not acquiring uh, a new form. So, um, yeah, I was talking about locomotion and then um, you want to talk about motion in general. I guess he also describes motion as an imperfect actuality. So, um, yeah, I guess I think motion is tricky. <laughs> I'm not exactly sure um, how to think about that in all cases. Maybe that's the best thing to say. <laughs> but it's definitely a provocative suggestion <laughs> that deserves more thought. Okay. By the way, I would like to see your paper at some point. Um, that sounded very interesting. Thank you. Okay. And there should be uh, one more online question. You are, Mima? Uh, we cannot hear you. No.
now you should hear me. Yes. 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 Okay. Hi, Jeff. Thanks very much. Thank a great talk. Um, I'm not that surprised, really, <laughs> by the um, uh, conclusion that uh, locomotion is not the acquisition of a form. Um, uh, after all, um, I never thought Aquinas would uh, go as far uh, in his ontology as some scotists did, saying that there is a, um, a separate ubitas that needs to be <laughs> in locomotion, right? So um, uh, that is uh, uh, quite clear that there is uh, not an ordinary acquisition of form as um, in the case of alteration or augmentation, fine. But um, does this make uh, that, um, uh, the, um, that locomotion um, is uh, the acquisition of some extrinsic um, uh, uh, namely, a new place. Does this mean that um, it is um, uh, pretty much like um, a relational change um, when um, uh, I undergo an apparent change on account of uh, someone else changing? It is my son outgrows me, etc. Um, uh, consider the uh, scenario in which uh, you are uh, in a slow-moving um, space station and uh, you are uh, just pushing uh, yourself against uh, one of the walls. So the uh, space station changes its uh, location relative to the Earth, and you don't. How would that be a uh, change? And uh, um, what is acquired and what is lost? Um, and why is this a real change at all in the first place? Shouldn't a real change, even if it is not realized in the acquisition of form, um, shouldn't it be realized in something that changes a state of energy, the state of actuality you are in, which is why it requires an efficient cause that provides the energy for uh, the new state uh, to be acquired through the change? Okay, uh, these are the questions um, that are a bunch, and I'm sure you cannot answer them all. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, I would really love to see how then you would uh, account for what that uh, locomotional change is. How is that a real change? How is that um, uh, not a mere um, uh, denominational change in terms of uh, 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 changing relations to a frame of reference. How does physical change uh, differ from a purely geometrical change? Yeah, these are great questions, and it's great to see you again, Jula. It's been way too long. Um, Indeed. <laughs> so, so yeah, Jula is right. I can't answer all these questions, um, but I do think they're the questions to take up Next, uh, I do think the most interesting thing about this is what is what exactly is the metaphysics of these kinds of changes? The first thought I would have, though, would be we have to be careful about connecting um, so-called Cambridge changes with non-real changes. So Aquinas does allow that you can change your qualitative relations or your quantitative relations, which are real relations, solely in virtue of an intrinsic change on the part of something else. So I can come to be shorter than someone just because they grow taller. But even though that's a kind of Cambridge change, uh, I am really related to that person as shorter. That's different than a case where I come to be thought about by somebody. Um, that person is really related to me, but not vice versa. And I think there's an interesting question. Well, what's going on there? How can we have a real relation in one case, but not the other, um, I would want to say that locomotion is more like the first case than the second. But um, yeah, I don't know exactly um, what all to say there. <laughs> Thank you. Well, uh, I really look forward to the final version of this paper in which you answer all these questions. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks very much, Jeff. Okay, thank you, Joao, and thank you, uh, <coughs> Jeff. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so now uh, let's uh, 
uh, break for lunch and uh, we have two possibilities. Uh, first possibility is to go to some regular uh, restaurant. Unfortunately, uh, Masaryková Kole is, is closed today because it's a national holiday today. So uh, we would have to find s some other uh, place. Uh, but <clears throat> I, I think, uh, I, I, unfortunately, I, I don't know uh, this area so well, but uh, there are some experts, for example, Prokop Sousedík or uh, Jakob Schmutz, uh, is better worse than Prague restaurants than me. And there's another possibility. Uh, the re yesterday's uh, uh, reception was so opulent that there is much left over and it's prepared for those who would like to use this possibility in the room ne ne next room, P3. So uh, you can just stay here and uh, have some uh, little uh, refreshment there. Okay, and I think we can meet here again in time that means at half past four. Uh, half, uh, sorry, half, half, half past two, sorry. Just, just. It, it's, it's 14 in Czech, uh, so, so, so I'm sorry. So, uh, okay.
Ladies and gentlemen, uh, let me start our afternoon session. Uh, let's keep our time for the discussions. So, our next speaker will be Gregory Stacy, who will deliver a talk on divine mental states made simple, late, late scholastic and analytic accounts. And he'll be, he will talk online. So, welcome. The floor is yours. Hello, thank you. Uh, thank you on a slight delay from sunny Leeds, where it's not so sunny. Um, really nice to be um, at this conference. Uh, also quite intimidating, uh, simply because uh, I listened to a lot of papers yesterday, um, and they were all very inspiring um, um, and just very, very detailed, uh, solid pieces of, of scholarship. I think lots of people at this conference know far more than I do about second scholasticism, uh, what I might I'll call generally in this paper late scholastic philosophy. Um, I just wanted to, to really quickly before I begin um, mention sort of um, my own reasons for engaging with this sort of philosophy because uh, that was sort of a part of the discussion yesterday, uh, yesterday evening. My background is in um, what we might now call analytic theology uh, or relatively analytic philosophy of religion. So I'm coming to uh, late scholastic texts often with the hope that um, by combining them with the, the tools uh, of analytic theology, we can help to answer certain uh, theological questions. Um, however, sometimes what one instead discovers is that the late scholastic discussion was already extremely detailed, that it said everything uh, you think could be said or is said in the modern analytic discussion, and that it just rules out certain exciting possibilities which you thought might have been latent in the analytic discussion. So that's the kind of disappointing conclusion in a way with which I'll end my, uh, my paper today. Okay. So, divine mental states made simple, late scholastic and analytic accounts. When defending the doctrine of divine simplicity, uh, hereafter DDS, in a religious studies article of 1982, William Mann could note that although the latter was important to patristic and medieval philosophers, it had, quote, received very little uh, recent critical attention. Almost four decades later, the status questionis has changed dramatically. Divine simplicity, which I shall here understand as the claim that God lacks any metaphysical parts or composition, such as multiple uh, intrinsic attributes, has received sustained treatment from many analytic philosophers and theologians who have sought to both explain how DDS is compatible uh, with the attribution of various properties to God and further to investigate uh, divine simplicity's compatibility with broader theistic or Christian theological commitments, including a commitment to the doctrine of divine ideas. In fact, I think we might be hearing something about this in the next paper and to orthodox Trinitarianism. However, whilst discussion of divine simplicity often engages with the work of Augustine and Salman Aquinas, later scholastic elucidations of the doctrine have until recently remained relatively neglected. This is perhaps unfortunate because one key objection to the doctrine of divine simplicity raised by modern critics is not discussed at all by uh, Augustine and Salman Aquinas, although it does receive treatment from late scholastic authors. This criticism, sometimes uh, in recent literature dubbed the modal collapse argument, or henceforth MCA, holds that divine simplicity is incompatible uh, with the conjunction of the following propositions. One, that God knows and wills or permits all contingent entities or events. Two, that he exists necessarily. Uh, and three, the intuitive thesis that God's mental states are individuated by his intrinsic attributes, such that God would differ in say were his mental states to possess different objects. At least the theological claims here are usually accepted by classical proponents of divine simplicity on philosophical grounds, and they find additional theological confirmation in the doctrine of many Christian denominations, including, of course, the magisterial teaching of the Catholic Church. One version of the modal collapse argument can be briefly summarized as follows. If God has freedom of indifference with regards to creation and knows and wills or permits all contingent entities or events, then he possesses contingent mental states. But if God's contingent mental states are individuated by or grounded in his intrinsic attributes, as described above, then God varies in his intrinsic attributes between possible worlds. Further, if God exists necessarily, then he possesses some set of intrinsic attributes, i.e. his essential properties, in all possible worlds. 
I'm, I'm not using properties, I should add, with any uh, particular metaphysical import there. We can just say attributes again. Accordingly, God must possess multiple intrinsic attributes, that is, some set of uh, contingent attributes to grant his contingent mental states, and some set of necessary attributes to grant his identity across possible worlds, his essential, his essential attributes. Thus, divine simplicity, which claims that God does not possess multiple intrinsic attributes, is straightforwardly false. Okay. In response to this argument, analytic defenders of divine simplicity have broadly adopted one of three positions. Firstly, James Dolezal makes an, appearance, uh, an appeal to mystery. Theists cannot demonstrate the, comp the compatibility of DDS with other theological claims uh, listed above, but they nevertheless retain sufficient reason to jointly endorse all these positions given the philosophical arguments in their favour. Secondly, others such as Elmer Stump, Norman Kretzmann and James Ross have qualified their commitment to divine necessity by claiming that whilst the simple God exists necessarily, his intrinsic state, in virtue of which he knows and wills contingent entities and, uh, and events, differs across possible worlds. We might call this the intrinsically different response to the modal collapse argument. Finally, the most popular recent response to the modal collapse argument has been to deny that God's mental states concerning contingent entities and events are caused or individuated by God's intrinsic attributes. Rather, God's intrinsic state is identical across possible worlds, and his contingent mental states are solely grounded in the existence of created entities, perhaps together with any relations which exist between God and creatures, or vice versa. I dub this the extrinsically different response to the modal collapse argument. Advocates of this response include Timothy O'Connor, Alexander Pruss, Jeff Brower, uh, Chris Tomaszewski, and a host of others. Okay. Most prominently, W. Matthews Grant has provided an extrinsic model of divine action, will, and knowledge as part of his dual sources account of divine uh, and human action. Um, I won't have time to, to explain that today, but I, I know people here might be uh, aware of it. According to Matthews Grant, when God causes, affects, knows, or wills some created object, only the following entities exist in Ray. God, together with God's reasons for acting, B, the created object, and C, the causal dependence relation between God and the created object, whatever that is. There is no further entity which grounds God's actions or mental states concerning creatures, such as D, God's choice, intention, or decree to bring about the created object, which is intrinsic to God, is that in virtue of which God causes the object, and which would not exist were God not causing that object. Okay. Unusually, for an analytic philosopher who treats the compatibility, sorry, who treats the compatibility of divine simplicity and contingent divine mental states, Matthews Grant is familiar with late scholastic treatments of contingent divine mental states, including those given by Cajetan, Francisco Suarez, and others, which he discusses both in historical perspective in a 2015 article authored with Mark Spencer, and also in his own treatment of divine knowledge in Free Will and God's Universal Causality, his 2019 book. Unfortunately, though, Matthews Grant does not engage in detail with scholastic criticisms of his own or related positions when developing his views, and so I'll be hoping to do that in a second. In this paper, I will argue that engagement with one late scholastic account of the compatibility of God's contingent mental states and divine simplicity can help us to develop modern analytic responses to the modal collapse argument. To this end, I examine Suarez's discussion in uh, Disputationes Metaphysicae 30, section 9, which explores the que this question by examining, quote, how divine immutability, although really he means also divine simplicity, is compatible with divine freedom. Whilst this passage is only one of many Baroque scholastic discussions of this topic, it's useful for our purposes here because it clearly lays out the range of extant views in Suarez's day on God's, on God's uh, knowledge and will. And their relation to divine simplicity and immutability. And Suarez's discussion suggests insightful lines of criticism against all such accounts, okay, all uh, accounts extant in his day. Since um, Disputations 30 is not available in English translation, which perhaps explains why analytic philosophers haven't engaged with it more widely because we almost have really bad Latin, um, all the English translations below uh, are my own, taken from the new critical edition uh, of the disputations recently made available online uh, by Castellotti and Brenneman. Okay. Sadly, I'll lack time here, actually, to consider Suarez's typically intricate analysis of the problem in its entirety. Accordingly, I'll focus on his criticisms of the positions of his contemporaries, passing over his own very tentative solution to the problem, which on my reading combines an appeal to mystery, a la Dolezal, with a variety of the extrinsic difference response to the modal collapse argument, a la Matthews Grant. Instead, I will examine critique 
uh, sorry, Suarez's critique of each contemporary position in turn before considering its relevance to modern replies to the modal collapse argument. I'll especially focus on W. Matthews Grant's defense of the extrinsic difference response and James Ross's elucidation of the intrinsic difference response. In doing so, I aim to modestly advance discussion of the modal collapse argument and to illustrate, if demonstration is needed, that modern analytic philosophy of religion can learn much from late scholastic philosophy. Okay. So firstly, Suarez on extrinsic analyses of contingent divine mental states. In his discussion in uh, Disputations 30, Section 9, Suarez begins by critiquing four contemporary scholastic positions which attempt to reconcile divine immutability and simplicity with God's contingent will and knowledge of creation. The first and last positions which he discusses are variations of the extrinsic difference response, while the second and third positions are variations of the intrinsic difference response, as I've described it. I'll now summarize Suarez's criticisms of both species of response in turn, beginning with the extrinsic difference response. So the first position or opinion which Suarez discusses claims that for God to will or know creatures is, on the metaphysical level, nothing other than for him to cause those creatures to exist. On this view, which strongly resembles the position of Matthew's Grant, quote, for God to will something beyond himself is nothing other than for him to effect some change in that thing or to confer some essay, which is in the power of God to do or not to do. When he does, he is said to will that thing, but when he does not, he is said not to wish or to not wish nullere that thing, not because he might exist otherwise than he does, but only because the thing itself exists differently. Okay, hopefully that's quite straightforward. As far as notes on this account, descriptions of God as willing creatures are therefore instances of extrinsic denomination. As Joshua Hochschild elsewhere explains, quote, a term P denominates something X extrinsically if and only if for the form to be signified by P to be actual in X is for some other form F consignified by P to be actual in something other than X insofar as X is P. And hopefully most people here are familiar with extrinsic denomination in any case. Suarez firmly rejects this first opinion, combining objections from revealed truth with arguments from natural reason. Firstly, Suarez considers it unacceptable to claim that biblical descriptions of God as willing creatures are instances of extrinsic denomination. Um, Suarez isn't clear on the details, but apparently this would make such descriptions metaphorical, and this conflicts with received interpretations of scripture by the fathers. Secondly, Suarez notes that according to scripture, God acts to secure certain effects in creation because of his contingent mental states towards creation. Famous examples which Suarez cites include Psalm 115 verse 3, our God is in the heavens, he does whatsoever he pleases, and John 3, 16, well, you all know it, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, etc. Sung to your favorite uh, melody. Okay, since according to scripture, God's decisions or love for creation precede his action to produce creaturely change, quote, to will something, sorry, for God to will something about creation and for him to do it are not formally and according to their nature, ratio, the same thing. Finally, Suarez raises the interesting two-pronged objection that, quote, to act intentionally, that's my translation of philo modo, with indifference regarding acting and not acting, and nevertheless to determine oneself to act immediately and formally through the very same extrinsic act is an unintelligible and impossible way of acting. And even were it possible, it would be most imperfect and unbefitting of God. So here Suarez makes two criticisms, which, as he notes, challenge more forcefully the extrinsic differences, uh, difference responses ability to account for contingent states of divine will than its ability to account for contingent states of divine knowledge, for reasons which will become clear in a second. Firstly, Suarez argues that it's impossible for uh, God's or anyone else's will to determine itself to will something simply by immediately producing the external object at which it aims. I think that his intuition here is that if God's will were determined to its object simply by its effects, it would not determine itself per se. Using the sun's indeterministic causation as an example, he writes, quote, but an agent's will cannot determine itself through a million extrinsic action if it would otherwise be indifferent to that action, since through that action it can neither will nor determine itself to act. In this, there is a great difference between the will and similar acts, and he'll later cite the example of knowledge, for the will wills by its own internal act, not only its object, but its very action. And so it can determine itself through that action. Secondly, uh, the Dr. Eximius notes that even granting that God's will can determine itself through its relation to extrinsic objects, this would still be an unfitting mode of willing. He gives several reasons for this. I won't talk about all of them, but one reason which he gives 
is that God can plausibly cause the same created entities or events with different, presumably subordinate, ends in mind. But it is not clear how simply by creating objects God can so direct them to contingent subordinate ends, just because it's not obvious that the mere existence of the relevant objects is always sufficient to direct them to the proximate or subordinate ends for which God freely causes them. Quote, Besides, it cannot be understood that such an extrinsic mode of action and determination would be properly and formally for an end, from the intention of and by relation to the agent, for that relation is not necessary but free. For God is able to produce an effect for various ends, but this relation is not formally uh, in the created object by extrinsic action, nor, I suppose, does it always appear in it. Therefore, this mode of acting towards an end cannot be predicated of God solely by extrinsic denomination, but rather and by contrast through the, through the denomination of an interior act of God, his external action is said to be directed towards some particular end. We might add to Suarez's argument here that the problem is not so much, as Joe Schmidt suggests in a recent article, that God cannot will created effects for any end. As Matthews Grant notes on his on his own representative extrinsic account of divine mental states, God may have reasons which are identical to God ex parte rei, in virtue of which he wills or causes effects. Rather, the difficulty is that it is plausible that God can will created effects for contingent ends. And it is plausible, uh, both a priori and according to Christian scripture, that God can indeed uh, will effects for contingent ends. For instance, in Exodus 3, God sends Moses to Pharaoh with the, express, with the express intention of hardening Pharaoh's heart. And yet it seems even parche compatibilist accounts of Pharaoh's free will that this was not a necessary effect of Moses' mission. And also that God could have chosen to send Moses to Pharaoh for some other reason, uh, for example, to soften Pharaoh's heart. But it's not obvious that extrinsic uh, accounts of di contingent divine mental states offer plausible explanations of this possibility. And we can develop Suarez's line of argument here into the following providential objection to extrinsic accounts of divine mental, mental states. So and you've been waiting half a paper to hear a syllogism. So here's a syllogism. OK, premise one, if an agent wills an effect X for an end Y, the agent's volition or causation necessarily thereby directs X to Y. Premise two, if God is denominated as willing created effects through extrinsic denomination, he never necessarily thereby directs them to contingent proximate ends. So three, God is not de denominated as willing created effects for contingent proximate ends through extrinsic denomination. But four, God does will or can will created effects for contingent proximate ends. So God can, sorry, sorry, so five, uh, God cannot be denominated as willing created effects through extrinsic denomination, and you might think this leaves intrinsic denomination, okay, as the uh, obvious remaining option. The fourth opinion, which uh, Suarez discusses, strongly resembles the first opinion um, to which I've just been glossing, objections. But it claims that uh, ascriptions of will and of will of knowledge um, of creatures to God are made on the basis of some relation of reason between God, who exists simply and necessarily, regardless of the content of his mental states, and creatures. Um, but really, I won't say too much about this last opinion, because Suarez's um, fundamental objections to it, I think, are the same as to the first opinion. For as Suarez notes, um, relation of reason here can't plausibly be understood strictly as a relation which is merely imagined to exist, fictum, between God and creatures. Um, after all, presumably, um, uh, the relation um, which grounds uh, acts of divine will would exist even if nobody, including God, um, per impossible, was thinking about it. But, by contrast, if this contingent relation of reason has some real foundation, it must either exist in God or the creature. If it exists in the creature, then um, this opinion is going to be identical to the first opinion, which Harris has just rejected. But if it, if it exists in God, then this will involve admitting that God has contingent or accidental internal properties. Um, and I'll explain why Harris also rejects um, accounts which claim that shortly. Okay. So how relevant are Suarez's criticisms of the extrinsic difference response for analytic discussions of the problem? 
Well, I think that Suarez's first objection um, that uh, the extrinsic difference uh, account involves necessarily involves metaphorical uh, predication of states of um, willing and knowing creatures to God uh, is the least convincing to modernists. Whereas Suarez holds that as vital acts, human acts of knowledge and will are determined to their objects by corresponding formal causes within the human intellect, as Alexander Press notes, modern proponents of mental content externalism, such as Hilary Putnam, have claimed that some human mental content is outside the head. Accordingly, when extrinsic accounts of God's knowledge suggest that the identity or content of, di of contingent divine mental states is partly determined by entities external to God, this does not involve an entirely innovative metaphysics of mental content or the use of radically non-standard senses when applying terms such as knowing and willing to God. Okay. Suarez's second criticism, that the extrinsic difference response struggles to explain passages of scripture which indicate that God's actions are caused by contingent divine mental states, um, and hence that they are causally subsequent to and really separate from the latter, carries more weight. But it seems that proponents of extrinsic accounts of divine mental states have a strategy available to them which should be familiar to Christian proponents of divine simplicity more broadly. That is, reading biblical texts in non-literal ways which accommodate their central meaning whilst denying that their metaphysical import can be determined solely by their surface meaning or grammar. In the case of passages which suggests that God's actions are subsequent to contingent divine mental states. An obvious suggestion is that when scripture talks of God's will preceding his action, it separates God's will and efficient causation of creatures so that these texts are more readily comprehensible to non-philosophical audiences. Nevertheless, uh, these divine acts are in fact grounded in the same entities in Ray. Thus, for example, when God, uh, John 3.16 suggests that uh, God's loving somehow proceeds or causes um, the incarnation, one might um, claim that on the metaphysical level, what St. John's claiming uh, should really be that God's action in Christ constitutes God's love for the world, rather than, say, causing or grounding it. Finally, we can consider Suarez's final pair of objections to the extrinsic difference response. I, uh, that is, that it's impossible or otherwise unfitting for God's will to determine itself through extrinsic efficient causation. Responding to a similar objection, uh, oh, sorry, I don't, <laughs> Matthew's Grant notes that on his account of divine actions, all of God's volitions and other acts concerning creatures are basic acts, which, quote, consist in an agent's causing or bringing about an effect, but not by means of anything at all. Thus, like other basic acts, any divine choice concerning creatures is not, quote, explanatory explanatorily prior to the existence, say, of the executive state of intention, the direct causing of which constitutes or just is that very action. Accordingly, Suarez's assumption that God's will must determine itself through an imminent act in order for his actions to be intentional is explicitly rejected by analytic defenders of the extrinsic response, and so seems to beg the question without further support or development. However, Suarez's last contention that extrinsic accounts of divine will cannot explain God's potential actual providential ordering of his acts to contingent ends, glossed as the providential objection above, gives extant analytic treatments of the modal collapse argument something new to consider. A few responses to this objection immediately suggest themselves to me, although none of them appear especially satisfactory. The first would be to maintain against the um, second premise of my argument, that was that if God is denominated as willing, created effect through extrinsic denomination, he never necessarily thereby directs them to contingent proximate ends. Um, that God can at least sometimes direct his effects to contingent ends by willing them in a way which is compatible with the extrinsic difference response to the modal collapse argument. And perhaps there are two ways uh, in, in which this might work. So firstly, perhaps there's some real but non-temporal ordering to God's efficient causation of creatures, such that God can cause an effect Y at T2 before he causes an effect X at T1. If so, perhaps when God causes X, it can stand in some logically prior relation to Y, which is sufficient for X to be directed to Y. Alternatively, perhaps God can cause some real property in creatures, say some form of uh, real final cause, which directs them to relative, relevant contingent ends. But I judge that both of these responses are basically metaphysically profligate if alternative accounts of God's contingent mental states can be given, uh, which offer good replies to the modal collapse argument. Additionally, either of these options would cause problems for Matthew Grant's own dual sources explanation for how God's universal causal activity doesn't undermine creatures' possession of libertarian free will, but I don't have a time to go into that.
Now, another response uh, to the providential objection would concede um, the third uh, premise, which is that God is not denominated as will in created effects for contingent proximate ends through extrinsic uh, denomination, um, but deny the fourth premise, and it would admit that strictly God can't will or cause created events for contingent proximate ends. Nevertheless, uh, a proponent of this view might maintain that God necessarily wills creation uh, for his own sake, um, through loving himself, and therefore that creation necessarily serves uh, the end of reflecting his glory, so that it also necessarily or very probably evinces some or other providential order. Perhaps when biblical texts describe God as willing created effects for contingent proximate ends, like in Exodus 3, um, it's just this general truth that God's creative act uh, leads to some kind of providential order in a general sense that scripture intends to convey. But obviously that would, I mean, really severely weaken uh, the claims that scripture makes. You know, it is not a plausible sort of surface level reading. Okay. So now let's turn to examine Suarez's account uh, and objections to intrinsic analysis of contingent divine mental states. If Suarez's objections to contemporary versions of the extrinsic difference response to the modal collapse argument seem powerful, um, Suarez considers that accounts of God's contingent mental states which suggest that the latter are individuated by intrinsic divine attributes are even less plausible. He considers two such positions, the first of which uh, is ascribed to Cayetan, and the second of which is um, described as a sort of a refinement of Cayetan's position by later disciples. According to uh, the second uh, opinion, that's Cayetan's opinion, which Suarez discusses, God intrinsically possesses, quote, real perfections, which are ex parte rei, distinct from his simple nature, in virtue of which he knows and wills creatures. These free perfections, as Suarez calls them, are contingent, although they're inseparable from God once they exist in him. They do add something to God's perfection, but only extensively rather than intensively, because they're only secundum quid perfections, not uh, perfections simpliciter. But Suarez levels a barrage of detailed objections to this position, and I'll just summarise a few here. Firstly, this position just can't be endorsed by a defender of divine simplicity because it's straightforwardly incompatible with it. As Suarez points out, this can be seen as evident from the terms themselves, since a thing understood to barely exist is simpler than a thing affected by, for example, a mode distinct in ray from itself, or than the constituted entity which results from the thing itself and its mode. As Suarez here is considering that these uh, three perfections added to God um, would probably be modes. Secondly, those three perfections would be highly imperfect because they would be contingent. And hence, quote, such acts when they exist cannot be their essay quantitatively and, and essentially. For beings of this type can never be conceived or exist as nothing, uh, sorry, uh, sub nihilo. But a being which is not essentially its essay is a being which is participated, finite, and imperfect. So three divine perfections would be very imperfect. And finally, um, since these perfections would be contingent and accidental, even if modes, they would have to be in some way produced in God. And although this production wouldn't involve the creation ex nihilo, it would involve some sort of production in God, entailing the twin absurdities that first of all, a non-divine being would be produced in God, and secondly, that God's simple and necessary act of being would stand in some form of potency or the like to uh, the, pre the pre perfection. Try to think that there's unacceptable conclusions. So given these severe difficulties, Suarez notes that some defenders of Cayetan's position introduced an important clarification. These three perfections are really identical ex parte rei with God's simple essence. They suggest that if this is possible, quote, all the difficulties with the second position which Suarez discusses, Cayetan's position, uh, will be perfectly dealt with. For if three acts of this kind add something real, it's easily understood how they formally constitute God, God as willing freely. But if what they add is not distinct in ray from the divine will, the difficulties which seem to be entailed by Cayetan's position are dissolved. However, Suarez holds that unfortunately this move simply adds further absurdity to Cayetan's position. Fundamentally, this new third opinion about God's contingent mental states fails because putative free perfections could not be really identical to God. And here Suarez deploys a general metaphysical principle, quote, it is entirely impossible that two absolutes are such that one can exist if the other does not, and yet that they are not distinct in ray. Thus, he continues, the divine will and this pre-perfection, which is said to be added, are related in such a way that the divine will can, absolutely speaking, exist without such a 
pre-perfection existing in rerum natura. Therefore, it cannot be conceived by the mind that they are entirely the same in re without any real distinction. And real distinction of God's essence and putative uh, pre-perfections of his will is further evident from the previously noted fact that God's essence is necessary, whereas the essence of putative pre, uh, pre-perfections is contingent. Thus, God and any free perfections would be distinguished by the first diversity between real essences, which Suarez has previously described in Disputation 28. Given that any intrinsic, sorry, any intrinsic contingent attributes which might ground God's contingent mental states would be really distinct, the attempt to refine Cayetan's original position avoids none of the pitfalls of the latter. Suarez therefore approves of the received opinion of important theologians, quote, according to which God is not really related to creatures um, in the way in which implicit difference solutions to the modal collapse argument imply. So if Suarez is correct that any intrinsic difference in God across possible worlds implies composition in him, as in fact proponents of the modal collapse argument claim, then intrinsic difference responses to that argument are just doomed to failure. However, Suarez's first argument for that claim, uh, that it's entirely impossible that two absolutes are such, uh, that one can exist if the other does not, and yet that they are not distinct in Ray, provides an immediate opportunity for analytic philosophers to question uh, Suarez's objection. As James Ross has noted, there's at least one case in which some analytics claim that two items can be identical ex parte Ray, whilst remaining so metaphysically distinct that one can exist without the other. The example which Ross cites, and I was annoyed because I thought I discovered this myself, anyway, but there we go, is the case of determinable and determinate properties. Familiar examples of determinable properties include the relationship between colours and shades or designated areas and shapes. But according to many philosophers, uh, the determinable determinate distinction can conceivably be found in items of reality other than first order properties like events, actions, tropes and substances. Whilst there's considerable debate as to the theoretical status and relationship between determinables and determinants prior to metaphysical analysis, Stephen Yablo briefly characterizes that relationship as follows, quote, P determines Q if and only if for a thing to be P is for it to be Q, not simpliciter, but in a specific way. Or else, quote, P determines Q only if one necessarily for all X, if X has P, then X has Q, and two possibly for some X, X has Q but lacks P. The relevance to God and contingent uh, mental states should be clear. If something has particular contingent divine mental states, it must be divine, but not vice versa. It's also plausible, as um, philosophers typically hold, that determinables cannot exist without being determined to some determinate or other, and that at least typically same level determinates are incompatible. So something can't be like scarlet and uh, crimson at the same time. Thus, given the extent of God's knowledge and providential will, God cannot exist, we might think, without some contingent mental states, and many of these states are, as Suarez would say, repugnant to one another, like God willing X and God willing not X. Okay, So here we might think, so far so good for an analogy between um, uh, God, uh, his contingent mental states, and determinables and determinants. So if determinants and determinables are really, or can be really identical, even if they have different persistence conditions, then someone who wishes to develop an intrinsic difference response to the modal collapse argument can employ this to her advantage in one of two ways. Either she can suggest that God just is a determinable property, entity or whatever, following Ross, or she can suggest, sorry, or following Ross, she can suggest that the relationship between determinable between determinable properties, entities, or whatever, provides a structural analogy which illustrates the relationship between God's essence and what Suarez termed the intrinsic free perfections, which ground and individuate contingent divine mental states. If this analogy holds, a defender of the intrinsic difference response can more readily adopt the third account of divine contingent mental states mentioned by Suarez, for she can claim that because God is not really distinct from whatever intrinsic contingent attribute grounds his contingent mental states, the latter poses no challenge to divine simplicity. Further, she can claim that at least some of Suarez's further objections to intrinsic accounts of contingent divine mental states are unpersuasive. For instance, if determinates and determinables are really identical, then determinables do not act as efficient causes uh, or producers of their uh, determinants, and so neither need God act as an efficient cause or producer of his um, contingent um, uh, mental states. Now, I'm, I'll, I'm aware that I'm running out of time now, so I'll, I'll try to go a little bit faster. Ross takes it as evident that determinants and determinables are not really distinct. Quote, he says, God's choice is no more really distinct from his being than being read in a thing must 
that must by nature say choose its color is distinct from its being colored, given that it is by nature colored. There is no other color of it that it is actual for its being red to be really distinct from either. However, it should be noted that this claim is hotly debated by analytic philosophers who give analyses of the determinate determinable relationship in secular contexts. There are several rival understandings of this relationship at the metaphysical level, and many of them are unhelpful for Ross's analysis. Firstly, some philosophers are non-realists concerning the determinate determinable relationship. But since Ross is trying to argue that something like this relationship corresponds to the relationship in Ray between God and his contingent mental states, I take it that that's bad for him. Okay, that's not helpful if the, uh, that determinate determinable relationship um, is uh, is just semantic. Secondly, some non-reductive realists about determinables and determinants invoke some sort of ex parte ray distinction between determinants and determinables. For instance, Stephen Yablo holds that determinables are essences, say, sets of essential properties which are included in broader essences, which are determinants. Other ways of claiming that determinable and determinables and determinants are distinct in Ray include Ingvar Johansson's analysis on which determinables are as universals, as eminent universals, constituent parts of entities with the relevant determinate properties, and Jonathan Schaffer's claim that determinants are grounded uh, by their determinants. So whatever merits these analyses have, I, again, I take it they're not going to be of any use to Ross's case. Okay. Finally. Others, like Gonzalo Rodriguez uh, Pereira and Olivier Massan, hold a reductive account of the relationship between determinants and determinables. On this characterization, determinables are just disjunctive properties. Thus, to be red is just to be crimson or scarlet or vermilion, and so on. Many such theorists claim that determinables are not, however, objectionably ad hoc properties because of the real resemblance relations between their determinants. Interestingly, and moreover, some philosophers who espouse this position urge in its favor that it accounts well for the possibility of simple determinate properties which are not really distinct from their determinables. So actually they're um, pointing to the sort of thing which the intrinsic difference uh, response person needs, needs to, to point to. So could one claim in this vein, um, I am coming to the end of my paper now, that divinity is something like a disjunctive property? Hmm, doesn't sound so good. Okay. On such an account, to be God would either, um, in Ray, would either be to be God determined to contingent mental state X or say God determined to contingent mental state Y and so on. And to secure divine necessity, one would have to hold that some such entity exists in every possible world and further that the brute similarity between divine determinants, so to speak, grounds God's identity across possible worlds. Well, it's not unclear to me that uh, some version of this response to the thermodynamic collapse argument is absolutely hopeless. But, I mean, okay, this seems, you know, um, the prospect for success seems slim to me. Okay, why so? I mean, three reasons, okay, if it's not evident already. So firstly, this analysis commits one um, to the possibility of brute or primi primitive similarity relationships favoured by nominalists. So if you're not a nominalist, you probably might not like this. Secondly, since most defenders of divine simplicity hold that God is essay subsistence or the like, depending on your variety of scholasticism, um, on this account, what it means actually to exist or to participate in existence would vary between possible worlds so that the analogy of being would exist, so to speak, horizontally as well as vertically. And that, I mean, that strikes me as slightly odd. Um, and finally, I imagine that if you put this position to Suarez, what he'd just say is this, look, for any singular determinate entity or property instance, like God determined to contingent mental state X, for that thing to be contingent is just itself highly imperfect. And so it is completely un unfitting. Um, and I mean, maybe just intuitively, it seems absurd that God could be like a a disjunctive property that that seems that maybe seems right sadly okay so in light of this we can see that minimally um uh, it's very difficult to defeat through an appeal to the example as ross does makes of determinants and determinables suarez's contention that any contingent divine attributes which god possesses must be really distinct from his essence and as far as is correct then the intrinsic difference response to the modal collapse argument just won't get off the ground all right. Okay, finally, conclusion. Suarez himself described the challenge of accounting for God's contingent mental states whilst maintaining the doctrine of divine simplicity and immutability as, quote, una ex, ex obscur, obscur, obscurioribus, I think understand, questionibus, quas de deo tractant theology. Okay. 
He therefore consciously buttresses his philosophical analysis with frequent references to scripture, in light of which he's more confident, for instance, about rejecting Cayetan's position. And his own attempted solution, which I've not had time to explore, largely consists of an endorsement of the extrinsic response favoured by modern analysts like Matthews Grant, buttressed by an appeal to the mysterious nature of God. In this paper, obviously, I haven't tried to solve the middle collapse uh, argument. Perhaps, as Suarez suggests, there's no easy way to do to do that on this side of heaven. But I hope to have illustrated how Suarez, Suarez's analysis raises fresh challenges for the two main modern lines of reply to the modal collapse argument, and that analytic philosophers or theologians might benefit from further engagement with his treatment of this topic. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, we have very little time for questions, so are there any questions? Okay. <coughs> so I, was, I, I didn't quite catch in the end, when you mentioned what Suarez's view is, is it he has all these arguments against the extrinsic account, but you say he he combines the extrinsic account with an appeal to mystery, but what does that, what, what, what is the mystery supposed to solve? It seems like you have to go for a mystery somewhere. Maybe you could go for a mystery with the, you know, God could be identical, even God, God could have a contingent feature that could be identical to his necessary features or something like this, but... Um, so you, you, you have to do a mystery somewhere. So why, why do the mystery where Suarez does it, and how exactly does the mystery help him if he's going for an extrinsic account, which he, he gives so many arguments against? Yeah, sure. Um, so I mean, as I say, basically, I think Suarez, and Suarez himself says he's not, I think, really happy with his own account. Um, but I think the reason, so where Suarez places the mystery um, it's in a slightly different place to the place you mentioned. I think for Suarez, the mystery is about how the divine will can determine itself um, to, to, to its object, to, to its contingent objects. Um, so as I say, I think he has this view that um, the will in general um, should cause things by, should determine itself by way of, of an imminent act. And so that's really his, I mean, one of his more fundamental problems with extrinsic accounts, because um, these just aren't, these are kind of uh, transient rather than rather than um, Im imminent acts. So I think for Suarez, that's where the mystery uh, comes in, that there's this strong difference between God and creatures. Uh, he, you know, he, he says, for basically for a creature to, to freely will something, it always has to determine itself through an imminent act of will, and um, God just doesn't have to, to do that. Now, he... Um, you know, makes a few moves to the particular perfection of the divine will, which kind of try to make that more more plausible. But I don't think he does anything exceptionally concrete. Um, yeah. So I think I think in in general he lays out a principle when he gives his uh, reply, and his principle basically is just that we should always attribute whatever's most fitting, apparently most fitting to God, and I think generally those attributions push him in the direction of the extrinsic account because he doesn't want to say that anything in God, uh, in particular, is a contingent uh, or that it's um, it's not quidditive, quidditive, quidditively or, or essentially essay or anything like that. Um, so, yeah, I, I hope that answers your question to some extent. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, our next speaker should be uh, Thomas Swart. Je uh, připraven? Okay. I am here. Am I audible? Okay. okay. Yes. Yes. So, uh, Thomas Ward is going to speak on the containment exemplars theory of divine ideas. So, floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. It's a, a bitter disappointment to me that I can't be there in person. Um, 
but that's the world we're in right now. So I'll just I'll just dive in. This is um, a historically informed project, but it's it's not history of philosophy, at least in the the way that I typically do it. We won't be looking at texts, um, though the the view that I've called here the containment exemplarist view is a view that I I find in SCOTUS, but there might be a few views to be found in SCOTUS. And so rather than trying to argue that mine is SCOTUS's, I've just uh, cribbed it from SCOTUS. And I'll, I'll try to develop it in the context of um, uh, uh, arguing for its advantages over some rivals. So I hope that the, the general topic, uh, the divine ideas, is somewhat familiar to all of us. Um, the containment exemplarist view is probably less familiar, but is not a new view, at least as far as I understand it. So um, I do have a handout. Uh, oh, it looks like it's been posted. I was about to share my screen. Um, is this handout fully visible to everyone? Sorry, let me um, let me share my screen so that I can. Uh, scroll through it easily. Good, okay. Right, so um, let's, let's just dive in then. So what is a divine idea? Um, I take it that the divine ideas are uh, closely related to uh, uh, perhaps a, a more familiar or less controversial divine attribute, namely omniscience. Um, God knows all that can be known. So if there's nothing that cannot be known, God knows everything. And a divine idea then is just whatever it is about God by which he knows what he knows. For everything that God knows, there is a divine idea of it. Now, this is compatible with there being, say, just one divine idea. If you thought, for example, that uh, just by knowing God's own essence in its uh, strict simplicity, God would thereby know everything else, well, then God's idea of his own essence would be the one idea by which he knows everything he knows. Um, if you thought that there was a plurality of ideas in the mind of God, then, of course, God would have many ideas by which he knows the many things that he knows. So, why divine ideas? What is the uh, what kind of theoretical work do they do when we when we think about them as philosophers? Um, in the contemporary literature, what we mostly find is some uh, contemporary updated version of a theory of divine ideas that is presented as uh, an alternative to Platonism uh, that is consistent with theism. And in particular here, the, the concern seems to be that Platonism poses some sort of challenge to divine aseity or sovereignty. And then uh, if we could take all of the Platonic entities and somehow stick them in the mind of God, then this would take care of that worry. Um, so that's the, the I, I take it, the, the dominant contemporary motivation for positing divine ideas. The classical texts, and by classical here, I mean roughly Philo to Duns Scotus, uh, the, the main motivation for uh, thinking through theories of divine ideas has to do with creation. God is uh, not just the maker of everything, the, the first cause of everything that exists, but God is an intelligent cause of everything that exists, and plausibly intelligent activity requires something like knowing what you're doing. So then a theory of divine ideas would would come in to uh, be a partial explanation of what it is that God knows when he's doing something like creating. Um, so as early as Philo of Alexandria, we get the, the beautiful architect uh, model. God is a, a master builder of a city. He plans out the city in his mind before he creates it. And then we get variations on that theme 
more commonly, say, in St. Augustine and uh, St. Thomas Aquinas, we get the, the artisan or craftsman model. Uh, and, and for our purposes, these different models are, are equivalent. All right, so one of the things that um, makes uh, theories of divine ideas sort of puzzling for, for a philosopher is, um, or the, you know, the kind of speculative questions that we might put to uh, theories of divine ideas is, is whether they, whether we could have some sort of account of why God has the ideas he has, where they come from, if they come from anywhere, are they simply uh, uh, Groot, sort of given in what it is to be God, or uh, are, are they are they necessary, are they contingent, and, and so on. These sorts of questions are um, all at play as we try to sketch out a, a complete theory of divine ideas. Um, one kind of guide for our reflection is that the actual creatures there are uh, cannot supply God with his ideas. And there are several reasons why this would be a bad road to go down. But one simple thought is that um, there is some sort of priority uh, of God's thinking and acting uh, to uh, the creation of the world or to their being actually existing creatures. So God's ideas have to, so to speak, come first, come prior to God's making of things. Uh, so God already knows uh, what it is to be a creature of some kind or other before there are any creatures. The uh, two questions here that I'm particularly interested in uh, kind of motivating a containment exemplarist theory is whether God's ideas have a source such that we could explain why he has the ideas he has with reference to that source. And then could God's ideas have been different from what they in fact are? And the, the view that I prefer holds uh, gives an answer to both and says that there is, in fact, a source of God's ideas. It is the divine essence itself. By thinking of himself, God eternally generates, perhaps begets, ideas of all the ways that creatures can be. These ideas could not have been other than they are, because God cannot be other than he is. On this view, there are no abstract objects. Uh, and God's ideas supply all the ontology which abstract objects would otherwise supply. Now, the, the use of the begetting language there is, uh, will be provocative for Christian philosophical theologians, and it's meant to be. Um, one long-term hope is making the view that I develop here um, more Trinitarian. Uh, I don't have anything to say about that, but it's I include that language here just to sort of lay down a, a kind of hint of where I would like this to go, that um, God's perfect self-thinking in the Word of God somehow is uh, simultaneously generative of all of the creaturely modes of being. And this is a view I find probably most um, magnificently set out in St. Maximus Confessor, where he distinguishes the one logos of God and the logoi that are somehow the logoi of creatures which are somehow given in that one logos. But we'll leave the Trinitarian stuff for another time unless it comes up in Q&A. So by way of defending the containment exemplars view, I'd like to lay out some competitors and then uh, offer some criticism of these competing views. So first, Platonism. Um, on this view, abstract objects exist. They're uncreated and so eternal. Their existence and nature is completely independent of God. God's ideas of possible creatures are, in some sense, derived from abstract objects. Because the, these objects are what they are, God's ideas are what they are. Uh, a view which tries to make 
the existence of abstract objects more comfortable with theism is theistic activism. And there are, very roughly speaking, two versions of this. Um, the, the general view of activism is that abstract objects do exist, but that they are somehow dependent on God. Uh, the absolute activism defended a long time ago by Morris and Menzel just goes all in and says that for, for any um, uh, property, for any sort of uh, abstract object, God creates it, even those properties which characterize God himself. Um, a modified version of this view holds that God's own essence or essential properties are uncreated, um, but that everything else, say all of the creaturely properties, uh, God creates these. So there's a, a sort of, before the creation of the world, ex nihilo, there's a creation of a Platonic realm. So you get the same types of objects that you get on Platonism, but you've just made them dependent on God. Divine conceptualism uh, eschews abstract objects, and so in this sense is uh, much closer to the exemplarist view that I favor. Abstract objects become ideas in the mind of God, or concepts, hence conceptualism. And we can think of, of two basic sorts. Um, one is that, that God just finds himself, so to speak, stocked with all of these ideas. They're, God's ideas are not parts of the divine essence. They're not creatures outside of God. They're just, they just make up the contents of divine thinking. Um, and you can imagine a, a slightly different take on conceptualism, and I'm, I'm calling this voluntaristic view left out ish because it's not left out's view but i uh i i located it in logical space by thinking about ramifications of of left out's own view so the, the the thought here is that we have uh divine ideas or concepts but god has some sort of control over how these get generated, and maybe even what, which ones get generated, you know, so that if God hadn't, in some sense, chosen to think up uh, uh, mammals <laughs> as, a, as a possible way for creatures to be, then being mammalian would not be a way for creatures to be. Um, finally, uh, what I consider the... Uh, the, the close cousin of the containment exemplarist view is what I call the imitative exemplarist view of Aquinas. Now, at one level of generality, if we're just painting with broad strokes, I think it would be fine to describe Aquinas's view as a kind of divine conceptualism. But here I, I do distinguish it um, as an alternative view because of the way that Aquinas offers some sort of explanation of how God gets his ideas. And the, the thought here, familiar to many of you I know, is that for Aquinas there are no abstract objects. Uh, God generates ideas of all possible creatures simply by knowing himself perfectly. Um, Perfect self-knowledge, we might think, would include knowledge of all of the ways in which one can be imitated. And so, uh, insofar as God knows every single way he can be imitated, he thereby has ideas of all possible creatures. And so, uh, it's exemplarist because God's, God himself is the exemplar of all creaturely ways of being, and it's imitative because these divine ideas turn out to be just ideas of ways that God can be imitated. So these are the competitors, so to speak, that uh, I want to think through in relation to containment exemplarism. 
Now, I'd like to offer some objections to these, um, most of which I think will be familiar. So I, I hope to move through this section fairly quickly. Um, I have three main concerns about Platonism. One is uh, what I call the worship worthiness objection. The thought is that to God we owe the love of all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. The obligation is unconditional, but abstract objects from which God is metaphysically derivative, either in his essence or in his thinking, uh, even if these abstract objects do not self-exemplify, they would be rivals, uh, God's rivals for our highest devotion. And the significance of the the point, the italicized point about self-exemplification is that, you know, think think about, uh, you know, suppose there is the the property of goodness, and God exemplifies goodness. And you thought, well, if, say that the you know contra Socrates, the the form of good is not itself good; uh, it's just that by which something is good. And so we don't have to worry that there's the highest good uh, and then God and wonder which one we should be wholly devoted to. And, and my thought there is that even if the property of goodness doesn't self-exemplify, I would still be uh, deeply committed to it. I mean, I, I, it's the source of all goodness. That's That's a big deal. So... I think that even even if the properties on which God depends don't self-exemplify, they would still be rivals in a way that I find troubling for the sort of worship uh, Christians owe to God, take themselves to owe to God. Um, the second objection to Platonism is somewhat similar, the perfect being objection. A being who does not depend on abstract objects for his knowledge of possible creatures is more perfect than a being who does depend on abstract objects for his knowledge of possible creatures, all else being equal. So if it is possible for a being not to depend on abstract objects for its knowledge of possible creatures, a perfect being wouldn't depend. Sorry about the typo there on the handout. But then there would be no need to posit abstract objects in the first place. And finally, the simplicity of explanation objection uh, th simple theories are to be preferred, all else being equal. Uh, but exemplarism and conceptualism are simpler theories than Platonism insofar as they uh, 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 locate a whole abstract realm simply in the mind of God. Um, so absolute theistic ap activism, the... Uh, primary objection here is <clears throat> that it is absurd. For God to have the property of being able to make properties, he must first make that property. But prior to making that property, he lacks the ability to make properties. And that's absurd. And this particular objection is due to uh, Bergman and Brower's paper from a while back. The second objection is the rationality of creation objection. So created objects, abstract, created abstract objects, if they exist, would help explain why God's creation of the actual world, concrete world, is a rational activity. The abstract objects are the models or archetypes or exemplars or blueprints of the created world God makes. But when it comes to the created abstract objects themselves, God has no models of these. So there's a kind of proto-creation here, uh, which would not be fully rational. God would not know what he's doing when he creates these abstract objects, because they haven't been thought up before. They, they've never been thought about. So uh, I, I find this, you know, for, for, for God to make something and not do it rational seems to uh, seems to impugn God's wisdom. Uh, so I, I find this objection persuasive.
but it hasn't persuaded everyone I've run it by. So maybe, maybe that will come up in the Q&A. Um, finally, again, uh, absolute the theistic activism suffers the same simplicity of explanation objection that Platonism does. So for modified theistic activism, uh, we don't here have the absurdity objection. Modified theistic activism evades absurdity, but it suffers the same um, exposure to the rationality of creation objection and the simplicity of explanation objection. So divine conceptualism, we'll take first the voluntaristic uh, version, and here we have essentially the same rationality of creation uh, objection, just suitably modified for God's uh, generation of his own ideas rather than uh, his creation of abstract objects. So when God uh, chooses to think up new concepts, he would in some sense be acting, you know, engaged in an act of thinking up, but he would not have any, he would not know what he's doing other, other than at the very general level of I'm thinking stuff up right now. He wouldn't know that what he's about to do is a thinking up of mammal uh, nature. And so it's, it's essentially the same objection as we leveled against activism. So moving on to uh, brute divine conceptualism, um, this, this view is extremely close to my own. And I think that if I were persuaded that my view is, is bonkers, I would, I would just fall back on this brute divine conceptualism. The only issue that I take with it, and the only, really, the only real reason why I find my own view preferable, is that I think that there's a bit more explanation than that we can offer uh, than brute divine conceptualism gives us. It holds that it is a brute or primitive fact that God has the number and content of ideas that he has. And so in this respect, it offers less explanation than exemplarism, which holds that God's ideas themselves derive from God's self-knowledge. So given its greater explanatory power, all else being equal, exemplarism should be preferred to brute divine conceptualism. And finally, um, an objection to Im imitative exemplarism. And this is a criticism that is very old. Uh, you can find it in SCOTUS. And it's the, I call it the relational priority objection, but the thought is that imitation is a kind of relation, uh, but relations exist if they exist due to the existence of uh, features of their relata. And relational predicates are true when they're true due to the existence of features of their relata. Therefore, if X imitates God, there is something about X in virtue of which it imitates God. But for God to know X, as an omniscient being would know X, God must know not only that X imitates God, but also that in virtue of which X imitates God. Therefore, God's ideas of possible creatures cannot merely be ideas of ways God might be imitated. God must also have ideas of the non-relational features of possible creatures. Okay, so objections uh, to my own view. One is the objection from evil. The thought is this, that if God, in knowing himself, knows uh, all of the non-relational ways that creatures can be, then God is evil because uh, some creatures are evil. And so if, if God is the exemplar of every creaturely way of being, then God is the exemplar of some evil things. And my reply here is to just double down on the privation, uh, the privation theory of evil. Evil is just the lack of goodness where goodness ought to be. Uh, so there wouldn't be, uh, there wouldn't be evil things in God. 
The more serious objection, I think, is from simplicity. If God's ideas of creatures are ideas of aspects of divinity, then God is not simple, but God is simple. So three replies. One is that every view considered here has an issue when it comes to simplicity. Um, even, even Platonism, because if you think, well, the whole abstract realm exists outside of God, but if you also think that God knows all abstract objects and has ideas of them, then there is some sort of plurality in God due to his knowledge of all the abstract realm. So you might think that one reason to prefer Platonism would be the way in which you, you could preserve simplicity, but I, I think even then you still have to confront this problem of God's having a, a multiplicity of ideas. Uh, and all of the other views considered here, too, have this problem. A second sort of reply is to try to think through what the real metaphysical motivations for simplicity are and how that relates to a, a theological doctrine about simplicity. And I take it that the, the motivations for simplicity uh, come from a certain view about the metaphysics of parts, namely that anything with parts first depends on the parts for its existence, and two, it can be taken apart and so destroyed. So it has some sort of potency. Um, and God depends on nothing for his existence and cannot be corrupted or changed in any way. So it follows that God lacks parts and is therefore simple. But I sometimes wondered if we could just deny one and two, and we would lose the metaphysical motivation for simplicity, but not, of course, the uh, additional theological doctrines that simplicity is meant to secure, namely God's being totally underivative of anything, and um, God's being impassable. And then a third sort of reply, and this is, this is very sketchy, so I, I offer this in a, a spirit of, of humility and, and, and ready for criticism here, but um, again, inspired by uh, Duns Scotus, um, I mean, he, he develops, a, he, he affirms simplicity. I mean, he, he says that there are formally distinct rationes in God, and indeed infinitely many of them, but he thinks that that claim is consistent with what he himself considers a very strong view of divine simplicity and gives many arguments for divine simplicity in, um, in his natural theology. But his thought was that if God is infinite being and has every attribute he has infinitely, then there would be a kind of mutual entailment or interdependence between all divine attributes such that it would be unthinkable, contradictory, that God would, uh, would lack any of the attributes that he has. In their infinite modes, all divine attributes go together, so to speak. You, you can't have one without the other. So simplicity on this sense would be... Um, uh, the uh, mutual logical entailment of all of the divine attributes, something like that. I give one example here. Um, if God is infinitely loving, then plausibly God is infinitely knowledgeable, since perfect willing of the good implies perfectly knowing what the good is. So the strategy then would be that for any divine attribute or aspect, having that attribute or aspect entails having all the others. If everything we predicate of God has this sort of logical or interdependent unity, that might be enough to secure whatever a stronger version of divine simplicity is meant to secure. So in conclusion, um, all competitors but Platonism secure divine aseity and avoid the objections from worship worthiness and perfect being theology. Brute divine conceptualism and both forms of exemplarism avoid the objection from the rationality of creation. 
Containment exemplarism has all the virtues of brute divine conceptualism with the added benefit of offering some explanation of the source of God's ideas of possible creatures, namely God himself. Imitative exemplarism has all the virtues of containment exemplarism, but has the vice of being committed to a priority of relations over relata. Therefore, containment exemplarism is to be preferred over these rivals. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you for uh, your very clear presentation and there will surely be questions. Okay. Tom, thanks very much for your interesting paper. I learned a lot. Um, I had just had a question about you, one of your objections um, to the voluntarist um, view, and you know, you say, yeah, how can God sort of bring about these ideas without knowing like what it is that He was bringing about? And I just wondered. Um, it seemed like you were. It seemed to me that you were saying that there has to be a kind of temporal priority in God. Um, that God would have to know. I mean, you, use, you were using words like when and when God was about to. So. Um, I mean, am, am I correct in that, uh, or was that just sort of a loose way of speaking, or um, what, what sort of priority does there have to be uh, of these for these ideas? Thanks. Definitely not temporal priority. Uh, I was thinking here of some kind of logical or ontological priority, where in a in order of explanation, uh, some things would come before other things. And so, uh, the, uh, to get into the voluntaristic conceptualism space, you know, um, we, could, we probably can't help avoiding temporal imaginings, but you imagine God uh, choosing to think up ways that things can be, ways that things other than himself can be. And then... Uh, having made that act of will, generating a, a store of concepts, which are the, the blueprints then by which God creates actual creatures. So there is not meant to be any temporal sequence here, but a kind of logical ordering. Great, thanks. detailed. Um, I like it a lot. Um, you, um, there is this uh, spurious um, saying by uh, Albert Einstein, I want to know the thoughts of God. The rest is details. Um, <clears throat> and um, th that is, of course, an expression of negative theology. So whatever we can say about creation allows us to make inferences about what God is supposed to be, but we don't actually know. So what you are des describing is exactly the, 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 the mirror of this negative theology uh, problem. That is, <clears throat> um, if we suppose that uh, reality, reality comes about finite as it is from the ideas of God, then we have to make an uh, a very clear, sharp analysis, and that what the, that's what you're doing, analysis of how the idea, how God and things can be connected by way of ideas. So I might have missed the first part of the question. Was there a question or was that a, a comment? I'm, uh, I'm sorry. Could be just a comment, unless you you uh, object totally to it. <laughs> the, the 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 question is, am I right to make the the problem of the ideas of God a mirror of the negative theology? Well. I think of it like this. Uh, if, if the exemplarist view is right, and here 
we're being neutral between uh, imitative and containment exemplarism. If the containment view is, er, excuse me, if the exemplarist view is right, then any creature we can know about is similar to God in some way. It's some sort of expression of God's own nature. So that in coming to know creatures, we are thereby getting on to something about what God is or what God is like. But uh, keeping in mind God's transcendence, God's infinity, we, we don't we, it, the reasonable thing to do is to ho hold out as uh, more than plausible, but very likely that the, the world as we find it is uh, an extremely small slice of a divine disclosure and that God is holding infinity in reserve, so to speak. Okay. Uh, there seems to be an online question. Uh. <clears throat> Hello, sorry. Okay, Gregory. Oh, uh, yeah, sorry. Um, is, uh, is the, the online, yeah, can I, can I give my online question? Is that good? Yes. Yeah, okay, great. Hey, um, thanks. I I really enjoyed the, um, uh, the 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 paper, Tom. Thanks. Um, I kind of just have a, a, a couple of, of questions, but they're related. Um, the first one was just: Have you considered at all some of the extrinsic accounts of divine mental content that um, I mentioned in the first part of, of my paper? The kind of thing W. Matthews Grant talks about. Now he talks about um, that in relation to God's contingent mental acts and his, his knowledge of creatures. But I wonder if you could help some of the views uh, you're criticizing by appealing um, to kind of content externalism as a form of divine knowledge. So, uh, for instance, um, yeah, like I wanted to maybe you, the, maybe on the Platonist view, it's just the existence of the God just kind of creates or maybe even just these uh, the abstract objects exist and then God doesn't have to um, be any, any well, he has to have some in, intrinsic state, but I don't know after that, that's sufficient to ground his, uh, his knowledge of them. And then kind of in a related way, um, the idea that God would be kind of acting imperfectly if he were not rational in coming up with the divine ideas, let's say. Um, I mean, that only seems to me to be the case if it were really an option for him to to act rationally. Like if there's, if for instance, there's some divine decision and God's got no reason to go one way or the other for, for rationally, we don't say fault him for that. So then imagine that, I mean, some, one of the kind of more voluntarist or even an extrinsic account on which God doesn't uh, act, act rationally um, in coming up with the divine ideas. It doesn't seem that that attributes any imperfection to God. And it's not obvious that it attributes much more perfection to say that he, he did act rationally, because after all, um, we might think that, again, acting rationality is in that sense kind of a secundum quid perfection. It's, it's only a perfection insofar as it's appropriate, um, provided a being has a perfectly rational nature. Sorry. Yeah, th thanks for both of those. Um, I'll, I'll take the first one, the second one first, and say that uh, I, th I think you're absolutely right, at least on the point that um, you know, if if that's what if that's the way things are, <laughs> then God is not. We we wouldn't if we discover that some sort of activist view or um, or voluntaristic conceptualist view is the true view. We wouldn't think any less of God. We would just think, well, that's just how. Uh, that's just how things are. So my insertion here is to say, well, if we're if we're theory building and looking for uh, looking for a theory that is uh, maximally explanatory um, and simultaneously God honoring um, and and consistent with all of the ways that we uh, uh, believe God to be as Christians and so on then a, a, uh, an exemplarist theory provides a bit more explanation and leaves God rational in this respect. Um, and so is to prefer to be preferred on that ground. Um, 
whether it adds that much more perfection was your, your second point of your second question. Um, well, maybe not a lot, but a little, a little bit. And we, 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 we can never give God enough, uh, honor. So, you know, I just try to do what I can. Now on the first question, um, it, it's well taken and I haven't, uh, uh, I'm sorry to say that I, I missed your paper. It's er, early morning here for me. And so I, I only came on uh, about two thirds of the way through your talk. And so I'm, I'm sorry about that. Um, I haven't looked at Matthew's Grant's work on this topic. And so I, I certainly will. Um, I'm familiar, I'm familiar with Occam's externalism about the divine ideas, and I find it abhorrent. Um, all, all, for Occam, all God needs to no, so to speak, is uh, his omnipotence. And omnipotence is the ability to do anything non-contradictory. And to, I, I find Occam's uh, teaching about God's creative activity um, just sort of monstrous. There's a God simply knows his own power and chooses to exert it in some way but has no ideas of creatures until after the fact, so to speak. Once, once he's done some creative blast, uh, he, then, he then knows the way things are. Now, I'm sure Matthews Grant is a much better philosopher than Occam, um, at least better Christian philosopher. So uh, I'm sure he has nicer things to say than Occam does. But I look forward to, to getting more, to, to learning more about that. And I appreciate the question. Philip? Hey, Tom. Thanks for a great... This is Father Philip Neary. Um, I want to lean into my role as Dominican mascot here for a second and ask about your relational priority objection. Um, so I take it that the argument is just imitation is a kind of relation. Relations depend on relata, so imitation depends on relata, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, why can't I grant that and just point out that, yeah, imitation is a relation, but imitability isn't? And all that the... Um, all that my view holds is that God, in knowing the divine essence, knows it as in all the ways in which is, it is imitable. Um, and then the imitation relation arises only subsequent to creation. And then I'm going to tell a story about how that's a mixed relation. But imitation and imitability aren't the same thing. Would that raise a problem for God's knowledge of possibles? No. Why not? Because so he knows, because so, th I mean, this is like the Greg Doolin thing about the difference between an exemplar and, I, and an idea, right? So the divine ideas are all the ways that God knows his own essence as imitable. And then a divine idea gets denominated as a divine exemplar only on, on the condition of God's creating something according to that idea. So all the possibles are instances of God's knowing Imita his own imitability, but those aren't relation. Uh, a relation doesn't arise until he has actually created something according to that imitability, and then you have imitation. <clears throat> I can't drop the mic. That's not allowed. So <laughs> if God is eternally contemplating the unicorn he never makes, he knows unicorn nature by uh, s s simply insofar as the unicorn imitates the divine essence. But I, but I would say that what follows from that is that God would know the way in which the equine shape of the unicorn imitates the divine essence. He would know the way in which the horn imitates the divine essence. And, and all of that would be the, the grounds, so to speak, of God's knowing the way in which unicorn nature imitates the divine essence. And so whether or not there ever is a unicorn, I, I, I don't see how God can have perfect knowledge of creaturely, possible creaturely essences without knowing their non-relational features. Is that, am I missing something? Do you want me to answer or just pitch? Um, so 
I think I think the view is something like this: for for God's for the perfection of God's knowledge, He just knows He just needs to know His own essence in all of its imitability. Um, in knowing it in all of its imitability, He knows all possibles, but there are not yet in that analysis any relations. Um, and that, nor are there any imitation relations, right? When God wills to create some of those, some creatures that are created in accord with that possible way of imitating, then those creatures will imitate him and an, a relation will arise. But God, yeah, sure, God knows, um, God knows uh, himself as imitable in all of the possibles that are not created. But none of those things, none of that knowledge involves relata. Well, that, that's very nice. And I, I hope that that's true. And I'll, I'll be going back to the texts assiduously with that in mind, uh, truly in hopes that I'm wrong. Um, because what I, what I think the result of that would be is that Scotus and Aquinas are would end up being much closer. Super close. Uh, yeah, super close. Which is a very yeah, then, welcome then and happy result. Yeah, realized Yeah. Yeah, so thank you. Yeah, no, thank you. Okay, anyone else? Yeah, I just want to add to that a little bit. Um, I think it would help to, um, to not use the word possibles in the plural. Right? Because when you say that God knows all these possibles, then you've sort of reified them enough, then you start to wonder how they're, with, it sounds like there's a relation there. And it's just God knows what he can, ways in which he can produce things. But, but, all, but that's posterior to his knowledge of his own nature. And I think it's sort of relevant that in the way um, he lays it out in the Summa Theologiae, he first, Aquinas first talks about God's knowledge of himself, and then he talks about ideas. I, th I think that's not, I, I think that's important for this. Anyway. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Okay. Andres. Hi, Tom. Um, I'm wondering about the one idea theory and what's so bad about it. Uh, seems like, I don't know, sounds like a pretty cool thing that somebody could do. If just having one concept, they can understand all things perfectly with that one concept. Maybe, maybe I'm, you know, I, I know that concept in one way by saying that, uh, you know, it's an idea of a horse, and I know it in a different way by saying that it's, it's an idea of a human, but it's because of God's perf perfection and infinity, it's, it's one and the same, one and the same, you know, thing is the truth banker for both of those things, that God has an idea of a human and God has an idea of a So what's the matter with, uh, with the one idea theory? I just can't make any sense of it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I really, I, I would, it's, you know, it's all nice. I, I, I have, uh, I've tried, but, You know, I, I might be under the influence of some sort of um, pernicious um, early modern empiricism. You know, I, I've tried I've tried my whole life to to get rid of this, but you know, one worry is from a modern perspective that the, the, the more general you go, the uh, less content you have. But from a, a broadly uh, uh, Platonic or Neoplatonic position: the the higher up you go, the more content you have. And so, as as things get ramified lower down in the chain of being, we're we're you know we're, we're losing perfection instead of gaining reality. And I'm I'm certainly on board with that. Um, where I land on this is that the there's a there's certainly a sense in which God's knowledge of His own essence is a, a single idea. But as Aquinas himself says, who has a, a stricter version of simplicity than Scotus, we, we must affirm that God has many ideas. Uh, that not, not even Aquinas can make sense of, really, of the one idea theory. And then Scotus comes along and says, we actually need to post, postulate some structure in God 
And so, you know, make this one idea multifaceted um, in order to really get all of the creaturely content out of God that the exemplarist theory is supposed to yield. I, th I think we may have different views of objective precision. <laughs> Okay, uh, thank you very much for such thought-provoking uh, lecture, and yeah, let's thank you. Um, so now uh, there is coffee break. I think we can take about 15 minutes, and then there's again some opportunity to discuss analytical metaphysics and its prospects, possibility, and so on. Okay, thank you. Tom, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. I am, I am also online, so I had no opportunity to go to Philip and ask him what he, uh, what he meant. I, I'm not quite sure if I got his, uh, his um, reply correctly. And uh, I will try to say what, what I got, and please uh, correct me if, if it is wrong. If it is what wrong. Yeah. Uh, he's, if I understood correctly, he said that if God is thinking about possibles, possible essences that can be uh, created, these possible essences doesn't include any relations. Is it correct? Yeah, that, that was what he was saying. Yeah. And it doesn't seem to me to be correct, because these possible these possible individuals must include my mother and me, and I think I cannot be produced by any other person than my mother. So he must he must conceive uh, relations. Yeah, good. And if Aquinas is correct, there is not only perfections of absolute essences. But there is also a perfection of order. Mm -hmm. And the divine wisdom must conceive this possible, different possible orders. So, um, so that's why I was not uh, uh, sure that I got it correctly. Uh, can, you, can, you, can you say something to it? Yeah, I, I, I think so. I think he was limiting his comment about the relation of um, imitation, that it, it, he wasn't denying that in knowing possible creatures, God would be ignorant of motherhood or um, order, the way that creatures could be ordered in a universe. He was, I think, just focusing on the, the relation of a creature imitating the divine essence. Um, so... Instead of having a view where God is thinking about a human um, and thinking about the way in which the human nature imitates the divine essence, his view was God thinks about how his own essence can be imitated. And all there is to an idea of a creature uh, prior to creation is God's knowledge of how he can be imitated. So, so, the, so there's no thing in God's mind to which, which is somehow related to God's thinking. I, I, I think that's the view that he was, was attributing to Aquinas. Right. So when he is thinking about himself, how he can be imitated— he just gets the content, the possible, the essence of possible, and not the relation of this possible to his uh, essence. Yeah, so, yeah. Is it right? I, I'm not sure. I, it's not how I have read the texts. Um, but I, I look forward to checking and see if it, I mean, basically, if I can get a reading of Aquinas that is consistent with that view, I. I'll take that reading because it, it would make Aquinas' view much much more plausible. Um, so I hope he's right. I would just I just need to go back and read carefully. Yeah. Yeah. And may I have one more question? Yeah. 
I t- uh, well, I comment, when I meet uh, a finance, may, may I butt in? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, you have one more question. Uh, yeah, I just let me uh, realize it. that we are not taking away that uh, anybody else's time. Yeah, yeah. right. Let's talk amongst ourselves, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so, but please go ahead, David, and, and then yeah. I will have another question for Tom. Uh, okay. Nice to see you, Tom, by the way. <laughs> it's really great to have you here. Okay. When I read Aquinas, I think his ideas are universal. God's, uni- God's ideas, of uh, they represent universals. He never speaks about Peter, Paul, but he always speaks about human being or donkey or so on. And uh, it's so. My question is, uh, how you read it? How do you read it? Because if God's idea represent universals, God would get to know individuals when He creates. Yeah, and that that is really strange because in possible worlds there would there wouldn't be individuals. There would be only new universals. And it also sheds light on what makes individual individual. It must be the act of being, not the essence. Yeah, I, I have I've read Aquinas the same way that you do on this point, that um, it, it's it has a deficient account of God's knowledge of possible individuals. Um, I, I agree with you. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Well, actually, my question relates to this quite directly. Um, because um, yeah, it, um, from the Augustinian tradition, even going up to Aquinas, who himself is not really uh, classified usually as a devoted Augustinian, but um, uh, as far as the uh, issue of divine ideas is concerned, uh, it always looks like these um, um, divine ideas are universal exemplars, right? And uh, there's not much talk about the uh, knowledge of individuals, um, the tree uh, creation knowledge of individuals. Of course, everybody knows that God knows everything, so he must know the individuals too, but the uh, ideas are usually characterized as universals. And so in um, connection with that, um, uh, it is strange a little bit to me that you uh, declared your hate toward Occam's externalism, uh, um, according to which divine ideas are nothing but the individual creatures uh, creatures themselves, and that God has intuitive knowledge as opposed to abstractive knowledge of all these individuals from eternity, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So he has the single richest possible concept of everything there is and can be. And no, 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 no. No, wait, 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 <laughs> just say, hear me out. So, so um, when, uh, and uh, um, you also expressed your um, uh, liking uh, toward the idea that uh, uh, the uh, higher up in universals you go, you less uh, the the less content you have, and so the richest content, information content, would be the knowledge of individuals, and that is exactly what you are getting from Occam. So, what is so bad about Occam if uh, your uh, <laughs> predilections uh, are leaning toward precisely that idea that um, you have the richest uh, uh, content? Of knowledge when you are knowing all the individuals. Okay, so yeah, okay. I, I, <laughs> deal with that. <laughs> intuitive cognition of actually existing individuals. Yeah, Occam affirms that. I don't think he has anything interesting to say about um, God's knowledge of possible individuals. Oh, other he, than God, he quite explicitly um, endorses the idea of intuitive knowledge of non-existence. But only only insofar as God knows his own power. Yes. But that's not that's not rich content. But, uh, no, but uh, uh, in no in knowing his own power, he knows all the things he uh, is creating and he uh, could be creating but does not. But is not. I th- I thought that uh, I thought that Occam was concerned about m- making God's understanding of His power suffice 
in lieu of uh, concepts of individuals in order to preserve divine simplicity. So it, does I, not, it does not need concepts in the plural of individuals. Yeah. Uh, he has this single eternal act of knowledge, which is a simple eternal act of power, which is a simple eternal act of being, which contains everything to the tiniest detail. That is, isn't is that rich enough for you? <laughs> if you think about, so, so um, think about divine power simply as uh, ability to do whatever is non-contradictory. Mm -hmm. You could think that that is not very much content. Um, Come on. He knows all he does and all he could do, but does not. And all he makes and uh, all he could make, but he does not. So it is. So, so he. So I mean, it is. Uh, I, I don't think. Uh, so generally, I'm not um, siding with Occam. But I, I would really. <laughs> um, on, on this particular issue, I think uh, his idea uh, adds something. Uh, to the, um, the general conception of uh, divine ideas that um, was sort of lost on uh, the uh, theologians in the Augustinian tradition, thinking about divine ideas in the Platonizing Augustinian tradition. Well, I'll have to go back to the text on this too. Um, I, okay. I suppose, so, so the, uh, you know, take, take two repugnant uh, individuals, you know, white thing, black thing, um, you know, re repugnant in the technical sense. And yes, so would would um, by knowing his power to do whatever is non contradictory. I, at the very least, we could say God, God would know that he couldn't create. He, he couldn't unite repugnant things. Yes, but would his act of knowledge of his own power entail that he would know specifically that yeah, he, he would know this white snowball. That's what I and, yeah. and, and he would know that while he is uh, creating it, uh, Occam is also um, into creatio continua, right? So it's, it's not something just done in our past. Yeah. But um, OK, so he, he is currently creating, sustaining the existence of this uh, white snowball. Um, and he knows at the same time that it uh, could be black and it isn't, because that's the way he wants it. Right? Well, I, that's a much more charitable reading than I've given Occam. I, I, I've just... Yeah, I know. That's what I, <laughs> that's so exactly. I, I hope you... I hope, what I called your attention to. <laughs> I hope... I appreciate it. I, I do. Uh, I, I will... I, I will double check. In a, in a spirit of greater charity. Okay, and uh, it was just uh, I just wanted to talk to you because it's been uh, really such a long time that we a really long asked. time. Yeah. yeah. So um, we should we should get together at some point. Okay. So um, now, but I, I want to let you go. Okay. No, so. I, I appreciate it. And, and, okay. And thank, David, you. thank you. Thank you. I actually you have know. a class to teach, so I'm, I, oh. I need to go prepare for my class. But. Um, yeah. Yeah, thanks, thanks both. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Bye bye. 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 Bye, David. Yeah, bye. Bye.
Okay. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, uh, let me start our last session, which I would like to be devoted to sort of meta discussion about the project of analytical metaphysics as such. Uh, I chose the title of, of this discussion, uh, how is analytical metaphysics possible? But of course we can discuss other questions related to this project which also forms an important part of Sousedik's uh, philosophical vision. So, and, and before we start, uh, just one more piece of information. After we end, uh, the uh, guided walk around Prague is prepared for you. Uh, Mr. Sladeček, who has disappeared somewhere, but uh, I think he will appear again <laughs> soon, uh, will guide those of you who, who wish to have a walk around Prague according to your wishes and preferences. So. Uh, this is just to, to confirm that it will indeed take place. Yeah. So, and now uh, to our discussion. Um, perhaps we can start um, with uh, the question uh, in the title of uh, this uh, uh, session. Uh, what do you think about the possibility of analytical metaphysics? Because uh, Kant famously argued that metaphysics in the traditional sense is impossible. And um, I, I haven't detected any substantial uh, counter arguments against, against Kant in the analytic tradition. It seems to me that uh, the analytics rather ignore uh, these arguments. So, it's my question, what do you think about the situation? Do we need some uh, substantial refutation of Kant or uh, is it just that uh, Kant is not interesting anymore and, and we can just go on as if nothing happened? Or what, what's your view about this? So. I think uh, if you want to disagree with Kant, you should disagree at square one which doesn't mean that Kant isn't interesting, but it does mean that if you want to be a realist, you should start out as a realist. And so uh, there's a certain kind of engagement that doesn't happen. Yes, thank you. Uh, and well, do you, do you, so do you think we need some uh, epistemology for, for metaphysics and that it, it, it's lacking or what, what do you think? I, I do think that we need an epistemology, but I don't think that we need an epistemology of the kind that uh, somebody like Descartes or Locke tried to provide yeah. and, and which Kant kind of showed to not work. Yeah, it's, it's my view too, but what's the other thing? Prokop? I think that uh, Kant Wittgenstein, uh, the early Wittgenstein, it's practically the same from this point of view. And when, when we look at the late Wittgenstein, then we find that, that there is no um, principal decision what kind of speech is non, non, uh, non, uh, nonsense. So we don't have now in the analytic tradition no criterion which help us to distinguish between nonsense and uh, real objective talk. So we can do metaphysics. Why not? 
if we subscribe what Wittgenstein, like Wittgenstein says. Yes, if, if you ask Wittgenstein what the language ha games have in common, so he doesn't say there is no common thing for uh, different speeches. So we don't have criterion which Kant has and early Wittgenstein had. So we can do metaphysics. Sorry, that it is all. So it is a political thing, of course. Okay, <coughs> Michael. I think that most uh, analytic metaphysicians don't worry about Kant. They don't really care. They just assume that they can do what they're trying to do. And I think that's probably okay because life is short. <laughs> However, okay. um, there's something that it probably deserves more investigation. I wish I knew more about it. In the there's a sort of um, phase or aspect of analytic philosophy. It's sort of mid 20th century. I'm thinking of people like Peter Strawson, who think that by analyzing thought and language, you can gain insights into the nature of reality. So you can call it Kantian if you want, because it involves thinking about thought. But they are not worried that it cuts us off from reality, because they, they believe in a sort of isomorphism. And yet, at least sometimes, it's not a naive isomorphism because they're aware that sometimes language is systematically misleading, as Ryle said. So I don't know how this is supposed to work, but there's a there's a certain strands of analytic philosophy that are that have a kind of faith in a critical isomorph, a critically self-aware isomorphism, and that might be a resource for um, for metaphysics and a way in which it's sort of related to scholastic philosophy. Okay, Philip? Yeah, so I think one, one thing that makes answering this question hard, at least to my mind, is, is just the problem of what, sort of from a scholastic perspective, what, what does analytic metaphysics refer to? Right, so yes. here are here are some themes. <laughs> um, you know, so some themes in analytic metaphysics are material constitution, persistence and perdurance, um, the nature of time. Right, which for most scholastics, all of those are not metaphysics. Those are philosophy of nature. You know, to Michael's point, you know, certain aspects of the analytic practice of you know. Um, analysis of language or like the analysis of counterfactuals and counterpossibles, right, m might plausibly be put by scholastics in logic as opposed to metaphysics. And so from a scholastic perspective, different disciplines require different methodologies, right? And so the possibility of engaging in um, various questions or themes in analytic metaphysics might get different answers depending on the case-by-case -case instance of what the question is. Mm -hmm. Well, well it, it seems to me that uh, um, the meaning of metaphysics has broadened in, in the history and uh, in uh, the times of uh, logical positivism or even uh, in, in Kant, it almost includes anything which is not empirical. Yeah? So, so, so almost the entire philosophy. Yeah? So, um, and where I see the problem is that uh, Kant's argument basically is that uh, a real science must have both informative and uh, uh, necessary and, and, and uh, general. Yeah? So, uh, and, and, and the problem is how to meet both these two criteria, how, how to have something which is both informative and, and not, not trivial, and not, it's not trivial and, and it's general and necessary. And, and uh, Kant seems to believe that it's impossible to uh, derive the generality and necessity from other sources than our own subjective uh, makeup of uh, our, our, our cognitive faculties. And the question is, uh, can analytical metaphysics, metaphysicians, or uh, do the, the analytical metaphysicians have some resources to counter the, this claim? C can they somehow vindicate the fact that necessity and generality is, is somehow out there 
in the reality and that we can cognize it and uh, be receptive and not formative or, or productive in doing so. If, if you see what I, I mean. Okay. Well, it is a question for Saul Kripke, isn't it? Yeah. He came with the idea there a necessity so there are not only analytical, uh, analytical and system, uh, synthetic uh, statements a priori, but they are also uh, statements which are there uh, necessary, necessary, if we believe what Kripke said. Yes. So, so we cannot uh, accept this uh, division of, of statements, which, uh, which is the question is not due logical, to Kant. Epistem epistemological, yeah. Uh, we we no. can form such statements, certainly, but the mm. question is, are they true or are they justified epistemically? Epistemically, why not? Well, the question is why yes. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no, it, it, is, it is a really <laughs> difficult question which, is, which we cannot so <laughs> yeah. quickly solve because Kant has many steps to show that it is not yeah. possible and Kripke yeah. also many steps, okay. uh, not so many as Kant, but... Uh, yeah. But you, you think that Kripke basically has some way to show that it indeed is possible to do metaphysics in, in the sense of... Uh, Justifying some uh, dare and necessary statements about reality. No, Kripke show uh, Kripke sees Kripke is descriptive in this way. Yeah? He sees the statements which are about the reality and which are necessary. For example, Lukash Novak is a man. It is necessary. Well, some, but uh, it, it doesn't depend. That, yeah. it, it, it doesn't yeah. depend on our uh, on yeah. our um, conceptual scheme. Bar individual theorists uh, would say it's contingent. No, yeah. no, it is. Uh, it is then a, a further discussion. But if you want to, yeah. so he is okay. a descriptivist. Okay, thank you. See, I think it depends on what you think is required before you can do metaphysics. So here, okay, so here's something I think that Quine is probably right about. You can hold any position you want as long as you're willing to say enough other crazy things. And you can keep holding the view. And um, I think Quine is actually right about that. So what it means is if someone is stubborn enough, you can never convince him. That's why you, should, you can't convince Hume that he's wrong, because he can keep making adjustments. Um, but that doesn't mean that we can't know things. It just means that you can't convince everyone. So it's a good idea to have some account of what your alternative to Kant is, but you should not expect yourself to be able to prove it to a committed Kantian, because a committed Kantian can always find a way to retain his Kantian perspective. Do you think so? Uh, well, I, I actually believe that that Kantian approach is uh, inconsistent. Uh, that. Yeah. Oh, well, if that were true, yeah. that would be great. But my guess yeah. is that when you would show the Kantian the inconsistency, he could say, ah, but wait, I also believe this other thing, and now it's not inconsistent anymore. And you would say, that's implausible. And he would say, mm. well, that's the view. Wow, that's a question. <laughs> but, but, okay, thank you. Uh, uh, yeah, I think... It's fine to have a general presumption that we can until we're shown otherwise. There was an, a good paper, I think it was by Trenton Merricks, uh, where he was talking about the anti-metaphysician, anti-metaphysics people. He was like, well, look, you can't just be anti-metaphysics. Like, we make arguments. Like, they're logically valid. Like, with metaphysical conclusions as a result. So, like, tell me what premise is wrong. And then we'll, we'll go at it. And some of them, you know, I'm going to be more confident in some of the premises for the argument than I will in the premises of Kant's argument that we can't do. Metaphysics, mm -hmm. some of these are going to be more morianly obvious. So yeah, let's just make metaphysical arguments. If people don't like metaphysics, well then tell us what premise is wrong. OK. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Dan? I just want to briefly, you know, so Sometimes it's good, you know, just to take something from the opponent and to show, you know, that it can lead, you know, to the 
uh, to your positions, you know. And I think it was it was done in I don't know in at the end of 20th century with this sort of logic and with this authors David Wiggins, Christopher Rapp, and many others, you know. And I think they came from Strawson, his essay on individuals, you know. And in this essay, he sort of combines, you know, this Aristotelian approach with Kantian, you know, with this transcendental uh, transcendental approach. And he says that in our um, usual praxis, you know, of identifying, re-identifying, counting, we assume these, you know, essences somehow, uh, so-called second substances from Aristotle categories. You know, without them, our pra praxis would not function. You know, so it is the first, you know, step, and of course, it's not the end of the story. But it's the it's the good, you know, just the gate uh, opening the first phases uh, to this to this metaphysics. So, uh, and I think it was one of the main, you know, uh, movers of this analytical metaphysics in, uh, in, in, in contemporary analytical metaphysics, this sort of logics, you know, so um, that's, that's uh, how I actually I got into this debate, you know, uh, so this is my, my proposal. Okay. Andras? Uh, Father Philip Neri once uh, gave me a very plausible argument that what most of what analytic philosophers are actually doing is dialectic, so I want him to rehearse that argument. Well, yeah, so I mean, this is this is sort of like inside baseball for the scholastics, right? Because um, we're gonna distinguish between being engaged in scientia, right? And being engaged in dialectic, where just one of the differences is that the, the premises of a scientific argument in our sense, um, and I take it perhaps also in Kant's sense when he denies the possibility of metaphysics, is, um, is that the premises are universally necessary and known to be such, right? Um, and yeah, I take it that, um, I mean, my experience of engaging with analytic metaphysicians has been that they have uh, a great deal of epistemic humility, right? And so are perfectly happy saying, you know, look, the premises of the following argument are um, highly defeasible, but I think also highly plausible. Um, and so um, insofar as what they are doing is, um, arguing from premises that they take to be plausible but not universal necessities, then they're engaged in what, from a kind of broadly peripatetic perspective, we would call dialectic. Um, and there, I think, actually, Lukash, maybe to your point, is um, that highly nuances the, you know, the Kantian critique, right? Because um, I take it that for the Kantian, it's one thing to say that there can't be science, uh, there can't be like genuine high bar rigorous knowledge of metaphysical questions. But um, I take it that Kant would not deny that you can't engage in dialectical argumentation. In fact, that's how the antinomies proceed, right? Um, so insofar as analytic metaphysics is largely practiced as a form of dialectic, um, then it's not gonna be able to conclude in the way that Kant would demand it in order for it to be scientific, but um, but yeah, I mean maybe maybe it's worse. You want to go for it? Well, no. no. Well, but for Kant, um, dialectic is just a logic of appearance, yeah. So or, or deception even. Yeah. So uh, I think his notion of dialectic is different from the Aristotelian one. Okay. Uh, Yes. Actually, I, uh, I wanted to go back to a point that Michael made uh, several minutes ago. So I too am interested in this mid 20th century, uh, you know, uh, these sort of ordinary language folks, um, right? If we kind of assume that there is an isomorphism that, you know, the mind, you know, sort of can grasp reality in this immediate way, then maybe our language can, yeah, really sort of. Uh, you know, illuminate what, what exists. Um, however, it seems like a lot of those people, you know, I mean, it, they, they did a lot to kind of destroy metaphysics, though, uh, in as much as, you know, when we, you know, at least when they performed these operations kind of, of, of linguistic analysis, um, a lot of them, I mean, I'm thinking of um, someone like, like uh, A.J. Ayer, you know, they ended up dismissing, uh, dismissing a lot of metaphysical notions. And, um, and basically saying that, well, you know, um, 
yeah, a lot of a lot of what the folk are talking about, for instance, is just a load of nonsense. I mean, I think again, in, in terms of my own paper, I mean, this. Um, you know, all of these kind of really, I, th I think, uh, and I, I mean, I admire the philosophers that I was talking about. I, I admire, you know, Toner actually enormously. But in some sense, uh, you know, these really kind of what I regard as confused notions of, of, subs of, of hylomorphic theories, you know, they began with a willingness to say that there are no chairs. You know, and what the you know what the folk are talking about when they're talking about chair. Well, that's just that's just nonsense, right? So. Um, I don't know. I don't mean to like direct this exactly. You, but others might. Have, I, you know that if we if we go sort of that way of linguistic analysis, um, yeah, what's to guarantee that we rather than it being a kind of resource that we might end up, um, yeah, really going astray? Because it seems like in, in some quarters that's what's that's what's happened. Um. I, mean, you know, yeah. I think um, the important role of analytical metaphysics should be, you know, the defense of common sense. Yeah. You know, I, I, I think, uh, for instance, not only the chairs, as you, as you said now, John, but also in metaphysics of mind. You know, so we have to, actually two possibilities how, how uh, to think of ourselves. You know, the first possibility, this folk psychology. We think of ourselves according to common sense. You know, we have these acts of volition, understanding, vision, and so on. We have self-reflections, as it can be found, as it can be found in these Aristotelian traditions. But now, on the other hand, we have these reductionist, you know, the, the bunch of reductionist theories. Which says that we have to eliminate these, you know, or at least reduce, you know, to these material, you know, processes and activities, and it would, you know, have a bad impact on our self-understanding, of our self-awareness. Sorry. Uh, revision, it is also connected with this Rosson, ex exactly, you know, so revise, revise your world view, world unchowing, you know, because it's, it's wrong, you have to abandon this, because the science, hardcore science says this and that. You know, so I think it should be our task you know, just to defend this common sense that, and just to deepen it and just to under, underpin it ontologically you know, from this point of view, which is, which is not easy, so, yeah. Okay. How to defend common sense? It is, in my view, in the analytical philosophy, easy question. You have to turn to ordinary language. And uh, this is connected with the question what has analytical metaphysics common with analytical philosophy? I we want to solve this question. We have to we have to know what analytical philosophy is. And in my view, the best uh, the best uh, uh, solution of this problem is that analytical philosophy it, for analytical philosophy is typical turn to ordinary language. I know about the revisionist, uh, but uh, this is not. Uh, but I uh, okay, but it needn't be only language, you know. So we have also, for instance, introspection. And if we take introspection seriously, mm -hmm. we, we sh <laughs> okay, analytical, there are a lot of people who, who do not take it seriously, who make fun, who mock, who mock introspections, you know, these hardcore positivists. But I think we here, you know, we take it at least slightly, you know, seriously and just to deduce something from that, you know. So if we, you know, look at ourselves, Inside, you know, we can observe intentionality, the problem of intentions, you know, perspective, you know, uh, just point of view, and 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 so on, and it it goes, you know, and we need metaphysics in this case because these are mental phenomena which are obvious, which are clear to all of us. If you if you want to abandon this, you know, so you really you you are not just to these phenomena. Maybe, so maybe uh, yeah. it is a problem for analytical philosophy, but for analytical philosophy, as Rorty says, I think it is right. It is a typical two term to language. So if you want to analyze something, you have to analyze yeah. it in the medium, which is language. If Aristotle asks what is the cause, uh, he, uh, he answers it that it is the answer on the question why. It is a typical analytical uh, way to solve uh, the problem of ca uh, causality. Okay, I think there is, a, you know, uh, it's a morphism, you know, so you, you, you need to use the, the, the language, but it's not only on the linguistic level, you know, so it has, no, you know, these commitments, you know, ontological if commitments. You, in if it. you want to add something, then you are not analytical philosopher. Yes, it is because you, you didn't add your language. Okay, so there are several, several hands up, so uh, 
Just briefly, I, I actually think that we should not try very hard to figure out what analytical philosophy is. The things that people call analytical philosophy are shockingly different from one another. Like A.J. Ayer is some kind of logical positivist. It's very hard to find a living logical positivist. Um, I mean, people call him an analytic philosophy for Russell, Plantinga, Kripke, Strawson. They're hugely different. I don't think there's any essence to analytical philosophy. It's a very weak, uh, you know, okay, so it's like an accidental aggregate, <laughs> to put it in scholastic ways. So I think we should just like look for good philosophical ideas where we can find them and let other people worry about whether they are officially analytic or not. So just to, to sort of follow up from a different angle, um, I, I want to push back. I appreciate that, that the aspects of what is called analytic philosophy and analytic metaphysics that turn to a defense of common sense and ordinary language are, um, that's great. Um, but I want to actually defend the other part of or side of contemporary analytic metaphysics, which is folks like David Lewis, right, who give arguments, you know, you know the, the idea of concrete possible worlds that incites an incredulous stare as a response, right? Like Parmenides incited incredulous stares as a response. And um, the fact that an idea or a thought or an argument might, that's metaphysical, might lead to a highly um, unordinary and, um, and Contrary, uh, contrary to common sense conclusion, um, I think does not make it um, unvaluable, right? I think oftentimes, you know, metaphysicians like Lewis are, are incredibly valuable precisely because they have powerful arguments for shockingly uh, unconventional conclusions. And that's just doing metaphysics, which is great. Okay, Jola Klima. We cannot hear you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yes, uh, okay. I just unmuted my phone. Thank, I mean, microphone. Thank you very much. So, um, uh, two points uh, that I'd like to reflect on quickly, um, although I uh, managed to arrive a little late, I'm sorry. Um, one thing um, uh, concerns this analytical uh, philosophers being a loosely connected bunch or uh, a paroxidence collection. Yes, they are, uh, as far as their um, uh, particular views uh, are concerned. But I, I try to provide um, uh, somewhat um, uh, fitting general characterization of what uh, would separate analytical philosophers from other uh, philosophers doing philosophy in a different style, namely this constant rigorous reflection on the philosophical uses of language. So. Um, analytical philosophers are not only not only using language, but um, reflect on the relationships between language and reality, or language and whatever the hell we are using it for. So this um, um, it is pretty much the uh, this refle reflection on the relationship between language, thought, and reality that is. Um, uh, that should be at least distinctive of uh, uh, analytical philosophy um, as far as um, its tradition is concerned. And whether it is done in terms of reflecting on um, ordinary language, natural language, or formal languages, etc., it is um, uh, the realization of the importance of uh, not only what we are talking about, but how we are talking about it. So that would be one suggestion I would have for a sort of unity um, um, of um, analytical philosophers um, that uh, would be more than just a unity of a list um, that you can sign up to or sign off on. Okay, so that is one thing. And the other thing is, um, when we uh, come to um, um, uh, this, this sort of realization uh, that um, analytical metaphysics or analytic philosophers um, uh, should take this um, issue um, 
seriously, the reflection on the relationships uh, between language and what we are talking about using that language. Of course, it is um, uh, immediately becoming an issue whether um, the language we ordinarily use conveying an ordinary common sense ontology or a common sense uh, categorization of our um, um, common experiences, whether it is adequate or inadequate. Um, perhaps um, an Aristotelian metaphysics um, um, really uh, can focus on uh, what um, this uh, common sense ordinary ontology implied in our ordinary use of language is. But perhaps it is not something that you need to defend against some um, extraordinary uh, scientific or um, other um, uh, um, type of um, motivation-based uh, view of reality is. It is um, um, the task would rather be um, to show what this relationship between this ordinary uh, classification and categorization of things that ordinary language usage uh, involves. So how this is related to this uh, so-called scientific or other extraordinary view of reality. Um, just go back to Parmenides, right? Um, uh, there is this Aletheia and Doxa. But he never tells us um, um, what, uh, on what grounds this doxa arises if Aletheia is all there is, uh, if the world of the Aletheia, the world of being is. So um, um, as analytical metaphysicians, let's say, or historical analytical metaphysicians, uh, as I would prefer, um, we should also uh, reflect on uh, the possible compatibility or the explanatory relationships between these different worldviews. Okay, I don't want to waste too much time. <laughs> okay, Andras? Uh, yeah, I think I want to push back just a little bit on what Jula said. I think it's true that mm -hmm. analytic philosophers are, are characterized in general by a, a sort of rigorous reflection on the relationship between language and reality, but surely that's also true of people like, I don't know, Gadamer or Derrida or something. It, it seems to me that um, what what characterizes, and you know, I mean, you might think that Gadamer is not, or, or Derrida is not very good at doing that, but <laughs> but that's a different question. Uh, it seems to me that uh, what characterizes these sorts of schools usually, the, what the unity comes from is just you know, what everybody is reading and thinks that they have to respond to. So, you know, what, what unifies scholastic philosophers is, I mean, you know, you know broadly they're, they're, they're Christian, but, you know, they, ha they have a certain set of authorities that they need to, that they all read and that they all have to respond to and that sort of form the way they think about things. And likewise, it seems to me, you know, analytic philosophers read Wittgenstein, David Lewis, whatever, you know, uh, uh, there's a kind of set of texts that people are expected to be familiar with and then things develop in response to those. So that, that's just my little thought about what unifies analytic philosophy. So may I have a quick rejoinder? Yeah, you are? <laughs> just a little um, quick rejoinder. So yes, of course, um, the, uh, uh, the established canon has um, absolutely important unifying role of any schools of thought. Um, but um, even the same list of uh, uh, authorities can um, uh, give rise to very different schools of thought depending on how they are being read and how they are interpreted. Right? So uh, uh, I think what is really distinctive is how they are using their authorities and accordingly what sort of methodology they are working with. And I would say that um, if anyone deserves to be called an analytical philosopher, um, then um, they would have to um, be regarded as such on the basis of their reflective use of philosophical language. Uh, let me... Uh... 
add some thought of mine to, to that. Uh, when I'm thinking about what analytical metaphysics might be, uh, then ideas like, okay, uh, reflection over language, argumentation, definitions, precise thinking, uh, and so on. But then it occurs to me that such methodological imperatives, I would say, are part just of any good philosophy. And if it's lacking somewhere, then it's uh, not just not analytical, it, it's not good, or it's not suitable to provide justification of, of the thesis. When I read Hegel, for example, it's just assertion, 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 not a single attempt of an argument. He, he doesn't make any uh, consecutive sequ sequence uh, this and therefore this. Yeah, that is, it's not there just in Hegel. Yeah? So uh, I, I'm just asking, why should I believe a single sentence of all this? Yeah? Uh, or, or why should it be rational for me to believe? Yeah? I, I think uh, or what I would um, describe as, as a philosophical effort is to um, an effort to establish epistemic uh, justification or even epistemic duty to believe something. Yeah? And uh, good philosophy is such that uh, succeeds in doing that yeah? because it, it gives me reasons to believe something rationally. Yeah? And so uh, if we define analytical metaphysics in this way, isn't it just that we have defined good metaphysics? <laughs> and what's the difference, for example, between analytical metaphysics and scholastic metaphysics in uh, then? Yeah. So my, my, well, my question. When done right, they should not differ. That is precisely my point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so any any more thoughts or yeah. comments? Julia, we don't hear you. Julia, you're you're, by, you're muted. You're muted. You're still someone, muted. Someone else has muted my mic. Okay, so <laughs> so the, no, I just uh, 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 that was just a quick follow-up remark that of course uh, when. Um, either scholastic metaphysics or analytical metaphysics uh, uh, is done right, uh, they should come under the same cover. Um, they, they, should, they should have this fusion of their horizons, uh, a phrase that I really like uh, from Gadamer. Um, that is precisely what uh, we should be working for, because uh, our uh, uh, scholastic colleagues did have just as much awareness of the importance of the reflect, uh, reflection on the uses of language as um, a well-working uh, analytical uh, philosophers um, uh, have. And, and uh, also, um, of course, uh, it is all um, uh, metaphysics done right in your sense, Lukash, that is uh, um, giving reasons for believing the claim that they are arguing for, because there is an argument instead of just a declaration. Um, so uh, that, is, uh, that is all good. Um, however, what uh, uh, still separates um, um, very seriously um, contemporary analytical metaphysics and uh, scholastic metaphysics is precisely these very uh, radically different ways of conceiving of how language latches on to reality and um, whatever else we are talking about. So uh, that is why I think it is uh, uh, of primary importance to clarify precisely how we are thinking about these relationships between language, thought, and reality. Because otherwise okay. we tend to talk past each other. Okay, so any, any more thoughts? Uh, Lukáš's uh, uh, access to philosophy seems to me problematic, very problematic, and so I have short comment because 
it is too dogmatic if we use his definition, so there are not Marcus Aurelius, then Kierkegaard is not a philosopher, Dostoevsky is not a philosopher, and so on and so on, uh, Wittgenstein is not a philosopher, and so on and so on. It is, of course it is, we can use this uh, access. But it is not the only one. The philosophy is, in my view, more complicated. Uh, so we cannot say such a uh, thing, which may be acceptable in, for scholasticism, for analytic philosophy. But uh, there are other types of philosophy. And I should say we should respect them too. Kierkegaard is not a bad philosopher. Okay, uh, I can respect it, but uh, I have no reason to believe it. <laughs> well, yeah, so I was going to come to Lukash's defense. Maybe, maybe now I'm not. Um, but, uh, but so I take it. So here's here's one thing someone might say in response is that what what Lukash identified, right, a kind of rigor of argumentation and um, you know logical precision, um, clarity with respect to one's terms. That's a um, that's a sufficient condition for doing philosophy well, but it might, even if it's not a necessary condition, right? So you might think about the sort of like aphoristic style of philosophy that you get in someone like Heraclitus, right? Or um, the, you know, kind of the maxims from Epictetus or something like that, and there's, there's not rigorous argumentation there. There might be other sufficient ways to do philosophy well. Um, I take it that for Lukash, Hegel does none of them. But, um, but one, one might think that there can be a plurality of, of ways of doing philosophy well, one of which is rigorous argumentation. And if that's the case, then I take it that Lukash's main point still holds, that if one was trying to specify analytic philosophy by appealing to this criterion, then it underdetermines, right? And um, that could that criterion for would just be a criterion for doing philosophy well, not for doing analytic philosophy. It's not sufficient for me. Sufficient, sufficient is when you express some really important idea, and the way the way the way can be described as uh, Lukash. Uh, uh, but Dostoevsky made it too in another way. So it is not sufficient. Yeah, sufficient to, is idea. Just, just to back that up, I mean, come on, just open up a journal of analytic philosophy and you will find a rigorously argued, very carefully laid out paper, which is just completely silly. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, it's a thing that can yes. happen, that you can, that you can make a, a perfectly valid, very carefully, conceptually yes, yes, laid yes. out argument for something which is just kind of goofy, you know? I mean, it, I, I it, some, so, some of that is not really, I don't think that's good philosophy. Is, is Plurality of Worlds not a good book of philosophy? Oh, no, that, that, that's a good, uh, by goofy, I don't mean just implausible, but like, you know, not philosophically significant somehow. Surely, surely you've read a paper like that in the past. Mm. Okay, but what is philosophical significance? I know it when I see it. No. <laughs> I think it's good. I think it's good to have high standards, but I think it's dangerous to to get in a mood of policing what's philosophy and what's not, because something might look stupid, and then you read it again 20 years later, and you realize, oh, that was actually much smarter than I thought. So let people do what they want. <laughs> OK, any, any more thoughts? David? 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 Yeah? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, so uh, I would like to say something uh, which is obvious, yeah, but um, I would like to, uh, to remind us of what the idea of Professor Sousedik was. He was, like yesterday we had second scholastic, today we have analytic metaphysics, and it, these two areas are for him not separated. His homeland was scholastic thought, but he wanted to actualize this scholastic thought. And uh, when he looked into the contemporary philosophy, 
he thought the analytic tradition, analytic metaphysics, has uh, is very similar. So let us try to actualize the scholastic thought by this tradition. And whatever is good there for our scholastic thought to make it vivid and actualize, let's use it. So uh, that's all. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So, so I think this. Yes, yes, precisely. I, I just wanted to say that uh, this is a good concluding uh, remark. Yeah. So, uh, now, uh, where is Mr. Sladečka? No. So, uh, I would like to thank all of you for your thoughts and uh, for all the, the contributions, these discussions, talks. Um, I hope you enjoyed it today just as I did. And um, now uh, the walk around Prague. So, this is Mr. Sladeček who will uh, take you to, to that trip. So, uh, I think, would you like to, to uh, give some instructions or? We will use our public transport system, so we should use it by the ticket. If you are familiar with the system, I do so. And we can meet in five or ten minutes. It's up to you. And where okay. should we meet? Here? Uh, outside. Uh, outside this room. Outside this room. Outside this room. Uh -huh. Okay. Outside this room. Uh -huh. okay. Okay.